With Python being so easy to learn and having really powerful capabilities, it seems to be the dominant choice for new learners and industry professionals alike. Machine learning and Python are like peanut butter and jelly, an unbeatable match. You don't even have to have much experience in the technical industry to learn either of these topics. With these skills in hand, many people go on to work in companies like Netflix, Goldman Sachs, and Deloitte. A series of tutorials like ours is enough to get you started on your journey to becoming proficient in machine learning and Python. Who knows, you might be the next industry expert. This course consists of different aspects of machine learning as well as Python. So we have got three amazing faculty members, experts in their own right to help you get started with this discipline in a comprehensive manner. They are Dr. Abhinanda Sarkar, one of the top 10 data science academicians in India, Dr. Narayana Darpaneni, an IISC postdoctoral fellow, and Mr. Raghuraman, a big data expert. Now, before we start off with the session, I'd like to inform you that we will be coming up with a series of high quality tutorials on artificial intelligence, data science, and so much more. So don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to get a notification every time we upload a new video. If you like this tutorial, don't forget to click on the thumbs up icon and comment down below what you'd like to see next. Here are the topics we will cover in this tutorial. First, we will get you to dip your toes in some programming with an introduction to Python and Anaconda. Then, we'll cover different libraries in Python, including pandas and numpy for data processing and manipulation. After that, we shall see how we can visualize data in Python using libraries like matplotlib and seaborn. We will then get into a statistical approach, understanding how statistics is different from machine learning and the different types of statistics. An understanding of data, how it is distributed, how it can be measured, and how it can be represented will get you right on track to handle machine learning algorithms that come your way. Moving forward, you will be introduced to reinforcement learning, its principles, and its framework. Then, we will learn about queue tables, queue learning algorithms, and a case study of a smart taxi to help you understand reinforcement learning better. Let's get introduced to the teachers of this tutorial. Dr. Abhilanda Sarkar received his PhD in statistics from Stanford University. He has taught applied mathematics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has also been on the research staff at IBM. Dr. Sarkar has also led quality, engineering development and analytics function at GE and has co-founded Omics Labs, a biotechnology startup. Dr. Narayana Darpanini has more than 11 years of industry experience and over four years academic research experience. Over these years, he has worked as a professor, trader, project manager, team lead, and developer. He has completed his PhD in mathematics from Pierre and Marie Curie University and his MSc and BSc in mathematics from Pondicherry University and Sri Krishna Devaraya University respectively. He was also a postdoctoral fellow at the Indian Institute of Science. His areas of expertise include machine learning, optimization, financial engineering, and high-frequency and algorithmic trading. He has published over 10 research articles in international journals and conferences. Mr. Raghuraman is a big data and AWS expert with over a decade of training and consulting experience in AWS and Apache Hadoop ecosystems like Apache Spark. He has an impressive resume having worked with global clients like IBM, Capgemini, HCL, and Wipro. To top it all off, he has worked with many Bay Area startups in the US. With that, let's get into this machine learning with Python course. It's time for some great learning. So uh, like Rajeshri said, my name is uh, Raghu. Um, so I have been working um, for about 12 years as of now. Um, and uh, I started as a developer. Java developer basically, and then uh, moved into something called big data. So I have been a big data developer for quite some time, and then moved to machine learning. Because the industry changes, right? You can't stick to one thing. <laughs> and I also uh, teach and practice a bit of cloud computing with Amazon Web Services, right? So that's what I do. And currently, I work as a consultant um, for some of the companies. I help them in solving their problems and you know giving them advices as to what to do, et cetera, et cetera. And I also train people. So with uh, Great Lakes, um, as of now, uh, most of my training sessions are into uh, Python. That's what we are going to do. And statistics, uh, as well as ML. So these are the areas where I usually train uh, in Great Lakes. We also have a uh, separate program called uh, Big Data on Cloud. 
so which is also i am also one of the mentors for that program that's that's a totally different program not your program but i was one of the co-author for that program and also mentor for that program so there we mostly deal with cloud and other kind of technologies right um well so let's get into what we are going to do right so uh, the idea is this is called introduction to python for ml so i think uh, from the industry session you could have got some idea about you know what will be the future right what you are going to learn over the period of time um so see uh, when somebody pick up the track of machine learning and you know start to learn what is machine learning and all um it's it's really important that you need a programming language that is for sure right so whatever you want to do you depend on a programming language and there are many languages like you you could have heard about r there is a language called r and sas and we also have python so we will be using python uh, throughout the course right so and you may ask like why are you like teaching using python why don't you just use r or any other language well um, python <laughs> as such has some advantages because if you look at a language like r for example that is only used for this data analytics kind of jobs whereas python is a universal language you know you can have uh, web development in python or you can do any sort of programming in python not only related to your machine learning so when when you go to the industry and when you start working with real projects right so maybe you are doing some sort of an ml project but that project also has a part where you know you are you are probably building a web application or making an api call or something like that so their python will become handy so you learn one language which can be used in many places actually and that is why we are using python basically and the second reason obviously is that it's sort of like very easy to learn so many people are like confused i am not from a programming background and also probably my programming is not so good as the other guy <laughs> so so python is very easy to learn compared to other languages uh, and and if you are comparing it something like java or something it's pretty easy right uh, because i have been working as a java developer so basically my skill set is java scala python so i also work on scala which is one of my primary skill set and then python so when i compare this together then you know learning scala or java is very difficult for you so that is why we have python as a primary language and also uh, python has a support for a rich set of libraries which probably i think the person could have explained to you so and what we will be doing today and tomorrow is uh, we are going to learn practically so there is no point in uh, you know talking about the history of python and uh, what is python for 4 hours nobody is going to learn anything end of the day so um i also have slides but i think even that is pointless like you can just run some slides and explain but some concepts are important but majority of the thing will be doing practically and uh, did you get a chance to go through the lms and uh, see what is there for the prerequisite or something like that have you guys went through the lms by any chance before coming to the class yeah so there is a python prerequisite i don't know how many of you have gone through that so there is uh, the first thing that you need to do is that you have to install something called anaconda and and have you installed it actually yeah okay so that's good so uh, see when you, python is open source by the way so you can just go to uh, the python website and download python that's one way of working with python uh, but that is not really useful because if you are downloading the open source python just original python it will not come with any libraries for you so usually what we do is that we prefer this distribution of python python called anaconda so anaconda is nothing but a distribution of python so basically when you download and install you will be getting python you will also be getting some of the libraries which are very commonly used with python and it is very easy to update and if you want to add any other libraries you can do it in anaconda so anaconda is one of the most famous uh, distribution of python um we also have another thing called nthot canopy there is something called canopy that's another distribution well canopy is not very popular like anaconda but i have also they are similar i mean the only difference is that the name and the project but end of the day if you download canopy also you get python same thing right now this is like a distribution which comes with i'll show you certain tools inside that for so one thing you will be getting is python for sure then you will be getting the libraries related to python then you will get an ide for python 
like Eclipse you have for Java, right? So very similar to that you have a ID called a Spider for Python. So if you are using Anaconda, you will get, be getting Spider and some debugging tools extra like that. But end of the day, they are all open source. It is not like any proprietary thing that you are using. But it makes easy for you to download and install. So we will be using Anaconda for our all the hands on practices. So this is a prerequisite you need to install Anaconda. And, and then I will show you what to do once you have installed it, how to test it and I will show you for something. And then we will be using Py3, I do not think this requires any explanation, but we have a version called Python 2, which is an old version. Python 2 uh, by 2012 or 2013 was officially, you know, removed from the community, not removed, the support was removed. So Python 2 no longer exist actually. Uh, but in some of the older projects, we still see Python 2, people writing the code. What we are using is Python 3. Uh, there is no major difference as such, some small syntax differences and performance improvements in Python 3, but everywhere people uh, follow Python 3 these days, right? And now, uh, how, how are we going to learn Python? So one thing you need to understand is that you are going to learn Python in the aspect of data science or machine learning. You are not going to learn Python to create a website, for example, that is different, right? So you will be learning Python specifically for data science or machine learning, which means when you start learning Python, there are certain libraries in Python which you might have to make use of. There is a library called NumPy, something called NumPy, and then there is something called Pandas, and then there is something called Seaborn. Now you do not have to really remember them, we will cover them anyway. And then there is something called scikit-learn and all. So what are these things? These are all libraries which you can download and install along with Python. And the good news is that when you download and install Anaconda, all this will come by default, like free. So you do not have to separately go and download them, right? And in this, so why, so this is actually your domain. For the rest of the year, you will be playing here. So this is where you are going to actually work uh, or at least 70 to 80 percentage of the time. I am talking only about ML, when you go to deep learning and all, it will be different, but usually in the ML side, this is where people play around, right? And in this, so what are these things, right? So NumPy is a library which is called a numerical Python and this is used for, uh, you know, things like uh, numerical data processing. For example, I can have things like uh, two-dimensional arrays, three-dimensional arrays, multi-dimensional uh, arrays and all. So mostly for scientific calculations and all, you need to represent your data in the form of an array. So you know what is an array, right? An array is just a collection of numbers. I can just say 1, 2, 3, 4. This is called an array. Well, this is technically a list, but you know. So something like this is an array actually, a collection of numbers. Now this is one dimensional, right? Now I can also have two dimensional and three dimensional and even more than three dimensional ways of representing the data. And if my project requires that my data needs to be represented in that fashion, and then I have to do some manipulation on my data, we use a library called NumPy. So we will touch base on NumPy and you will understand how this is happening. And if you, if you are thinking about uh, this image processing and all, which you will learn later, but uh, imagine you want to do something like image processing. So end of the day, what happens when you read an image or something, it will be converted to bits and uh, bytes basically, right? So you know that, right? So if I have a JPEG file, I will read it as an image, but when I want to process it, you know, I cannot just process an image. What I will do is I will convert it into numbers, basically ones and zeros. So and then I will be using this NumPy arrays to load that data and then do matching and classification or whatever you want to do. So NumPy arrays and all are very important when it comes to your deep learning image classification in some of those contexts. Maybe not immediately you will not work on NumPy, but a basic knowledge on NumPy will be actually helpful for you in, in the future, right? So this is one thing. One question. NumPy, more than two dimensions, can you work on? You can, you can. Uh, so I will probably explain that. So naturally the question will be that, how does the fourth dimension look like? Are you Christopher Nolan, right? I mean, obviously. So, yeah, so obviously people will ask, right? So two dimension, you know what it is. What about three dimension? That also people can imagine. What about four dimension, right? So then 
the discussion goes to a different track altogether. But yes, you can. You can actually visualize four dimensions. I can show that actually. It's not a big deal. It's not rocket science. It's very simple. But in some of the scientific calculations, we need the data in the form of four dimensions. And then you do additions and subtractions on the data. So you need a different type of data structure to represent that. Your normal data structures cannot define four dimensions or five dimensions. That is when we say we'll use NumPy basically, right? And in your projects or upcoming sessions, these will be explained further whenever it comes to the uh, point of NumPy, right? And uh, this pandas, this is what we will be starting today our analysis with. It's called pandas, okay? So pandas is a library for sort of like uh, label the data analysis. So you guys are familiar with Excel, right? Excel sheets. So the same thing in Python is pandas actually. You have label data like rows and columns, okay? And then you want to process the data. So I have uh, probably a data set with a million rows or 10 million rows and I want to find out something from that. So probably if I use Excel, it may not be a good idea. So in normal calculations, Excel is fine. But if my data set is like, you know, 10 million, 20 million rows of data, then that actually makes uh, a problem. So we had a customer. I was working with this uh, uh, Mercedes Benz, Merck, right? So they were one of our customers from Germany. So Merck actually what they do, all their cars are having this sensor thing. So they make weird cars, right? So if you look at a Mercedes Benz S class, it is one of the safest cars in the world. Why? Because it has around 200 different sensors on the car. So what they do, they collect this sensor data. When the car is moving, it will track the acceleration, brake and pedestrians and everything they will track using the car. So this sensor data they collect. So imagine the car is moving like if I'm traveling for, I don't know, probably three hours, it will collect the data. So this is text data and this will be in terabytes. The text data that you get, normal text will be in terabytes. So like more than billions of rows. But, but we can't help it, right? Because sensors will keep on, uh, you know, every second or even less than that, they'll keep on tracking the motion of the car or what it is doing. And they have to collect it. And end of the day, their problem is like, I want to analyze it and then probably make a machine learning model. So if I'm giving you such a file, for example, I'm giving you a text file or a CSV file where I'm saying that there are, you know, 100 billion rows. And obviously, you cannot load it in an Excel sheet. It doesn't even work that way. So that time we come to this pandas. Pandas is one of the libraries which helps you to do that. There are other libraries also, but pandas is most, most common. So where you work with the labeled data, you have rows and columns, and then you can have selection, filtering, indexing, grouping, joins, anything that you normally do on a data set. So we will be spending a lot of time on pandas as such. So this is one place where we need to spend. Uh, matplotlib, this is used for visualization. Like I want to draw a graph. So it's, it's very important to tell a story to your customers, right? So when you have a customer, so he will give you some data and, and then you want to talk to your customer. So you will analyze the data and usually what we do is that we, it's very rare that we use matplotlib directly. We use a library called Seaborn. The Seaborn is built on top of matplotlib basically. So this is the guy we actually use for visualization where you can have nice uh, graphs, bar charts, uh, pie charts or scatter diagrams or box plots or any type of plotting you want to do. Uh, but then you will be thinking that, hey, this is very similar, even I can do uh, what plotting and all. So how do you normally, if I ask you to uh, write a plot or create, what tools will you use? I mean, apart from Python in your data, Excel or, or, or probably PowerPoint or something you will use, right? But Huh. But the difference here is that these libraries, the Seaborn Matplotlib, they allow you to do statistical plotting. For example, I have a set of data. I want to calculate the mean, median and standard deviation. And based on that, I want to plot or I want to include those properties, then they will allow me. So it's not like a normal X, Y plot that anybody can do. I don't need Matplotlib for that. Right? So these two libraries have to do a bit with your statistical side. Now, the problem is that I will cover uh, Seaborn tomorrow for sure. Uh, but actually, in order to completely understand Seaborn, you need to have some statistics base. Your statistics class will start only tomorrow afternoon. My class is in the morning, actually. So, but we will cover it so that you will understand what it is. And also visualizations initially, you will not be touching a lot. 
as you proceed, uh, you know, the respective topics that will be covered, what sort of visualization you are using. So, these two are basically visualization and scikit-learn is where you apply actual machine learning. So, scikit-learn is your primary library for all the ML algorithms that you will be using, right. So, after uh, the next month or so, when you actually start learning machine learning, most of your machine learning algorithms are inside this library called scikit-learn. So, I will not be touching scikit-learn because that is a whole course actually. So, I will be my uh, job will be to cover basically pandas mostly and then matplotlib and seaborn in one and a bit of numpy and that is that is a job given to me to at least give you a basic idea. And again if you look at say something like pandas, the topic is very exhaustive. So, it is not like I am going to teach you everything about pandas in you know 3 hours or 4 hours that is impossible right. So, the way we do this is like I will be covering the basics of all of this today and tomorrow and Sunday you have a practice session. So, normally we have a practice session where you know somebody will be coming to assist you. So, you will have some questions to be uh, solved and answers will be there and you know you practice. And then the good news is like uh, your next class will be after a month and that class will be a statistical class not a python class. Then the technical class, well statistics is also technical. <laughs> the next class will be after 2 months actually when you start ML. So, you will get around 2 months to you know go through what I have taught you basically right. So, so that will give you enough time to pick up python. If somebody is thinking that okay I need some time to you know learn python or get some idea, you will get a good, good amount of time to pick it up right. Um, and yeah, sorry. Uh, so, one thing is that, so I do not want you to immediately pick it up. <laughs> so, no, normally trainers will not say like this, but you know I do not want you like today you go, go home and like shut up I am going to learn python for 3 hours now and then only I am going to talk to anybody right. So, it is not like that right. So, you cannot learn it that way. So, today and tomorrow mostly I want you to pay attention and understand what we are doing. You are not really learning anything right and then the Sunday class will give you some more idea. Then I am going to share you a set of assignments and practice and solutions which you must do and I am also going to share some learning material over the period to cover right. So, the idea is like you are all working professionals. So, you spend some time uh, every day probably you know half an hour or 15 minutes that is more than enough for you to uh, get prepared for python. And of course, in the ML classes python will be used in a different way. So, in ML classes you will be having pandas for sure, but then pandas is used ok I forgot. So, in the last class there was a small confusion. So, I take regular classes, but see this whole thing what we are doing is called EDA and I do not want you to forget this name there is a reason behind this. It is called exploratory data analytics. <laughs> Why this is funny actually because in the last uh, python class I taught all this but I did not say this name. So, in the next class the trainer said okay all of you have completed EDA, they said no, the trainer did not teach a single line of EDA and the other guy got confused. He immediately called me, what did you do for 8 hours? Did you actually skip your class? I am going to check the recording. So, no I did not skip, I taught all this. No, the participants are saying they did not even learn a bit of EDA. So, that, so keep remember the name if somebody asks you, say you learned at least. See I am also doing a job right. So, so, great learning is like okay this guy came last time I know he was in the class, but what he was doing we, we should probably check the recording. <laughs> so, in Chennai batch it happened actually. No, I mean it, it, it matters sometimes you know. So, this is called EDA. Why this is called EDA? Because usually in a typical machine learning project what you do is that you first collect the data whatever data you have and then you do this part called EDA exploratory data analytics. Um, there is a slide probably I will show you. Uh, which will be very uh, you know consoling for many of you because uh, a lot of people were concerned that you know I have to do a lot of programming now. So, after learning all this ML when I get a job I have to sit and program. So, there is a slide which is not just a slide around a 70 to 80 percentage of the time in a ML project you are not really sitting and programming you are just trying to understand your data and that is true I mean I am not making this up. So, when you start an ML project the problem is like, so we had a project on the uh, New York uh, Children's Hospital. We were working on a project from the New York Children's Hospital. So, there um, they, it is a children's hospital right. So, they were trying to detect uh, early cancer in children, that is a project. 
So, n goal is like you should uh, you know figure out if, if given a patient what is the probability this patient will get cancer or not. So, that is the end goal of this project actually. So, we know this is the project and we know okay this is what we need to do, but the real challenge is that if I need to do this what is the data that I am going to look at right. So, then you start understanding. So, first thing is that you understand the domain because I had no clue about the healthcare domain or specific to cancer. So, then you understand you know some aspects of the domain like what is cancer, what causes it, what are the factors which influences it, does age actually influences it. So, this will take roughly around 1 to 2 months to understand the domain and the features of our data. Then you talk to the hospital and the doctors and try to collect the data. So, initially you may not get enough data, you will just get the patient records which will have their age, weight and statistics and then you ask for more data. So, the more data you get the more features you can get from the data and that will impact your ML model. So, actually doing this ML is not a very big deal as you are thinking about because uh, you have an algorithm to do this right. So, probably in the morning you could have discussed. So, for every machine learning problem we have an algorithm which can solve the problem right. So, all you need to do is call the algorithm give the data algorithm will give you the result it is probably 10 minutes job really right. So, it is not like very complicated. But before you call the algorithm, you should have the right data in the right format to feed to the algorithm. Then only it is going to give you the expected result. So, majority of the time the data scientists are uh, spending in uh, you know understanding the data and seeing if I can collect other varieties of data, then what features I can extract. So, initially we were getting only patient records ok and then we build a model that was not very powerful you know it was giving results, but it was not really what the uh, you know center was expecting. And then we had further discussions and then they said we will also share some more data ok which is not directly related to cancer, but some of the things which may affect. For example, we started looking at uh, gene patterns and all. For example, if so if there is a study which is going on which proves that it can be hereditary. Cancer is not hereditary actually, but what is the effect of that right. So, then that is a whole different question. So, now you need that kind of a data where you know the person's hereditary details, his ge genome data, father, mother details and all this. What is his the history of cancer in the family right. So, then how do you represent that data? So, this is majority of the time we are playing with the data that is this EDA part. So, once your data is finalized and you have an idea ok, so this is what I want calling the ML algorithm is not a big deal actually. Everything is already written if I am calling a regression algorithm it is already written I am not writing anything just passing the data I am getting the output. But then I validate is this correct what I am doing. So, if that is not correct then I need to again rebuild my data and then train my model and all. So, that is why this EDA part is very important because you have to collect the data and then look at the data and extract certain features from the data and then compare it that is where uh, this EDA becomes very useful. These are not the only EDA methods there are further methods as well which you will cover later. These are some of the basic uh, EDA uh, things that we do usually. How much accuracy level you think like whether your model is actually fine or? So, uh, that project actually got on hold, but we went up to 96, 97 percentage uh, accuracy levels in that. So, right now that model is not running, but we were able to uh, you know achieve. I was not actively a contributor in that project, but I was helping them since that was a new project actually but we were able to get a good accuracy level in that actually. Um, so, it depends on what kind of problem you are uh, solving right, each problem is actually uh, different for ML. Um, and, and like I said, uh, so what we will do, we will just look at uh, basics of Python a little bit and then we will go to pandas and we will do some hands on with pandas right and uh, then numpy and then this visualization stuff right. So, I think possibly I should uh, you know get started with the hands on part. Um, so, if you can uh, look at your laptops right. So, today probably what we will do is like you can do along with me if you want. Maybe tomorrow I will do it myself because it also takes time right. So, uh, maybe depending on what we need to cover sometimes tomorrow what I will do I will just demonstrate and you can practice later also that will not be a challenge. So, if you have an installed anaconda right. Uh, you can just search for anaconda, so this is see there is something called anaconda navigator and you can just open it. 
just just to make sure that things are you know working fine <laughs> well uh, jupiter is in fact not an ide uh, spider is the ide we'll be using jupiter for sure i mean spider we don't use spider at all for ml projects actually i'll show you so once you start your uh, anaconda and one more thing you can do is that um, if if you're not really very much comfortable programming i mean you may be somehow comfortable but if you feel like you're not really comfortable programming you can just take a help for somebody who is sitting next to you right yeah so if you open anaconda you will see these icons and in these icons we are really interested only in this thing called jupiter notebook the second thing that you see there are many things actually we are not really using any of them for most of the data science <coughs> projects jupiter is the primary you know building platform for prototyping and all at least now when you begin right uh, then once you complete let's say 3 months 6 months and all probably you can use different tools also but to get started what you need is this thing called jupiter so either you can click on the launch button here one thing there is a launch button or even it will be available here if you go to the programs just type jupiter somewhere it will be there yeah so there is jupiter notebook so whichever way either you click on this launch or you click on this just open this thing called jupiter it will open in a browser i will tell you what it is it will open in a browser well uh, what is this right so jupiter is actually uh, an open source project originally it was called ipython notebook later it was renamed as jupiter notebook it is a browser based interactive shell for python meaning normally if you are writing a program what you do is that either you will take a text pad or something or you will open the command prompt and type the program so if you are doing something like java or something you will use eclipse or something right uh, in case of python uh, since it is sort of like a scripting kind of a language it's very easy to write the code what jupiter allows you to is to create something called notebook a notebook is an environment where you can type your code run the code see the output and the advantage is that you can share it with others also so just to show you an example we will pick up some notebooks but you guys can do this you can say new there is a new button and there is something called python 3 if you click on this python 3 ideally in a different tab this will open so what do you need to do just go here say new python 3 and something like this will open right are you able to do this yeah okay so this is called a notebook now if you really want to do what this guy is doing it's very simple for example i can say a equal to 5 uh, b equal to 10 okay and i can simply say print a plus b i think probably you can understand the code it's not so difficult so let's say i'm writing a code like this okay so i'm saying there is a variable a that's 5 b is 10 and i just want to print a plus b right so this is my program imagine now if i want to execute my program what i can do either i can click on this run button there is a button run or i can just press shift enter just run the code and show me the output here this is basically what it does right so it is an interactive notebook you can type and click and see what you are typing or what it is going to do and for most of your uh, data science or ml projects you will be using this tool because in ml it's very important that in every step you see what's happening right so you don't write a full code and then run it but rather you load the data then see what is the data filter it see what it is so the most convenient way to work that is using jupiter so we'll be using jupiter all the way right yeah so um, some of you are having small difficulties in starting ipython and all it's perfectly fine even if you are not able to do it right now it's perfectly fine okay so anyway i'll be sharing whatever i'm doing over the lms right now in the lms you have a file can you look in this file if you go to the lms um let me just uh can you see these files in lms there is a python overview python visualization store sales uber driver etc um where in lms there will be a, a zip file called python files do you see a zip file called python files can you download it and extract it uh, inside that you will have a zip file right can you download it and extract it 
And uh, so uh, once you download it, extract it and you should see these files. So basically what do you need to do, once you download them, open your Jupyter. So this is my Jupyter, right? And all you need to do is, let me see if it is already there. No, it is not there. Uh, all you need to do is that click on this upload button. There is an upload button, okay? And then select the file you downloaded. Let me show you which one. Uh, where is it? Python files. And then select this file called Python overview. Can you see? And say open. And click on upload. That's it. So what do you need to do? Click on um, you know this icon called upload. Click on this upload and upload this Python overview file. Now I have seen in some of the classes uh, for some participants when they try to do this, it will not get uploaded. And the issue was with the browser. So sometimes if you are using Internet Explorer, it will not allow you to upload. I don't know why for that reason, but. And if you have uploaded it successfully, you should see it here like this on my screen, somewhere in this home file. So um, if you just click on this file, Python overview, it should open like this. You know, you should see this actually, right? So this is the advantage of a notebook. See, uh, you can type your code and you can even type the explanation. See, so I have typed something like code structure, uh, what are you learning, you know, all these things. And this is not actually code. This is just the markup right that I'm doing. So I can even type these kind of explanations and share with people. So it's very easy, right? And I want you to do one thing. Once you open this, go to this cell menu. There is a cell. Can you see? And there is something called all output clear. The last option. Because uh, normally when you create a notebook, it will have some outputs already. So I just want you to clear it. So just go to this cell menu, all output, you can say clear. Now you can also insert uh, your own, uh, you know, cells. So basically how the notebook works, you can see different, different cells. Each cell can be executed independently. And you can also write your own cells if you want, right? And this is a core structure. So first we will look at uh, some of the native data types in Python, which are important for you. And we will look at pandas and basic data frame attributes and common data manipulation tasks using pandas. Then there is loops and functions visualization, any other miscellaneous topics, right? And what I want you to do first is to run this cell. Under this basic data types, you have a cell here. So either you can press shift enter or you can click on this run button. And how do you know whether it is actually running? You will see this number one here. Can you see? This means it has ran. Okay, so that, that is the only way to identify whether that cell has executed. What is that cell exactly? Uh, and what is this? So basically, I'm just doing a small import here. So I'm saying that from IPython, import something called interactive shell. And interactive shell code interactively all. I will explain this. So basically, what I'm doing is that I'm just telling that I want to work interactively on the uh, IPython notebook. So you just need to run to standard code, you know, boilerplate kind of code, whenever you are interacting with IPython. I will explain what this code means to you uh, in a moment, right? But just run this and make sure you can see this, it is actually running, right? Now actually there is some code here, but you can insert your own cell. So I don't want to just run, what you can do is that you can say insert and you can say cell below. And what will happen? You will get a cell like this, right? And you can adjust like what you want to type, that's up to you. So after you run the first cell, I just want you to insert a cell. And in Python, at least for the time being, you need to know only three basic data types. So if you put a hash, it will not work. Commenting is hash in Python, you know, right? So if you type a hash and type any code, it will not actually execute. So that is why I'm typing a hash. So basically in Python, the three data types you should know uh, are one is called a list, then there is something called a dictionary, and then there is something called a tuple. So what I'm saying is that list, dictionary and tuple are the three data types you should know, at least for your ML and all these kind of things, mostly. There are other data types also in Python. Of course, there are n number of data types, but these three things are very important because these three data types can hold your data, you know, like more than one piece. So all these are collections kind of data. And, and the first thing that typically you should know is called a list. So what is a list? A list is nothing but a collection of elements 
and how do you create a list is like this for example i can say something like this my list equal to let's say 20 30 you guys can also try with me if you want 70 that's it so how do you identify something as a list is the square bracket so that is the thing you need to understand if you see a square bracket it's a list right and so i just created a list called my list and you say equal to and then you just type this so this creates a list now in case of your uh, ipython notebook if you want to run something so i have this i can just say run and it should uh, just create the list for me so now the list is created for me and if you want to see this you can simply type the name i can simply say my list uh, my list and run this again and it should print it so this proves that the list is actually created so whenever you want to print something uh, in the notebook you don't have to explicitly type print the last line is anyway printed so you may be wondering that normally when you want to print something you say print and then the this thing in the ipython notebook the last line or any variable you just write it will print it by default so you can easily see that right so first thing you need to understand is that this is a list you see the square bracket thing right and also if you want to access any element from the list you will always say my list okay i'll just probably type it here and you can simply say this notation zero so what will happen you can access the elements using the index position so zero will be the first element it will print 20 right and if i say 0 comma 1 what will happen no it will not print <laughs> so you cannot access like that okay so yeah so i'll tell you but <laughs> so if you want to just print one particular element you can say like 3 so this will print what 50 because 0 1 2 3 now if you want a range of elements for example i want to print the 20 and 30 right you can simply say uh, i can say something like 0 to 2 so when you say 0 to 2 what it basically means is that i want to print 0th and the first element not the second one not not the position 2 so if i say 0 to 2 it's going to print 20 30 if i say 0 to 3 what it will print 20 30 40 right uh, so this is one way of accessing you know the elements within the list you always use this colon notation and say that which elements or which range you want to actually print and, and this notation is very common in python this is not only in list even if you go to data uh, pandas and all we'll be using this colon something from something it will start printing those elements okay now what if i want only 20 and 40 i don't want everything right i want only 20 and 40 so 20's position is what 0 then what 3 i don't know you get it no so take it as an assignment i'll explain this but yeah so normally when you want to print a series of elements you will say like this 0 to 3 this will print let's say 20 30 40 i'll tell you how to print individual elements or you guys can figure it out figure it out and tell me also some in class assignment for that right so my question is that how do you print 20 and only 50 if you want you can try and let me know um anybody got any answer then it is easy for me 0 comma 3 0 comma list indices must be integers or slices not a tuple it is throwing some error right it is not printing right oh okay 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 separately no no i just want <laughs> Ah. Zero is in the square bracket, comma, and then okay so zero in a square bracket comma then what is that three right sorry remove the external brackets oh you don't want external brackets no comma also remove an external brackets also 
That's not the syntax. You don't follow that syntax. No, that doesn't work, right? Okay, it's a small trick. I'll tell you, I'll let you know. Okay, so as of now, we are just printing series. Okay, I mean continuous elements, zero to three. I'll tell you how to print individual ones. Don't worry. Okay, uh, you can. Uh, but it's very rare that uh, normally in a list kind of a category, it's very rare that you pick up individual elements because normally if you are creating a list that will have like one million elements inside it, and it's very rare that I say I want only the third and fifth. You mention a range of elements actually. You can also do this. You can simply say. Uh, for example, one colon and what that does is that if I say one and just colon, it picks up 30, that is the first element and gives you all the things after 30, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. I can also say two colon if I want, that should give me 40, 50, 60. So you have this nice ways of accessing elements within the list, whichever way you want, right? Uh, so that is, we will look at lists more, do not worry. There is a simple example of a list and here also we have created a list. Now my question, do not run this, okay. My question to you is that will this actually work? So here I am saying x equal to 1 then b. So what is the speciality of this list? It has different data types. It has different data types. Does it actually work? No. Yes. I do not know, I am just asking. Yeah, it works. So, uh, but list can contain different type of elements, okay. but ideally we keep similar type of elements. Now, apart from the list thing, insert cell below, another thing which is very interesting is a dictionary. So, I can say something like dict equal to and how do you uh, create a dictionary is with a curly braces. So, whenever you see a curly braces, that is a dictionary, okay. And what is a dictionary? A dictionary is a collection of key value pairs. For example, I can say Raghu and I am a trainer, right, and then you guys, right, <laughs> you or you guys, I do not know, you are what? Participants, right, sorry. And I can also mix them, for example, I can have another key, for example, there is a key called 3 and I can say this is something like my number. So basically what is a dictionary? The idea is that you represent it using curly braces, first point and it always has a key and value structure. For example, here Raghu is the key and trainer is the value, again U is the key and participants is the value, 3 is the key, my number is the value. Now inside a dictionary, there is no strict rule as to what should be the key, what should be the value, that is for you to define. You can have strings, you can have integers inside a dictionary. Uh, but one thing is that when you want to access the elements of a dictionary, normally in a list you will say 0th, 1st, 2nd, here you will use the keys to access the elements. For example, uh, you want something, you can simply say, so what is the name of the dictionary? Uh, DICT, right? So the dictionary name is DICT and I can simply say something like this. So if I want to get say what is the value of Raghu, I can simply say call the key Raghu and you will get trainer or, or any key for that matter. So I can say give me the value for three and you will get my number. So basically this is used like a lookup table, sort of like a hash table where you have fixed number of key value pairs and you can just call the key and you will get values. You can also print things like this, for example, I can say dict dot keys, sorry, yeah, so if I just ask for the keys, it is going to give me all the keys, what are there in the key. You can also, you should also be able to do a dict dot values, sorry, I am always missing, yeah. So basically if you want, if you get a dictionary and you just want to know what are the keys or values inside it, you can just call a 
dot keys and dot values it's going to give you the keys and values and then you can access uh, whichever values using the key now individually you can do like this but if you are interested in accessing a range of keys like i want a 100 keys then ideally you should go for a for loop or something so typically if you want to iterate through a dictionary and get different different values we use a for loop i'll show you so usually you say that four elements and then one by one i want all the values or something like that uh, so that's how you look at a dictionary now we are not really dealing with object oriented programming here so how many of you are coming from the oops background object oriented thing uh, because why i am talking about this is that usually in your data science or ml side we don't normally deal with object oriented concepts but python is a language which supports object oriented programming it is an oops language so normally you have an object and then you will have methods and attributes for the object right so that is what when i am saying this these are functions on the object actually right so i am saying that dicks with a brackets right so basically you can have function calls and then get the value whatever you want so these are defined on the dictionary actually so we will see them more so directly you will not be dealing with classes or objects a lot in python uh, but you may sometimes use some of the built in methods like this right now another interesting thing that you can do is um, let me just insert a cell below so i can say the same thing right so i can have a dictionary where you know i can have the keys like this so let's say i'm picking up you guys okay so you are a student okay and you were working in ibm right you were working in ibm and then there is another student s underscore 2 and this student was working in multiple companies so let's say infi uh i don't know we are in the silicon valley of india right give me some company names <laughs> infi then what i know only infi and ibm why am i like this huh wipro no be more creative right give me something more google so what i did here is that i created a dictionary and there is a key and value the value can be anything so in this example the value is a list right the value is a list and i can simply ask for students and then i can say give me for s1 s1 right and i should get ibm right but if i am asking for student 2 i should get infi wipro google and all right now tell me one thing uh, what if i want to know the so these are in order for example the second student has first joined infosys promoted to wipro by fluke entered google okay i don't know how do you get promoted from wipro to google but yeah happened so so i want to know what is the second company he was in so when i say s2 i am getting all this i don't want this i just want to know wipro what will you do s2 of 1 bracket 1 s2 of 1 right so you can actually so this is the way to access a list right so i can just say that i want the key within the key you know i just want so this will return the value within the value i want the second element which gives you wipro right or like this if you want only google you can do like this so these kind of operations are possible uh, and the same thing i have written here right uh, we will look at them later um, okay so there is also one more thing called a tuple so this is called a tuple can you see uh, how do you define a tuple is within the bracket normal bracket right uh, so what is the major difference between a list and tuple is that list is mutable but tuple is immutable for example uh, so this is tuple so let's say my list equal to 1 2 3 4 5 right so uh, in the ipython not sorry in the jupyter notebook if you want to understand what are the operations you can do 
on a particular item, you can do one thing. For example, I have a list now. I can say my list and put a dot and put a tab. So you can just type my list, put a dot and then put a tab. It will show you a list of arguments you can pass. So you can always see there is something called append. So I can actually do a append uh, and uh, let's say seven. So what happens here is if I do a my list meaning lists are uh, mutable you can add elements you can even remove elements there is a method called pop and there is a method called remove using that you can just pull the remove the elements you can add elements but if I look at uh, this tuple which I created I say tup what is that underscore ex dot uh, I do not see a method called append. So, tuples are totally immutable. Once you create it, you cannot modify that. So, if your requirement is like that, then probably keep your data in a tuple format. That is up to you to decide. Okay? So, that is a difference between a tuple and a uh, list. right? So, lists are mutable, uh, tuples are not by the way. Mm. Now, one more interesting thing, okay, I want to talk a little bit about the notebook actually is that here you have this new notebook and all which you should know ideally and you can actually save this no notebook. You can say download as notebook. So if you have added some lines, you did something, you want to save it, you say download as notebook file and then you can upload again back to Jupyter, right? Uh, oops, you can rename it. One more thing is that if I have this line, so normally what happens is that if I type anything here, a equal to 5, it will execute it. Now I do not want it to execute, I want like a heading. So what I can do, I can just type something, this is to test python and I can just select this cell and there is a cell type, where is it? cell, yeah, cell type, I can say markdown. So, if I keep it as markdown, it will just, uh, you know, print it and you can always have this hash option. For example, I can put a hash and that will increase the font, you know, so this is like, you can just make it bigger and if you type two hashes, it will be the second heading, third heading, like that you can have very nice representation. So, always remember this because sometimes what I have seen, uh, people will mistakenly make a cell as markdown, then it will not execute the code whatever you are typing, it is just going to print whatever you are typing, right. So, you can just go to this cell type and say whether it is a code markdown, there is also row convert, do not bother about it, but make sure it is code if you want to run it actually, right. Um, <clears throat> and if you go to this help menu, you can actually see what are installed. So, there is numpy, scipy, matplotlib, SymPy and Pandas. There is also a library called SymPy, we will talk later. But since you are seeing the help of these things, that means these libraries are already there. I think ideally you should also see the similar things, you can get the help about them. Uh, but in case let us say you want to install a library in future, so let us say there is a new library which came, you want to install from the notebook, the ideal way of doing it is this command, PIP install and then you can just mention what you want to install. So, if you put an exclamatory mark at the beginning, it will run from the command line, right. So, PIP is a tool which we use for Python installation. So, I am just saying that I just want to install pandas. If I run this, well pandas is already installed. So, it is going to throw an error saying that you know the library already exists, but you can see a star here which means this cell is now executing still running. So, when you see a star here, that cell is uh, getting executed. So, it says requirement already satisfied, pandas is already there, but in future. So, one way is PIP install pandas, another way is conda install pandas. So, either you say PIP install or you can say conda install also. So, since it is part of anaconda, the installer is called conda and say conda install, it will install. Uh, so, if there is a new library, you can just google how to install say ABC 
in in uh, anaconda the exact command will come copy paste it and install it very easy so uh, any questions uh, so far uh, anyway it is already installed as well so it's going to throw an error uh, this star will be really useful uh, when you actually build ml models and all because when you are building machine learning models uh, what it will do is that it will take your data and then do something called iterations on the data so it will read your data then iterate multiple times so that sometimes might take some time so you can actually say that okay your code is executing you need to wait for some time <clears throat> right and and right now one of the uh, problems that uh, we are facing so i'm just sharing uh, i mean uh, some of the probably not exactly a problem but from my experience uh, so see we are always uh, moving ahead with new technology right so in the older days the problem was that the hardware was a problem so i don't know what to do with the hardware so that is when you started getting this cloud and all as an option now everything is available in cloud even your entire uh, ml things can be automated in the cloud apart from your local notebook so initially when machine learning and all became very popular uh, we were very much using cloud for most of this uh, building ml models and all and that was very easy and now the challenge is uh, we are now from ml we have gone to something called deep learning or ai kind of side uh, so in in when you go to deep learning one of the problems that you will face is for the hardware right for example if you are building something on image classification say uh, so one of the project uh, which i am mentoring so you have this capstone projects right so what happens when you do a capstone project you will be a group let's say four or five guys and then there will be a mentor like me who will help you to so uh, currently i am mentoring a capstone project so what these guys are doing they have a cctv camera uh, footage identification that's what they are doing so they have the images and by looking at the image the system should say the system should actually describe the scene it's not like uh, it should say there is a dog or cat should actually see what is the content of the so they are they are building something similar in that fashion now the challenge there is actually not building the model the model and all are fine but if you are doing things like deep learning and all you need a lot of gpu graphical processing unit that is the challenge because gpus are very costly you know what is gpu right it's graphics card kind of thing right so if you are using a laptop or something it will not work because you will have what 2 gb or i don't know 3 gb max so one possibility we explored was that uh, you can sign up with the google cloud and google cloud gives you some credits for free so if you sign up with google they will give you around 21000 rupees credit for free you can use their services worth 21000 rupees right even with that the credits ran out because these guys need around i think 16 gigs of gpu or something so to train the model they took one or two days by that time the account is over so the 21000 rupees are gone after 3 days so then what will you do right i mean so i think the next challenge that we are going to face is on the gpu side like you know how do you get it right of course if you pay money you will get it that's not a big deal but you know what is an economical way of building a, a deep learning model that is the next challenge actually right now and it is very popular so because it is not easy uh, locally you cannot get it the only way is from the cloud probably but they are very costly so if you are running it by paying money then it will be really really costly right so i think we are still trying to find out what to do i mean so initially they build the model as a test in the laptop that was working fine but when you are really doing a project you need the real data right so not like a test data so that time it will take more resources for you so even i don't know what to do i just suggested them you either pay or you know get some other cloud vendor or something google is the only vendor who is i think paying this much money if you sign up with amazon or something they won't give you aws aws no aws has a scheme called a free tier that's basically cheating <laughs> you should file a case against them actually for such a so amazon basically will say we will give you every service for one year free in fact nothing will be given right so they will give only minimal services for us they will charge like gpu based services and all they charge they don't give it free azure is also giving some level of discount but so far what we explored is google cloud they are giving good amount of free money so i mean i'm just saying so some of the challenges right 
e even when you do these kind of analytics, ML analytics, normally you can work on this kind of data on a laptop. Like if you are having even uh, let us say a CSV file with let us say 10 million, 20 million rows in your laptop you can easily manipulate using data frames that is not a big deal. Uh, but if it goes beyond that then you may not be able to directly run on a lap or something you need a better configuration machine. So, good option will be that uh, you can use any cloud uh, provider just to test if you are having. Can't we have a, this thing go the paralyze or a distributed? <coughs> yes, you can. So, one way will be that you take the same thing to cloud. Uh, when you are talking about distributed way, the small challenge will be that you need to learn a bit about it. For example, I can use something called Spark. There is something called Apache Spark. Apache Spark is a big data processing platform. I basically train people on Spark. So, Spark has the same ML capability. Spark supports all the ML models. So, what Spark basically do, it takes let us say a bunch of machines like 10 or 20, distribute your load. Uh, but you need to learn certain things about Spark because for example, I am using here NumPy, right? NumPy does not work in Spark. You have a similar data type or, or if I am just using Pandas, uh, Pandas as such does not work. So, they have a similar one called data frames, okay? So, there is some difference. So, you might have a small learning curve. Right? Concepts are a, a end of the day same like if you are building an ML model, ML model everything will be same, but this uh, explore EDA part there will be some changes because Spark is having its own data types to deal with not the regular uh, you know ones we see. So, that is one challenge we see sometimes you know when you build a model and you want to do distributed way, you need to slightly uh, change the EDA part, rest everything will be <laughs> perfectly fine. Yeah, so some of the people are actually uh, uh, exploring those distributed computing platforms as well. So, I mean just some of the thoughts I probably uh, should be interesting if you uh, go further not immediately. Right. So, now what I want you to do is, so now we will just start uh, working with uh, pandas. So, what I want you to do is, can you see this slide? There is a slide called read the data, uh, not a slide, there is a box uh, cell, right. I want you to run this slide, but do not run this numpy thing. So, you can just comment this, right now we do not need this. So, basically you need to run import pandas as pd. But we need the data, right? So, what do you need to do? Go to the files which you downloaded. There is an Excel file called Uber Drives. Can you see? Can you open that? The Uber Drives? I will, I will leave you open from my side. Yes, so I just opened it. Let me just I uh, will quickly explain what this is. So, basically this is an actual data set which uh, we have collected. So, this is regarding the Uber trip data. So, how do you explain this data? So, there is a start date and end date. Uh, so, start date is when the trip was started and end date is when it was ended. Most of the cases it is same date, same date trips. Uh, then there is a category that is always business then there is a starting point of the trip for the Uber driver. So, these are all cities in uh, US right, New York, Fort Pierce and all and then there is a stopping place where the trip ended and the number of miles covered and then there is also a purpose of the trip. So, this is how the data looks like and if you select any of the column, you have roughly around 1000 plus you know lines of data. So, we, we are just interested in analyzing this data we just want to ask some interesting questions to this data and we want to do that using the pandas module, right. Um, one thing that I would suggest you do is that just rename this file. So, because it is called Uber Drives 1, just remove this 1, just call it as Uber Drives 2016. I do not know why there is a 1 actually, I mean you can keep it, but typing that will be <laughs> problem, right. And then what you want to do, go to your uh, notebook and in the notebook you need to upload it. 
so go to the home folder of jupiter say upload and upload the uber drives open upload see it will be here can you see so just click on the upload button select the uber drives click upload it should uh, it should ideally uh, show you on the screen of the home page like this and uh, uh, python has a lot of ways to read a uh, different type of files right right now we are interested in csv you can also read excel files and other formats of files so for the time being we'll concentrate on csv files if you want to read a csv file all you need to do is that you can say so what is this line import pandas as pd what do you mean by this as pd it's an aliasing right it's an alias so the library that i'm importing is pandas I'm saying that I want to import pandas as pd. So this, it's just an alias name. And so pd will refer to pandas. If you want to read the CSV using pandas, you simply say pd.read underscore CSV and just give the name of the file. And then if you actually want to see the file, okay, you can simply type df. Oh, I didn't run this, right? Sorry. <laughs> You have to first run this, right? I'll run this, then run this. Might take a moment to read it. So df will be uh, uh, your um, uh, file, I mean the variable in which you are reading it. I don't know why it is taking this much time. Usually it should read very fast. My PC is actually very slow today for some reason. Let me do one thing, okay? I'll just restart and play. So I'll just say import this. Why it is saying it is still star for me? Are you guys able to read it? No? Yes. So uh, can you see this? So the moment uh, you say df, it's going to print it. Now the question is, what exactly is this thing called a df? df is called a data frame. Well, the name can be anything, okay? it can be Raghu. I'm saying the data type is called a data frame. What is a data frame? A data frame is the basic data structure we have inside pandas, which represents your data in the form of rows and columns. So this pretty much looks like your Excel spreadsheet and that data structure is called a data frame. So in order to create a data frame, what I'm doing, I'm just reading this CSV file using this method and assigning to this variable called df. Now df is my data time, uh, my data frame, right? And if you simply type the name of the data frame, it should print the output like this. So you can actually see what is inside this. Um, also in Python, if you want to verify the data type of anything, you can do this. You can simply say, I think it should work, type of df. Yeah. So you can just say type of df, it will say pandas core frame data frame. So basically this is a data frame. So pandas is actually built on top of NumPy. It is built on the NumPy library actually. It does not directly use NumPy, the methods are different. But the core data structures are built on top of NumPy. They, we need to use pandas actually. NumPy doesn't have any built-in libraries to read uh, Excel files or anything. Also in NumPy, you don't have these labels. This, uh, if I print this, df, you have this start date, uh, end date, category. Those are the column headers, right? That structure is not available in NumPy. So it anyway will, will not uh, be able to read what is in the data. So in order to read, I need uh, pandas. So I'm saying that in the data frame, you can actually call it as a column name that is possible. But in uh, NumPy, there is no way to do that. It doesn't support any labeling as such. So now the question is that if you simply say read underscore CSV, how it is able to, you know, read it like this. For example, this is my column headers in Excel, sorry, CSV that it is reading. So by default, the setting is like the first row will be considered as your column header. Now, what if I don't have a column header, right? I get a CSV file, there is no column header. Hmm? So 
if you google for this pd dot read csv method there are some arguments you can pass hmm? you can say skip a line skip the header add a header or or and one common problem that we have when you do things like this is that um, even though we are not very stringent about this we are uh, always looking for data types right so one common problem that you are going to have is that if i read this this is fine i have something called a start date and end date so what is this this is dates right so normally you want to do things like i want to subtract one date from another date or i want to compare two dates now if i want to do something like that they should be represented in the date data type right but the problem is that normally when it reads this will be string i will show you how to look into that but normally when you simply say pd dot read csv it's going to assume this is a string everything is a string unless it sees some integer this will be an integer or a float but these are all strings so in this pd uh, dot read csv method if you read about it in pandas i will show you there are some arguments you can pass for example i can say the third and fourth column are dates please consider them as date data type or skip the first line that is not the header etc but as of now we are simply reading it because the header is also the same one here right now i think we will be able to see this if i do a df dot ah look at here you can always do a df dot d types what does this mean each columns data type i want to know now whenever you see an object that is nothing but a string this is a string so the class is actually called object that is what is showing as object so the only column it is identifying is float 64 that is a miles column that is okay with me but my start date and end date is object or string i don't want it to be string i want it to be date right so so there are ways to convert it i'll show you so that like command line import on this pd is not defining pd as a function to import no 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 this is an alias for pandas so pandas is my library i'm just saying that i don't want to type pandas dot read csv i'll type pd dot csv aliasing i can also say import pandas as raghu then i can say raghu dot read csv uh, you, you, you can you can you can you can simply say import pandas and pandas underscore read but these are some of the common how do how do you say things that we do in and when you are importing numpy you will always say import numpy as np that is a standard you know so even if you read production codes you will say np dot np dot because they could have imported as np normally right so now another point is which is good if i do this from pandas uh, i mean import pandas as pd one of the drawback is that this will import the whole pandas library maybe i don't want that i don't want all the functions i want only selected things so you can say from pandas import only selected ones i think ha ah, see from pandas import read underscore cs if i do this but the problem is only this will work i can't do anything else put this worksheet into uh, this workspace that you're working in no no this is just uh, this is not a worksheet this is our notebook so this is just the so all these import statements i am running here they will be running using command line behind the scene uh, one more thing is that what i did is that this uh, uber driver csv i uploaded in the uh, this thing notebook right and then i say read it so right now this is in my directory and the original file doesn't get changed the original file because that is a good practice uh, i have a csv file and if i directly read it from where it is existing and i do some manipulation then what will happen my original file gets altered so all these changes what i am doing it, it is not going to affect my original file so you could have downloaded it somewhere so this will upload it it's, it's on workspace right and whatever i am and if i want there is a method called a pd dot to csv so if i have this data frame i created this did some manipulation i want to save it back i can say pd to csv back to the csv file that's also possible so this point is very important because when you look at the data types uh, this guy is object this guy is object that means my dates are actually string i don't want string i want the date data type i will show you how to convert it and it's a very common requirement because uh, we have examples where uh, you know you are getting sensor data in certain intervals 
and the sensor data will have a timestamp order because every time interval it is sending the data and this will be in the unix timestamp format which nobody can understand like it will have milliseconds microseconds nanoseconds and date and time so so what will happen when you read it as a pd uh, dot uh, csv or anything it will say there is a string right so then you have all string values you can't do any manipulation so ideally you should change that into a date data type i will show you how to do that but that's a very common thing that we do right and one thing to confuse you very much is okay so this is really confusing uh, if i type just df oh sorry you see this right there is one thing which is confusing here can you tell me what is confusing no confusing no 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 the point is it has something called row index this 0 1 2 3 this is very confusing normally in an excel you don't have this you have it but you don't really care but in pandas this is very important and this is one thing which confuses people a lot because if i want to access the data i can say column wise or row wise and whenever i say row wise i have to use these numbers now one way to do this is that so when i when it read by default it added these values right i didn't specify one way is that i keep it like this another way is that i can define my own index i can say i don't want 0 1 2 3 i'll type whatever i want you keep it here and then store it that is also possible and i'll show you in the upcoming sessions but this is something which confuses people and even though we call this as a column it is not a column so we say this is a column in, in our normal terms we are saying that there are rows and columns this is not a column this is called a series s e r i e s series series is a data type so basically a data frame is nothing but a collection of series this is one series two series three series four series that is why each series has a data type so in simple terms we will say that you read a csv file csv file has seven columns that's what you say but in reality when you look at the data types uh, this is a data frame a data frame is made up of multiple series each one is called a series actually you can see the data type actually of the series we did a d types and each column it was saying what is string or object so that's called a series actually and and in some of the classes i have seen people discussing how to create a series from scratch but i don't think that's not really important because when you start working in production it is very rare you create your own data you get it from somewhere that will come in excel or csv or something i don't think that you will create your own data by typing and then creating but that is also possible if i want manually i can create a data frame you can just fill in these columns and create a data frame uh, so we read it right that's what we have done okay so one more thing is that when you simply say df it's printing the whole data frame if i have like 1 million lines it's not really a good idea so you can always say df dot head h e a d this is going to give you the first five lines that's easy right because you just want to have a sample of how the how the data looks like and one interesting thing that you can do in uh, your notebook is that so this head is a function that we are calling if you want to understand what is head doing you keep the mouse cursor inside this head and press shift tab what it says it is saying df dot head n equal to 5 that means the number of rows are 5 if i want more i can say n equal to 10 so how did i get it just keep your mouse inside this press shift tab it will give you an explanation of the method that you are calling well works in some cases in some cases very complex functions it will not give you the entire detailed explanation therefore that you need to look into the documentation but sometimes it is handy so always do a head and always do a shape uh, another one is a shape what is the shape it will tell you how many rows and how many columns are there 1156 rows and then seven columns this is really uh, helpful because you will be doing a lot of filtering manipulation and then you want to know how my data looks like how many rows i read how many so always do a shape very important always do a head in common data manipulation right 
So, shape is another method you can use right. Yeah, so we are able to get the data right. Now, one of the things like I said there is a problem is with the uh, time that we have right. So, what we can do is that we can actually uh, you know convert this start date and end date these things, but before we do that let us have a look at it. So, already we did a head and shape you can also do a tail which I am not really interested, but <clears throat> one thing you can see from the tail is the last row. In the last row this is actually a sum of all the value like this is miles, so they have added all the values. And what is this NAN? This NAN is sort of like the official junk value in uh, pandas. It is like null, it is not null, NAN stands for not any number. So, whenever uh, a data frame does not have anything to fill or if it reads something which it, it does not understand it will it is not treated as null. There is nothing called null actually in uh, uh, a data frame. Instead of null you can say NAN. So, that it can be counted and it, uh, it, it can yes. do the analysis on this. Yes. So, the uh, useful use cases will be uh, sometimes when you read the data there will be some junk character which pandas is not able to understand and the junk character can be anything it will not be one character. So, all those junk characters common, commonly it will treat as NAN. Now, I can say select all the NAN replace everything with something say 1 or 0 or even the mean or delete it something like that. So, it is officially used to remove this kind of junk values. Why you are seeing it here? Because normally in a data frame it has a fixed row column structure everything should be filled ideally right. So, in the last uh, I am not able to add all these things. So, it, it, it just simply filled it with an n values here you can see only this field is added here right. You have 1000 or 12000 something right some value. It is I will show you yeah. So, we will just look into that, but before that I just want to show you one small example. So, have a look at here. Uh, so, this is something which um, may be interesting because what I am doing here is that there is a method called uh, pd dot data frame. What this allows you to do is to create a data frame from your own definition. So, normally you will read a CSV that is a different thing. So, right now what I am saying that I am creating a data frame myself and if I look at the data frame oh sorry I should run this first it looks like this right. So, how I have created a data frame this is a dictionary right what is this? This is a dictionary and in the dictionary what you have you have key value pair A is the key B is the key, C is the key. So, if you pass a dictionary the keys will become the column names, the values will become whatever values you have and the index row index is anyway 0, 1, 2 right. So, it created a data frame like this and now the problem is if I look at the data types again I have the same problem because A is I do not uh, mind it is a string 1, 2, 3, 4 be it, B is integer that is also fine with me, uh, but C for me is string, uh, but C is actually the date right, but it has read it as a string. So, what I want to do I just want to convert that into a date data type. Now, there are multiple things you can do for example, the method is actually this it is called pd dot to date time. So, this is actually the uh, method and you can say something like 2016 uh, June 2. So, there is a built in method called a to date time and what you can do you can just pass a string like this. So, I am just passing 2016 June 2 right what it did it automatically identified that year is this month is 6, date is this and the time is 0, 0, 0 right. This is very important and you can and what if you want to pass multiple things you can put a list sure 2002-16 right or anything 2002-1. So, what is the error you are getting? 
the middle one should be a task and compare the running one on the other. So, 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 by default what it does the format is what year month and date but what if my data is not like this there is a way to convert it to mention the format so by default if you look at today time it will uh, mention that so in python there is a date time library which you can import once you import it uh, inside that you can say that dot format and my month is this. Uh, I will quickly do one thing. I uh, you know that I am bit uh, offloading the discussion. Uh, where is the, there is one more thing. Python files, give me one moment, okay. I have downloaded, did you guys get only this? Okay, this one. Sorry, guys. I'll just extract this. Uh, what I can do is I can go here and I say upload. And I can say there is a file called final. In this, I have this. I'll share it with you guys. Okay, don't worry. Python basics. This one I will share it with you, do not worry, but I am just, yeah. So there is a built in uh, date time function. So if you are particular about the date format, what you need to do, you need to import this date time. You can import this date time, date and time. And then you can do something called strip time. So I can mention that, you know, this is my data and the format is like year, month, uh, date, hour, minute, second. This way I can mention. So you can Google around it. It's not as so of by default, but if you look at this two date time, this will accept only in this format. But I can say like this, right? 11, 2, that should give me. Now, what if you have multiple dates? What will you do? I have two dates. I want to convert two dates. You always keep it in a list. So the advantage of list is this. So whenever you want to keep multiple things, you can keep in a list. For example, I can say that this is in a list. Oops. And I can say, give me one more date, some date. Uh, 2020, comma one. Sorry. One dash one. So now, uh, oops, does not convert. Yeah, the D type is date time, right? It converted, right? So if you are having multiple elements, you can actually pass it as a list and they should be able to convert. If you have a single element, you can just say that convert it into that format. Uh, but that is not our problem, right? Our problem is that we have uh, uh, what you say a data frame that is called temp. And in this temp, uh, so let us run this, where is temp, temp, yeah. So in this temp, I want to convert this C, right. So how do you do that? I think I deleted it. You can say temp of, so what is the column that you want to convert? C. You can simply say pd dot. So when you are converting, this is what you need to do. Uh, this is how you access a column from a data frame. So you will say temp is my data frame. I want to access the C equal to, I want to do something with it. I want to convert to date time of this column. So this will be replaced by the C column. So if I do a temp dot d types and C C is now date time this converted. So any column that you have, you can just do a date time and convert it. And usually that is a good, uh, common practice that we do. Many places you have strings and you just want date time only for that. Uh, it will change the original file. So when you are doing these kind of modification, the original data frame temp will get changed. Now if you do not want to do that, you should assign to another uh, data frame and do it. 
uh, and that is another very confusing concept in pandas in pandas there are some operations which will change the original data frame some operation which will not change for example if you are adding a column you can add a column to a data frame if you are adding a column that will change the uh, original data frame so what will happen if i say just add a column my data frame will change to someone but sometimes when i am removing a column you know the original data frame will not get changed so i will say okay data frame remove the last column then if i again again i type data frame the column will exist so i need to assign that to another variable and then do it so in when we reach those respective examples i will share you probably but in this example yes the original data frame gets changed so the data type gets changed actually uh now another problem that might happen is if you do something like this can you guys try this i want you to do a what can we do try this do a pd dot to date time okay convert it uh, let's say you have a series of values list of values let's say 2016 uh september 11 comma abc very 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 possible right very much possible i am going to read a column either i am reading a column or i am manually passing the value i want to convert into date format the first value is fine no problem the second value is what so can you run it yeah obviously you cannot convert abc to date right so um you can do two things one thing is that you can filter them and then say that okay i don't want them another thing is that you can add a parameter here for good the name actually you can say errors error it is c o e r C E. So you can just add a small argument saying error is equal to cause. What will happen is that it will understand that you 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 want to convert the data. Wherever it can convert, it will convert. Wherever it cannot convert, it will say N A T. N A T means not any time. It's again like garbage value. so that will be useful right otherwise you even if you have a single value it will throw an error and say that i cannot convert sometimes it is useful because you read time stamps and it it is not able to understand or throw errors that times you can do even i forgot this very recently somebody asked so see, see sometimes this is it will not come on top of your head so in the last class somebody asked like how will you do it so then i i don't remember on my top of my head but i found it is very rare that you use it normally the formats will be uh, filtered before you get it but you can do it anyway so you can add this line in case if you want to convert it uh you can also say a pd to numeric okay so look at what we are doing here uh you have this a right what is a a is a string i can say what so i can say pd to numeric of a so what will happen a will become integer right so sometimes you can convert from uh, what string to integer and we we have also converted from string to date time format possible <coughs> and there are some more things oh i think i have written here so you can mention the format month date and all if you want so there is a uh, url i have given here https python3 library date time so you can just open this to understand more about the uh, you know date time functionalities that you want to use and also see when you are actually doing ml classes right there this will be again repeated so don't think that right now you will learn that is the only end of learning so if you are having a data where you have date definitely you will deal with it right so this is just like an introduction uh there is a very useful method called a describe <clears throat> df dot describe okay uh 
uh, what this does probably you can understand it will describe a data frame for example there is start date end date category start stop uh, how many are there you know count of them how many unique values are there what is the top value the frequency mean standard deviation minimum this is a median kind of 25th value 50th value 75 percentage value and the max so this will be useful uh, if you want to get a quick look at your data set what is the common column values wherever it is not applicable it will say nan values right so some of them there is no mean median and all it says nan other places it is actually going to display the result so the describe uh, method is very useful if you want to get a idea about your data and you can say include all or you can say include only the columns that you want there is also an info right info we will look at later <coughs> huh. uh, and another thing that people uh, usually want to do so right now we have this uber data right in the uber data we have a column called a start star start star is the starting point of all the uber trips right so i want to know how many values are there so you can say a value count so these are the locations so there are 201 trips starting from carry 148 unknown and 85 more is well <laughs> i don't know there is an islamabad in new york somewhere near to that but yeah there is one there is also Karachi, I think. I don't know why, but yeah. So, so this is very useful because you can know, right, how many unique values are there, the count of values. So, you can always do a value counts. And then you can do a head also if you want on that. So, it says the top five locations, you know, top five trip starting points, something like that. A very interesting thing. <coughs> Okay, so let us look at the common data manipulation tasks that you can do. So, uh, when you get a data in the form of a data frame, right, uh, some of the things that everybody want to do, one is selecting indexing the data. I want to select only one column, three columns, two columns, very common. Second is filtering the data, always possible. I want all the values greater than this, less than this, something like that. Then sorting the data for sure I want to sort it, uh, mutating conditionally adding the column. I have all the sales revenue, I want to add a new column, the total or the mean of the sales, something like that, group by summarize. So for example, the Uber trip data, I want to group by the start location and find out all the trips which are having more than 10 miles or something like that, this kind of analysis. So if you can get a basic idea about these five tasks, majority of your uh, what you say, uh, EDA is done, right? If you can do this much, that's all you want to do, right? What else? And of course, then another thing that might come inside this is functions. So for some of these tasks, you might want to write a function to to perform it. We will discuss that. But commonly, if you can understand these many aspects of it, that's more than enough. Now, when it comes to this selecting, so first thing we are going to do is selecting. There is a small thing you need to understand. There are two methods, one is called I log, second is just called log. So whenever you want to select the columns or rows from a data frame, either you can say I log or you can say log. This I log is actually deprecated. We have been using it, even uh, it is supported, I, I do not know what version you are running. In some of the pandas versions, if you run the I log, it will throw a warning saying that this is old, it is deprecated and all, right. I think in the future versions, they will remove it. Lock is what everybody uses. And the difference is very simple. I lock means this is accessing a row or a column using a number. Lock means by the name. Like, I uh, will show you a practical example, but basically I lock and lock are just, uh, so I can do this. So let us first look at the data frame. <clears throat> so, if I want to get some data, I can say I log, okay, and then I can say, let us say 0 to 
5 just an example okay and then I can say 0 to 4. So, can you tell me what happened here? So, when I say I log the first part is the row, the second part is the column. So, 0 to 5 means row number starting from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, it will not include 5. And 0 to 4 means what? Columns 0, 1, 2, 3. So, basically you want these 5 rows and these 4 columns. So, the first thing that you mention is the index that is a row. The second thing that you men mention is the column. That is how iLog works actually. Ah, from that you are slicing a part of the data. So, that is indexing, right? Also, you can do one more thing. If you want selective columns, you can do like this. I can say, I want only the 0th column and the 3rd column. Understood? Like this. 0 to 5, row, 0 column and 3rd column. 0 column means first column, 3rd column means this column. Right? Can you guys try this? Let me know if you are able to do it. Not able to do it. Okay, let me ask you one question. What will happen if I do only this? Will it work? Just a question. 0 to 4, I am just typing. Yes. What happens? Because the first argument you are passing is the row, right? And you are getting all the columns, but if you want the other way around, ulta, you have to say colon, comma, 0 to 4. What does that mean? This first column is what? All the rows. I want all the rows, look at here, 1, 2, 3, 4, no? all the rows. So, it just says etcetera, etcetera, does not display everything, right? I want all the rows, but only these columns. So, remember this, if you simply type anything, what will happen? Uh, these, these are 1, 2, right? Only this and uh, all the columns will be displayed. But if you want all the rows, but just the columns that you are interested, you can say this. Ah, selecting or in, so selecting certain columns that you want or rows that you want. That is what you are saying. Selecting or indexing means the index position that you are mentioning, 0 or 1 or whatever. Now, you want all the rows, but and all the columns, what does this mean? Hmm? All the rows, all the columns except the last column. Do you have the last column? What is the last column? Total. Total. Ah, total. You do not have that, right? Total is not there, right? In this? Purpose is not. Purpose is not. Ah, purpose, right? Uh, I think purpose, right. Now, one more thing, understood, because I have to do this, Raghu equal to this, okay, and df dot shape, Raghu dot shape. So, um, I said from the data frame select all the rows except the last column, fine. But that is not going to affect my original data frame. My original data frame still has 1156 rows and 7 columns. I am saving it as another data frame called Raghu and when I look at the shape of Raghu, it has only 6 columns. So, whenever you are selecting, the result has to be saved somewhere. Original data frame never gets, that is obvious, it is like a projection. So, you need to save it as. So, in SQL what you do, you will say what? Select this column, this column, this column as something, right? And if you want to persist it, of course, the original table will not change, right? You will save it as another table or something. Same thing. So, always, so this is the importance of shape. You can see what is happening in the row level, column level, right? Questions on iLock? But uh, yeah, I do not I don't think like iLock is very important because like I said, uh, it is sort of like deprecated. Why do you think it is not important? Because on data we are not, we are not concerned. Exactly. 
the column names if you have a column names who is going to remember the sixth and seventh position that's like weird right so so that is why lock actually came and mostly we prefer lock and lock is easy actually so label based indexing right so i can simply say something like this df dot lock and i can say colon comma i can say start star so what is happening hmm. or i can say uh, as a list right i can say i want more there is only one column i want all the starting and stopping locations right what is the what is the column stop star stop star right i don't remember stop star uh, what will happen if i remove this thing this colon doesn't work right because you are saying that rows and columns right so you say this and this now i think it will work just give me one moment one moment one moment no this work doesn't work here so uh, since this uh, label based indexing is very common like people are doing lock these days a lot and one of the other thing is that normally when you are uh, working with a csv file or an excel file you are mostly interested in the columns not in the rows the rows are there but you want to ca calculate the average of a column or summarize a column so these guys have become more liberal and now they are saying that you should not type hard code like loc then colon it's so if you simply say df of these columns you will get it can you see what i typed ideally what should you should type df dot loc then two column and all rows but no 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 just want to see two columns this is easy so this is sort of like a shortcut and and in the actual programs you will see like this they won't say lock and all because it is assumed that you want to look at a column right unless so unless you want to filter on the rows right now i don't want to filter on the rows i just want to see the columns i have an interesting question okay not question i want to show you something uh, so let's uh, go back to the original way of doing it D how do you do it df dot lock right then what you say all the rows and columns and you get the same thing right now pay close attention i am going to do something pay close attention df dot lock uh, i will say colon comma uh, let's say only start start uh, where is star star is missing okay star is there just pay close attention this is the output of two columns i'm going to run one column you find anything interesting header ah maybe header is gone that's okay yeah so this this doesn't look like nice right i mean so previously the uh, you know ah uh, this was if i comment this if i am running two this looks very nice in representation the other one doesn't look nice the reason is if you are giving only one column right if you are giving only one column remember that is a series this is a series you remember i told you uh, a data frame is made up of individual columns so it is printing it as a series how do you know you can actually assign it so i can say abc equal to this and if i check the type of abc 
what do you see <coughs> series it's a series right okay i understood so what do you mean right but probably in your data manipulation tasks you don't want a series i want only one column but give it as a data frame you know, i am not bothered about learning series and all then only one small thing you need to do i think it should work we just keep it here how many brackets two understood i'm just passing it as a list list so what will happen it will not consider it as a it will return as a data frame because these these are small things but may become very interesting because you are you are working on a very large data and you are doing some selection on a single column right and you read it you selected one column but the output is a series then if you write something on a series it may not work because all the functions that works on a data frame may not work on a series then you are wondering why it is not working i just wrote it so then you might want to pass it inside a single list so that this guy will be treated as a data frame now this abc will become a data frame so proper data frame now try this out if you want okay so uh, if, if you want time tell me i just keep on going to next going to next if you need some time to do this then tell me <laughs> all right and, and i don't think it is there in the notebook if i share it with you some of this i make up so it may not be there in the original file that i'm sharing to you now this one is a data frame previous one was a series now i just previously i was passing this just as start star now i added a this thing i passed it as a list then the result will be a data frame so what i'm saying is uh, how do i show this how do i show this yeah so what i'm saying is <coughs> normally if you want to select only one column so let me comment this okay normally if you want to select only one column you can just pass the column right so what am i doing here i am saying that df dot log i want all the rows and the column name is start star no problem right but if i run this what will happen is that it will create a series this is called a series and the only way to identify whether it is a series or not is by doing a type you can check the data type of this series is nothing but a single column a single column data type is called a series right but i can convert that into a data frame even though it is a single column i can have a single column imagine like an excel file with only one column possible right nobody is saying that you cannot have only one column in an excel file probably i want it like that then i need to pass this inside a list so look at what i'm adding here this start star what am i doing i'm adding this thing here see i am adding i'm passing this as a list right and now if i run this it will become a data frame so you need to do this if you need the return data in the form of a data frame ah pass it as so normally you will use that uh, square bracket if you have multiple columns even for a single column you must use it ideally then only the output will be a data frame otherwise it will be a series hmm. yeah so lock is uh, sorry i lock is the number you are mentioning lock is the name so here i am saying lock and start star if this was i lock i'll say 2 for third column Yeah, yeah. So I have to mention only the number. And I lock is not very common these days because you have a CSV file, and people don't want to just refer the number, right? You have the label. So label-based indexing is actually lock. Uh, that is what is common these days. Mostly we use lock. So why do we? Why don't we do an in-class assignment, right? So I have some interesting assignments. So the thing is like the ones which are easy to demonstrate, I do. the ones which are difficult i give a certain assignment right uh, <laughs> even i don't know the answer uh, 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 using curly brackets how is it different can we use not square brackets? right not square i'm supposing if we use curly or the three down brackets square right this one right 
Yeah, so this is like a list stamp passing. Uh, I understood this. Uh, what if we, we don't use uh, curly bracket or else? Uh, no, no, curly is dictionary. So, give a different output. So, yeah, it will not I accept it at all. So, the lock is a, a method which will take an argument as where is your rows and where is your column. Uh, I, I'm just trying to understand the difference between all bracket sizes. Ah, so, I am passing a list of elements, not a dictionary is key value pair. So, here I do not have a key or value, right? I just have column names. So, if I am passing only one column, I can just say one column, I do not have to use a bracket at all. If I am passing multiple columns, how do I say multiple? Inside a list like this. Okay, that is fine, I got the list. Ah. Uh, okay, what about uh, the round brackets? Sir? Round brackets, I do not think it is supported because if you look at this df.lock method, it says the input has to be a list. I do not think it supports, but let us try since you have asked. Uh, you are saying tuple, right? So, what if I pass it as a dictionary? Uh, dictionary anyway will not support because there is a key value there, right? So, just give me one moment, I will just try this. So, what you do? You pass it as a curly, right? Oh, okay, it supports. My bad, it supports. In fact, I have never tried it. Probably learning for what does that mean? And that is what is confusing. Ah, so, in the method, the input parameter can be either a list or a tuple. That is what it means actually. I mean, as per that. But it cannot be a dictionary, I know. Because if I am passing a dictionary, it has to be a key and a value. Yeah. But unlike, but unlike list, it is actually giving you a series of huh? But unlike passing a list, huh? when we pass the same start within a list, for example, huh? it was giving a series. data frame. Huh, this is giving now, me a series, right? Now this is a series. Is that like, difference uh, is there. As if uh, we passed it as a normal string. Normal string. Normal string. Yeah. That difference is there. That is what I am saying. So, I passed a tuple, but the data type is a series now. It is not a data frame. So, that is too much information. So, ideally you have to pass it as a list. The ideal condition is that you have to pass it as a list. If you have only one parameter, you pass it as it is, as a string. If you have more than one, you pass it as a list. No, but no, you if one you are passing it as a list, you can pass it as a tuple. Ah. So, if there is a single tuple uh, that… But it is treating it as a series, that is a problem. That is what I am saying. Ah. You can do, but you will not get it as a data frame, I am saying. You will get as a series of so putting a round bracket is making it a tuple. Ah, round bracket is tuple. So that's considering that this column itself. It is considering it as just like a string. It is not adding any value actually. If you are passing it as a tuple, because even if I remove the tuple, I am getting the same output. Correct. But what if I pass two elements? Let's try that, right? What if I am passing two elements here? Start star, comma. Uh, Let us say stop star. What is the column name? Huh. Now it is giving me a data frame because there are two columns. Two columns are, but if I am passing a single column as a tuple, it will not allow me to construct a data frame. Does this argument mean that now uh, the ABC, the list that you have, uh, or let us say the frame that you have, is awesome. uh, cannot be changed now? It is a tuple now. Ah, uh, no, data frames, no, 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 this is just the columns I have added here. Right? So, is ABC is equal to now and uh, the argument that you passed, uh -huh. considering those columns are tuples? No, 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 this means this tuple cannot be further modified, but I can add a column to data frame again, that is possible. These are the original, what you say, columns I have in the data frame. You cannot make changes to start and stop, but you can add another column in yes, ABC. Yes, yes. Okay. Because that is a property of the data frame, not what I am passing actually. A data frame by default allows me to add columns and remove columns also. If I want, I can say original data frame should not be changed or it should be changed. Both options are there. But I have seen, so uh, this is also new to me, but I have never seen anybody using people so far. I mean, to tell you the real answer, probably I can check why, you know, why somebody should not use a tuple. Uh, but I have never seen because if you are passing more than one values, ideally it is a list of values, not a tuple of values usually we use. List is the uh, mutable, uh, what you say, collection which allows multiple elements to pass. Oh, this one, this uh, what you say, so 
Ah, LOC. So LOC, uh, it is not a function actually. So that brackets will come when you are calling a method, right? This is not a method actually. LOC is a selection attribute. So when I am calling LOC, I just need to mention what are the index. It takes only two separate uh, positions. One is the row, one is the column. LOC is internally Yes. So it's not a function. If LOC was a function or a method, I'll see that brackets and options. That is not there. So whenever you see those brackets, that means it is a method actually. This is not a method. So why don't you do this uh, in class assignment? Let's see how many of you can do it. Can you see this assignment? I'll just show you. This one. Extract first five rows and columns. Start date and okay. Okay, I'll just explain this. You, I, I, I need a data frame where I have five rows and only these two columns. That's the assignment. So you can use iloc or lock. That's up to you. Okay. Use, you can use iloc or lock. That's up to you. One moment, okay. So uh, even some, some of the things are very, uh, uh, how do I say, new to me. See, I wrote the solution like this, right? This is correct, right? So now I got another solution where here you put a colon and then you do a dot head. That's what I did. Yeah. So see, it is up to you to decide. But normally that is not something we do. I know head will display the elements, top five elements, right? Uh, but head is normally like a limit statement in SQL. In SQL, you have what? A limit statement. So what is the purpose of a limit? You just want to see the data. Where will you use a limit? Ah, you have a 1 million rows. You just want to see top 20 rows. You use a limit. So I can actually do a dot head. You will get the output. But usually when you when somebody asks you, do a selection, Okay, what they ask is actually I want specific rows and columns. right? I can also write a dot head, I know. And, but ideally, this is how you should write it. And somebody was also asking, is there a performance difference? I didn't see any performance difference, even if you write ahead or do like this. But something like this should be ideally your answer, I'm saying. <laughs> well, you are, you, are, you are to decide. I mean, if you are uh, interested in doing a dot head, that's also fine. I have a question basically. For example, if I want to see the rows with not mentioning these index numbers, I want to see the start date from first January to 20th of January. Sorry, sorry, which one? Start I, I want that indexes should be, index should be on the start date. Instead of this index. No, no, this one we cannot change. This is actually system generated index, right? The 0 to 4 up to 100 is system generated, right? If I want to do any condition, I have to do the condition within the start date. I can say within the start date, I want to filter the data from this date to that date. So that will happen only here. I'll show you how to do that. But this index will not change. Now, what I can also do is that I can change this index. Because right now, this is a system generated index, 0 to 100. I don't want that. I can say instead of this, replace this index and have an index of either uh, date or any column I can add as an index. I will show you. I will show you. But you need to have a column which you can take it as an index. We will take an example. Because by indexing the data, it will be too fast. What I do? No, no, no. That is different. That is the SQL indexing. This has nothing to do with that. This is just index means is the position. 
So, we are talking that is talking about the SQL indexing that is totally different right because in that indexing what it does it calculates the mean, median and some statistical values of the columns and store it that is how the retrieval is faster. Here it is just the mentioning of the position. Okay. How do you do with the <coughs> I log if you want to use that? I, I log. Just the head? No. I log. Yeah. You want to do this in I log. So, how do you do it in I log? I because I don't know the column index. 0 and 5. 0 colon, ah, I log 1 difference will be 5, right? This one you cannot pass uh, start date and miles. You need to give the column number. What will be that? Okay, comma, you give 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5. What will be that? Can you tell me? 0, 0, 0, 0, 5. 5. 5. But no, if you, if uh, it doesn't work. No, it's last one. Rahu, from the uh, label for example, range filling, colon number, label names, which are like start date, miles. New line, new line. Is there a routine where we can actually get a index? 0 and 5, which we, are, which we are actually putting a manually. Zero, and five. Uh, 0 is the first. So, start no, no, no. is 0, miles is that 5. 0 and 5, we, we are actually looking into the Excel sheet or, 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 or the data frame. Uh. Then finding out, okay, this is like manually finding 0 and 5. Let's say we just are looking at start date. So, is there a routine? Uh, no, no, no. You want to know what will be the number of start date, right? No, I don't think you have to figure it out only based on the position. And that is why iLock indexing is not very popular. Because if I am giving you a data frame and I am asking you do an I lock on this column, only way is that, but you can say dot columns and get it. I can say dot columns, right? I mean, you do not have to look at the data frame. What is the name of the data frame? So, I can do a columns and I can see these are the columns. Now, I can say 0, 1, 2. I do not have to read the entire file to look into that. And then I need to say 0, 1. There is no other way to do it actually. Right. So, I think we can still do. Uh, it will be very long, but I think uh, if we give yeah. out DF columns, then uh, name itself. I think ah. then only also it can be done. <laughs> yeah. It is very good. Yeah. Correct. So Correct. Very good you can do that. Uh, okay. So, we just uh, did uh, selecting and I just want to uh, bring your attention to filtering, right? Uh, what do you mean by filtering? You can filter the data, right? Now, there is one small thing you need to understand. Filtering works very easily. For example, uh, one of the condition that I want to put is that I want to filter all the trips which are greater than 10 miles. So, there is a miles column and I need to filter. But before you run this, do not directly run this. Uh, uh, let us see what will happen if I do this only. So, I am just copying only one part of the code which says uh, in the data frame I have a miles column, I want uh, everything which is greater than 10. Uh, now, do not run this. Can you take a guess what will happen if I run this? So, the condition I am giving is that I want to look at the miles column in the data frame where I want all the miles which are greater than 10. If I run this, exactly. because this is how filtering works, that is what I want to know. First, you have to identify the condition. What is the condition you want to put? I want this column greater than this, that is a condition. Now, if you only run the condition, what will happen? The condition will be either satisfied or not satisfied. You will get true or false, basically. But I do not want this, right? I do not want this. I want all the trips where more than 10 miles is required. That is where you need to add the condition like this. So, basically, what you do is instead of this, you will say I want to create another data frame where I am using the lock and I am saying that I want all the miles greater than 10 comma miles star. And if I do a df2, well another thing is that why are you doing this the last mile star? Ah, then only it will display the column. If you simply add the filter condition, it is not going to display the columns. Then you mention, so do you want one more column? You add it, right? I also want what? Start. Start, right? If I want all the columns. Start, date, start. You can run the first statement also by just starting scale practice and over here. Uh, sorry, I didn't get the first statement. Yeah, just add another df and square brackets around it. Like df miles? Yeah. 
no start with DF, then the entire thing, this entire statement in square brackets. DF of you can, you can. So this one, you're, this entire statement you're saying, right? No, no, uh, I mean without the log. Okay, without the log, only this. Only uh, this. No, no, no. So DF the first statement uh, that you uh, run, so DF minus greater than 10, the condition. This one. Yeah, and so add the DF in the start. Yeah, and then the rest of the in uh, square brackets. Oh, give me one more. Give me one more. Yeah, it will give only two calls and another data. It should give uh, the entire data set. No, 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 it won't. What happened? But now what is happening, yeah, so that is correct, right, uh, but you get all the columns, right, you are getting, so you are simply saying that in the DF, I just want to apply, yeah, that is absolutely possible, so you are just filtering that, uh, but what will happen to your original data frame, do you think, because the conditions that you are adding, right, it is sort of like you are filtering it based on that, right, so, the, so uh, yeah, so this is one way to say that, but here you are saying that I want all the columns. So, here the only difference is that, so I told you, right, you, it is not mandatory, you should use lock. Lock you can remove. So, I can simply say df of this thing and then I can say I want only specific columns, that is also possible. Yeah, so here the only difference, I want only two columns, here all the columns will come. So, one is, you know that dot lock from the line, I see an error, I am not sure why that is an error. Here, yes. 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 Okay, I know why the error is coming. Where, where? No, actually the error is coming because the value it is taking as a DF in a true or false, right? But here actually we are taking the two columns to point it out. Yes. So basically yes. the input yes. would be as a series not as a data frame. Okay, so what will happen? Yeah, this will give, uh, this will change the DF to yes. Yes. Understood. So you cannot pass that, right? That will be uh, immutable. So you cannot say that I want to put this true or for condition and then pass two columns, that does not work, right? So that is not a syntax error. So, whenever you are doing filtering, what you need to do is that either you apply that to all columns or if you are picking selected columns, say say I log or you remove it and then you say apply that only on the certain yes. Now, previously what he was doing, I mean what he was asking is that why it was throwing an error. So, after this it was, I was adding two more columns. So, that is not possible. If you are doing like this, you are applying a condition, this is like a true or false condition. So, this will apply to the whole data frame. So, now from this probably I can say I want to select only certain columns. I have a df2 now. From the df2 I can say I want to project only two columns. In this statement I cannot say that colon I want to add only, only two columns I want to apply this. This has to be applied to the whole. It is saying series object immutable. It is treating it as a series. So, this condition it is treating as at a series. We ran it, right? Let me show you. So, what was the condition we added? Yeah, you can have an and and or. I will come back to your question in a moment, okay? You can put an and and or. I will show you examples, okay? So, but basically what we were doing, I forgot. <laughs> so, what we were doing, uh, we were saying what? df dot i log sorry, df dot lock, right, then what was the condition, df of miles greater than 10, then what was it, what was we add, uh, what is that we were, 
So I put it in there. Six star, eight star, comma, miles, star. Right. So this is a simple uh, filtering that you can do. Okay, sorry. Let me just do a df2 dot head just to remove this. Right. Um, now, uh, so this is somebody who was asking. You can also directly uh, uh, apply that. So here I am doing a df dot miles greater than ten dot head. So basically, if you want all the columns, then you don't want to say select specific columns. You will get them. Right. Now, uh -huh. one more thing which is interesting is that what if you want to find out all rights to or from carry, right? It is not to carry. From let us say New York, right? So, in that case, what will you do? You will say the column name equals to what you can do? New York, right? and then do this all right so so here you have a string column start star is a string column and you can do a equal and one of the things that we commonly see here is this is in operator this is very common what is this is in operator so you want to match multiple conditions for example uh, i want to select the start location find out all the rights that is uh, you know starting from carry and morse fill. So, if you want to you know look for multiple locations, you can do this or let us say you want carry and New York. Is all right, mm -hmm. yeah, if it is having either carry or New York, it is going to give you the answer. So, and if I do a let us save it as something. So, let us call it as my rights or something. And if I do a my rights so here you have matching with carry and new york and in the sense either if it is carry or new york it is going to get it so this is in operator is important and i don't want to actually get into the discussion but there is something called uh, regular expressions also you know that right so you can always write a, a regex so string operations whenever you do you write a regex to exactly match or select starting with this letter ending with this letter these things uh, Raghu if you could uh, go back to the place where you are creating df2 hey, this one also has that this new yeah structure. so uh, ah, when one. we are filtering the row numbers do not seem to be updated oh yeah so um, yeah 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 so I wanted to clarify that I think somebody asked during the break so this is very important for example let me show you something so what did you do you did a filter right and you have my rights. Now, if I do a my rights dot I lock, I am doing a my rights of I lock, right? And I am saying that 0 to 5, okay, comma star. What does this mean? I want the, ah, this will work, right? But if I do a lock, okay, I will get nothing. Why? Yeah, this is very, very important because see you are doing a filter, right? Oh, sorry. You are doing a filter, right? After the filter condition, you are picking all the rights from carry and New York and first six rights are not there. It is starting from seven probably, I do not know, seven, eight and ten, twenty-two. So, when you say LOC, it is the uh, name based indexing. So, column names and row names, not row proposition. So, when I say zero to five, nothing will come. I have to say 7, 8 and 10, then only I will get it. That is also a confusing thing because if you are using LOC, this is the name of the row, not the position. Is there any way we can refresh it? Yes, I will show you. Uh, there is one example. So, normally in these cases what we do, there is a technique called reset index. So, I stored this as my rights, right? 
Now the problem is that in my rights, the index is what? 7, 8. I can say there is an option called reset index. Okay. So if I do a reset index, this will start with 0, 1, 2, 3. But I have some more things, I will just show you how to do that. But that is one thing we commonly do. That comment is wrong. Find out all rights from it should be. Oh yeah, yeah, from <laughs> not to. Yeah, change it. I think I also changed somewhere by mistake. Yeah, so this is all rights from carry and New York, right? Um, GF dot, no. If you do DF dot. No, DF should work, right? Because DF is my original data frame. So if I do df, what is df? That will have original, that is never going to change. But I am saying if I do my rights, my rights, that index is different because it is filtering only those columns. Oh, here you are saying you want to use uh, dot right? You can do that also if you want. This is the easy way of doing actually. I, ideally, you should say dot lock and then select a column. But pandas actually allows you to directly access the column. That is also possible. There is no difference actually because originally, so how it happened was that originally when data frames came into picture, we had only I lock. There was no lock actually. But then it was really problem because the column indexing is very difficult. Then they introduced this lock. And when they introduced this lock, they said that, okay, since to differentiate them, you say lock and I lock. But if you are very comfortable, you can just say column name, it will work. Uh, in this case, because first of all, you are mentioning the column name, right? If it is I lock, it has to be the numbers and then it should work, right? Uh, so I will just uh, remove this. Uh, so what I will do in the interest of time, I will just, how do you clear this? I am not able to clear, clear the output. Okay. So why do not you do something? I will give you an in-class assignment. So just like all the assignments, uh, find all the trips with distance greater than 10 miles and originating from Carrie and Morris. So, so what is the condition? It is a filter. Okay. You want to find all the trips with distance more than 10 miles and originating from Carrie and Morris. So what is the challenge that you are going to have? You are applying two filter condition. How do you apply two filter condition? And put a and it will be two filter condition. And when you are putting an and what you should do? You should put a bracket. So bracket and bracket. Just, just give it a try. I mean, I will just give it as a, a try, if it is working fine, but otherwise, there is a documentation which we have, like when to use what, but, uh, but usually, but this is very common, right? If, even in other programming languages, when you have an AND or OR, you put them in a bracket, right? In SQL, you do, right? No, here AND is AND. Or is pipe character. I think in some other places also we see and and pipe, right? In SQL, what you say and A and D. Or is OR, right? Here it is ambassador and then pipe character. I mean, or, or character. Or condition. You can't use OR and then. No, you have to use uh, this thing and OR. Let me try. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'll just try. That is what. So uh, try this. This may take a time. So I will give you the rough idea for the answer, right? So you will have LOC for sure, lock and you will first have a square bracket, right? And in the square bracket, you will have a circular bracket. Here you will say what the first filter, miles filter, you will come here and you will say and in the second bracket, you will have this is in, is in, carry and New York, ah, whatever, right? Even I do not, I just have to try, <laughs> I mean the answer, right? I should see if it is coming. So give me one moment, I will just try the answer. So somebody who got an answer, I mean then, oh, very good, so, <laughs> great. So a lot of people actually got answer, that is good. So that means my question is correct, <laughs> at least. 
I thought I was the only one who will get some answer. And so, so or there is two pipes here, or, or conditions. Or pipe. A single pipe or two pipes? One pipe. Uh, that's what I think. Can you add the pipe and say? Ah, no, here it is and Amberson for condition, only in filtering conditions. So, Panda supports normal Python, you have and. Uh, here, uh, or will be pipe. Ah, for filtering, for adding additions. Oh, I think. Okay, uh, one more small thing. Uh, see, one small thing I want to tell you is that this bracket and this bracket are different. Do you understand, right? This bracket and this bracket is different. Why? Ah, one is a method you are calling. The other is just implementing two AND condition. So, so it is not like wherever it does not work you add a bracket. Okay. Okay. Shallow, come on one more bracket. Maybe it will understand this time. Oh, it is working. Ah, but this is for readability as well like you are saying that this is one. But this is different I am saying like this is easiness actually a function. Okay, somebody was asking a very interesting question and I wanted to answer the question, right. Uh, can you guys have a look at uh, what I am going to type, oh, why there is only 4, there is only 4 actually, why I am getting only 4, what did you, what was the question, oh what is the spelling, M or this one is A R Y M O R I R. What is this? Ah, this will work, right? Uh, now I have a very interesting thing I want to show you. So I created something called DF3. Now a lot of you were asking that, hey, there is a problem because if I look at df3, the index is starting with 28. So, you can do a reset, you are resetting the index of a data frame, uh, but couple of problems. What are the problems you identify? Ah, so, when you, when you do a reset index, it will add an index column, but this column will remain, right. Also, one more thing, very interesting, look at df3. It will not change the original data frame. Are you getting what I am saying? So, I did a reset index, ok. So, what happened? There is an index column added. I am happy. But problems 1, the existing column is there. Second problem, my original data frame does not change. So, let us solve the problems one by one, ok. First problem I am going to solve is that I want everything in the original data frame. So, you can say, so, this, this argument is very important in place equal to true. What it means is that change the original data, right. So, I am saying that reset the index on df3 and I want that to be on df3. So, if I run df3, what happens? Now, the df3 is changed, right. Original data frame is changed. So, by default, it is in place false, meaning it will not change. Now, what is your problem? Original is changed now. I want to change it, right? Because this is my filtered output. Yeah. In the filtered output, I want indexes from 0, right? I do not want this. I do not want this. I want this. So, that is why I am saying in place equal to true. Reset it. Now, now the problem is this is anyway there. I want to remove this. Uh, this is my no, old index. index. Then I am not passing uh, any uh, that parent. Then it is false. Why do you call it yeah. is false? It is not CSV dot. It will not work. So, what I am saying, so guys pay attention, no? So, I mean uh, this is a bit confusing. If I say simply reset index, right, what will happen? It will reset the index, but the original data frame will be unaffected. So, what you can do? I can save it as another one, right? Are you able to understand what I am saying? Hmm? Are you able to understand? 
right but i don't want this because i wrote a filter the output of the filter condition is df3 i want df3 to be my final answer i don't want to create another df actually so what i can do is that here itself i can say what in place equal to true oh sorry uh, sorry guys i can say df3 i want to reset the index in place equal to true means my original data frame reset will be index set reset but again my problem is that this 2834 remain so i can say <coughs> drop equal to true that is your final answer it will drop that previous index yeah so this indexing will be very <laughs> confusing so i will probably draw that cc right rather than talking about this so what i did i had a data frame right i have a data frame hmm let's say only three column what is the index default like this right hmm and let's say here you have a column called name and you have a column called age okay so here you have some guys a b c d e f hmm age is 1 2 3 4 5 6 i wrote a filter where i said i want age greater than 4 so this data frame is called uh, df this is df what is the index of df 0 to 5 i wrote a filter age i want age i want to apply the filter age greater than 4 right and this filter will be created as another data frame right df1 because i am saving as another data frame so if i visualize df1 what will happen how many rows will be there ah so it will have four is this clear so far right so now forget this forget because we are doing filtering now this is my data now my problem is i want to access rows and columns and everything but my index is starting from 4 i don't want this i want to reset right so that is where you say in df1 i will say df1 okay dot reset index the problem is if i run this command it will reset the index but the original data frame will not be affected then what is the use right i want df1 to be my final output but if i say reset index it will not change anything here that is where you are saying in place equal to true this means this means change the original data frame so it will just remove from here this will become zero this will become one but the problem is now it will add one more column for your 4 and 5 you had 4 and 5 here right it will come as one more so this is old index this is new index so to remove that you can also say drop equal to true meaning drop equal to true means it will drop this column this will be a final data frame well it's a bit i mean complicated to understand but that is what is happening you are resetting the index and removing the old index that's what you are doing all right so you will see these things when you work sometimes and sometimes the requirement will be totally different because i don't want to touch the original data frame then it is fine i save it as another data frame and work on my things right df will anyway remain as it is because after filter this is my new da data frame filter will not affect here this will remain there Yeah, there can be many places. I mean, uh, so this is where I want to change. But in many cases, so a use case will be that I have a data frame which which is used for multiple purpose, not only one purpose. So I want to apply a filter or reset the index for my sub project or whatever I am doing. But maybe somebody else is also accessing the data. They don't want to shift the index probably. so i will keep it as it is so i will always say that either read it as a separate data frame then i can do my activities right that depends on the use case what we are working on i uh, in the 
you know point of time i'll just quickly show you some more things uh, all outputs clear so there is a sorting okay i don't want to spend a lot of time on sorting but basically uh, what you can do is that you can do a sort values by the column you can say ascending false and head so it's very simple right you are saying that the column is miles and ascending is false and then head and you can also sort by multiple column so what are you doing here you are sorting by star 10 miles can you take a guess how this will work if you want to sort by multiple column first it will pick up the start it will sort them in true true is ascending order a b c d with each it will do a mile sorting in descending order so i am basically looking at all the trips in the alphabetical order with the highest uh, length first right because this is descending right so sorting uh, we will see later i mean uh, as of now you just need to understand how to sort so you look you look at here if i do a head of 20 uh, so see it is starting with agnew uh, apex a right and within agnew it is again sorting 4.3 2.4 2.2 like this if you find give that ascending things and by default it will be all ascending by default, everything is ascending. You have to say a uh, fault for descending. Right? Uh, so that is one thing I want. And probably we will look at one more thing, then we will finish. Okay, in the uh, you know time <laughs> that we have, right? I will uh, I will look at one more thing because uh, see this is very important. Conditionally adding columns. So you want to add a column. Now adding a column will make sense if you are doing some analytics, right? For example, uh, like I said, uh, I want to find out all the trips, I want to apply a condition. So there are trips and I want to categorize all the trips less than 5 miles as short trip, 5 to 10 medium trip, anything more than 10 is long trip. Then that I have to add as a column. Now, for adding a column, you can use any technique that you want. You can use normal Python code for a condition. But here what I have done, I imported this library called NumPy. We will talk about this a little bit more. So you will say import NumPy as NP. And this is how you add a column. So you are saying that I want to add a column called milescat. Okay. There is a uh, very interesting function called NP.where. This is like a if else condition. What it does, it is saying that if miles is greater than 5, mark it as long trip, <coughs> else short trip. Now you may think that what if I have three conditions, I will show you how to do that, right? But right now we have only two conditions. So I am saying that look at the miles column, if it is greater than 5, it is a long trip. If it is not, it is a short trip, that is all I am giving, right? And, and if I run this, I will show you what is going to happen. So I will just run this, probably do a head of 30, can you see? Now there is a new column, right, called long trip. So that is a miles category column. So each it will uh, apply this condition and gonna say long trip or short trip or whatever. So if you are having a quick if else thing, this np dot where is very useful. Now what if I have three conditions? So I want to categorize to short, medium, and long. You can do one more np where. I will show you how to do that. You can sort of like an and it and say that, you know, and it or or it and say that this condition does not match this condition and this condition. So multiple conditions are possible. Now I do not remember exactly, but I think we can do this also. Uh, let us say, but this is not really a, a good thing to do. So let us say I want to add a column. Let us call it as my year. I can say np dot array. I mean, this numpy has a lot of built in methods. So, there is something called a numpy array. So, right now, what I did, I just added only 2000. So, what will happen everywhere, it will get added as 2000. But if you are statically adding, then you need to pass every year because this has how many columns? Uh, 1000 columns. So, I need to pass 1000 values here if uniquely I need to add in the np array. Right now, if you give only one value, it is just going to just add it everything. I mean, this is not useful if you are adding an year, but some common thing if you are adding, you can just say array 
push one number, it will populate that column. So, now we have an extra column actually. You can also drop a column, we will see. This is adding a column, you can also drop a column. We will discuss n pi, ok. So, that should give an error, let us see. 2000 comma, let us say 2010, right? Yeah, that, uh, see uh, that is what I am saying. So, if you are passing only 1, it will just replicate it. Anything more than 1, that equal number of rows you need to mention. Yeah. Or you need to write a code saying that read the rows and then apply. So, that will be more complicated. Uh, but we will discuss NPRAs. So, NPRAs actual use case is not this. This is I am just showing an example. NPRAs, uh, NumPy arrays are used for a matrix manipulation and all. We will see that tomorrow. Okay. So, uh, to add any column, no, 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 no. This is one condition where I am using np dot where because or I can also write a normal function. So, there is also I can write a function, normal python function and then pass and get the output. Can't achieve this function if that else thing in a pandas? Which one? This, uh, why we use np here instead of pd? No, so this where is inside np only. In pandas, you do not have a where condition actually. So, this numpy library only has this where method. Pandas does not support a where method condition, right. Or other ways of adding column is that you can normally say, you can have a filter and say that the output I need to pass it as a column, okay. So, I say filter then something. That is also possible. I just thought of showing you this np dot where method because that is very common. Because most of the filtering you want to do an if else kind of condition, right. If some condition is less or more, you want to. And there is also one more method I will show probably tomorrow. It is called apply. There is something called apply. Apply is a, a function in a data frame where what it can do, it can take whatever logic you are written and apply to a set of columns and then manipulate it. So, uh, I will show you a couple of examples of apply anyway. But I think we are good at like basically reading a file into a data frame and at least basic selection indexing, filtering. Then what did we cover? We covered sorting, selection, filtering, uh, date format, also basics of how indexing works, right? How to reset it, how to save as a data frame. Well, uh, then when you actually work more methods will come, right? Now, let me also see what we need to cover because you have to go to NumPy also, ok. Um, yeah, since you have asked. <laughs> so, what if we want to do this, right, in class assignment? Create a new column with the following condition. I will give you a clue. I hmm? will give you a clue, but think if you can figure it out, how to do this, right. I will write a clue for this. So, the clue is very simple. You will use two np dot where conditions. In the first np dot where, you will say if the distance is something, uh, you will mark it as long trip, else what will happen? Else the next np condition will come, right. First np dot where will say if the distance is more than 10, it is long trip, ok. Else the next np condition where it is medium and short, are you getting? That is. Uh, two, two np dot where you need to use, that is what first np dot where will say long trip is more than 50, else second np, in that you will say medium and short, yeah, yeah nesting sort of even I want to write, but, but I will give you some time, let us see if you are able to do something, right. So, are you still afraid of python like, <laughs> so you are very much afraid of python, right. It is manageable, I think. It is not like too difficult to understand. Uh, practice requires. Okay, I also wanted to tell you this. Where is the marker? Can you search for uh, this book? There is a very good book, in, in fact, an excellent book. Uh, it is called what? Python for Data Science. Data Science by Wes McKinney. I am not sure about the spelling. I think it is Python for data, name is Python for data science. 
I think it's Wes McKinney. Is there a book like that? Do you find a book like that in Google or somewhere? Sorry, sorry, Python for data analysis, not dot data science, data analysis, right? Python for data analysis by Wes McKinney. So, that is a very good book. And if you really did not like uh, data frames and pandas at all, right, and if you have anything against me, you talk to this guy, he is the person who invented data frames and pandas. Best McKinney. Sir, I think in this case uh, it will return all the, I mean multiple uh, tuples wherein if the trip length is more than 5, it will consider that as well as the, you know, um, as the medium trip. No, but I the fact is that uh, we can, we should be writing less than 5 short trip and then, you know, uh, uh, writing the. Now first what will happen, it will check if it is more than 10, that is a long trip, right? Anything less than 10, what will happen? Then it will next, condition. next condition will come. Okay. So, if it is 8, what will happen? Medium. If it is 8, it will fall to medium because 8 is more than 5, right? It will not go to short, right? Will it? I do not know. No, I do not think so, right? That was your question, right? I, I, <laughs> I do not think it will. <laughs> no, right? It is fine, right? Okay. I do not know, I just wrote. You guys also check your output is correct then uh, I mean comparing with me. Do not believe me whatever I am writing. So, Wes McKinney is the person who created uh, data frames and pandas actually and this book is very good if you are looking for some reference to read actually and uh, very good book. So, you can probably get a e-copy or something and uh, somebody was asking how to learn Python, right uh, and I gave couple of things. First thing is that you have about 2 months time because tomorrow your statistics will start, next month is also statistics, then only your ML will start. So, this is Feb, right? March, April only I think ML will start if I am not wrong. I do not know whether ML will start along with statistics, then next month. Still you have 1 month time, right? I think that should be more than enough. I will also be sharing some practice and assignments. There is a notebook called basics of Python where it talks about what is a list, what is a dictionary in more details, I will share that. Then some assignments and solutions for pandas and data um, numpy. So, tomorrow what is the plan? I will spend one hour on uh, data frames, some more concepts needs to be finished. So, we will roughly spend an hour on data frame. Then uh, one hour I will spend on uh, numpy. Numpy the problem is I do not have data like this. See uh, data frames are easy because you get some Uber data. But when you are teaching NumPy, we do not have any data. So, like ones and zeros or five, something I have to create. The real data I do not have. So, that part you may find it a bit uh, difficult to digest. You have to statically create the data, right? Because the real applications are different. But you need to spend some time on NumPy. So, probably an hour we will spend on NumPy. Uh, and then we will spend some time on visualization. Uh, Seaborn and Matplotlib. Visualizations even if you can understand 4 or 5 types that is enough. There are a lot of in depth visualizations, but even if you understand the basic 4 or 5 types that is enough for you. And then if I get time after that, probably you will get, I will show you some data extraction methods if possible, like collecting the data from an API. So, so far in the um, activities, you know, we have done selection, then filtering, adding a column and then sorting. This is all we have done. And now two more things uh, which are important uh, in case of data frames. One is called uh, uh, an operation called grouping, grouping the data. This is sort of like something that everybody want to do, group and then apply something. And after grouping, there is something called an apply uh, method in data frames. I will talk about what is this. So, this grouping and this apply, these two things are actually what is pending, right. Um, and what is the idea of grouping, right? 
So normally when you say grouping in the statistical terms, this is called SAC, which stands for split, apply and combine, split, apply, combine. So even though it's a group operation, we technically call it as a split apply combine operation. That's what we call. Why are you calling it as split apply combine? Because when you want to group something, right? So you remember the Uber data, right? So we have the Uber data. So one common situation is that I want to group all the rights based on the start city. So multiple rights are there, right? So my intention is I want to group it based on the starting city. So you just don't want to group it, right? So my splitting column will be, you know, the starting city, start location, group. And then probably from each grouping location, each starting city, I want to calculate the average distance traveled. So let's say there is New York. There are 20 trips from New York, right? I want to know what is the average length of a trip, right? So then your uh, apply column will be again the miles column. And the apply function is going to be mean. So basically you are saying that group by the start column, right? And then take the miles column for each start location, say New York. So miles column will have, let's say 10 trips, 10 different distances for New York then apply this mean function on them. So three activities you do, that's what I'm saying. When you say group the data, first you take a column where you want to group it and then you find a, so, so that is why it is called split apply combine. Then you take the next column where you want to apply some function. In this case, I'm interested in the average distance traveled. So I'll say mean or I can also say what is the maximum distance traveled. So I can say max or, or any function that I want. Or I can write my own function and apply there also. That is also possible. But, but this is the general logic that you actually do for grouping. And we can actually see this. Now, if you are running this notebook today, so the same notebook we are using yesterday, yesterday, right? What do you need to do? Since this is a fresh day, you need to import the libraries again. Otherwise, it will not work. So you can just scroll up, right? And you need to first import pandas as pd and read this Uber data and do a head. So do this, once you import it, do a df.head and you can see the data. Then you can scroll down because these things we were covered. And if I scroll down again, sorting, columns, group by. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to insert a cell above. Okay. And how do you do this is same thing, df dot. So I'm going to group the data. So the uh, function is called group by. Hmm? And I want to group by the start location. Okay. So it will start it. And then what is a column where I want to calculate something? That's a miles column. So I'll say miles star. And then there is an aggregation function. So I will say AGG. That's my aggregation function. And then mean. So this is the general way of writing a grouping. You will first say group by, then you pass say one column. You can also pass more than one column. So right now I'm saying that I want to group by start. So it will pick up all the start. See, Agnew, what is that? Apex, Arabi, something, okay, Austin. So that is a start column. For each start, I want to calculate the average of miles. So you say miles dot AGG and then you say mean. So this is called the aggregation function, this AGG. There you can say what function you want to call, what is aggregation logic you want. And by default, I think depending on the pandas version, but it supports mean, median, uh, min, max and certain other mathematical operations. And if you want more, you can also use numpy along with this. But as of now, just for a simple calculation, this is how you find it out. Now, what is also interesting about this method, now it depends on the pandas version. If you can find this, right? Mm. 
you can also do this look at here so this is a bit confusing so normally when you are doing an agg aggregation you are saying that i want to calculate the mean right but in simple terms probably i can also do this i am guessing yes so since mean is a very common uh, operation right average is a very common operation you don't have to explicitly say aggregate and then do an average if you just simply say mean it will do a mean right but but the common format is you say agg and then you say mean within that that's a common format but sometimes if you simply say mean also it will work um for this so what it does is very simple it takes one location this is agni or whatever so if this has 10 trips mean is the average right what is mean total it will add it and divide by the total number that is mean ha ah, it will pick up the location first agnu so you are saying that group by start location so first agnu let's say agnu has 10 trips right uh, and then it will pick up this column miles so all those 10 trips will have uh, kilometers and miles right so 10 different kilometers it will add all those 10 divided by 10 that's the mean value now um, i have a question for you to guess you can try but don't try <laughs> you can try and give me the answer but don't try take a guess okay what will happen if i do this i just have a small question if i remove this miles column right i'm just saying group by start just mean do you think it will work should not ideally right but it works actually right i mean so this is again so these are some of the shortcuts that are there hmm so this is so what is happening here is that you are saying that i want to group by start location so i'll pick up start then you are saying that i just want the mean mean of what well ha there is only one integer column so it calculates the mean but if you have multiple it may throw an error saying that or it will do both in some occasions because it doesn't know so for quick analysis what we do is that if you are having the data where there is only one integer column everything else is string it understands that you cannot have a mean on strings you say mean it is you are probably thinking about miles column okay i'll give you the uh, miles column output so some if you see this you have to understand that the real query is not like this the real query will be in miles dot agg mean that is short you uh, sort of like a shorthand notation you can say to represent so sometimes for quick uh, you know code we write like this just take the df and show me the mean so it doesn't really care <laughs> where is the mean so you can just say group by start and mean very easily you will get same same output you will get you are interested in something like this for example let's take uh, start and stop and okay so we have start and stop right so there is a start column and there is a stop column now i want to do group by both columns i want that is also possible right i want to do a group by on start and group by on stop okay probably here i want to calculate something like a mean or something like that and here i don't want a mean i want to probably calculate the min or max or something right so the common situation is like you have the writes data and i want to group the data based on the start location so for each start location i am interested in the mean distance traveled okay and then i also want to group it based on the stop location where he was going and i want to know based on the stop location which what was the longest so if you say max that is typically like the longest or min can be the shortest trip so if you want to combine them that is also possible so how do you write it is it's actually very simple because again you will have your group by column but now what you will do is that instead of passing one column what do you need now you need two columns right so how do you pass two columns yeah within what within a list right so you will say start star then what i want stop star is a stop star 
yeah um, or let's do something interesting probably you want to group between start and stop okay and then you want to calculate let's say the mean and sum probably let's say that is the idea so what i will do i will say dot agg so agg is my aggregation grouping columns are start and stop agg is my aggregation column what do you want to do you want to calculate the mean and sum so again two values are there so how do you pass two values you can say in a list uh, and you can put them as strings you can say mean and then you can say sum right and probably i can do a dot head right just to see okay this is something very uh, interesting i will talk about this a bit more later uh, like how do you read this data right but i'll just talk about oh by the way there was an assignment let me just check so can you uh, make some sense from this output what are we getting i i saw i saw i showed you the query i wrote i showed you the output also what do you infer from this what does this mean if if your customer is asking what is this what will you explain So how the grouping is working here? That's my question. First, it will pick up start. Okay, then so let's say agnew. Then what will happen? Yeah. So for agnew, then you have stop locations, right? From agnew, you again have stop locations to where you have traveled. right then it is calculating the mean and then the sum for each right ha huh. but but this looks weird right because the columns are weird right if you look at the columns do you find it weird yeah it is weird because this is a nested column i'll just come back to this in a moment i'll show you if you do a dot columns you can see that uh, these column headers will be nest nested So, if you are presenting this in a nice format or something, if somebody looks at it, they are like, "Okay, so what is? What do you mean by this? You know, so it's miles, then mean, then stop. What do you mean, right? So, you need to just uh, uh, reshape the columns. I'll show you how to do that. But basically, what are you doing? You are grouping by starting and stopping, and for each, you are calculating what the mean you have and then the sum you have. Hello, um, where have you mentioned the miles in the statement? Where? Uh, in the statement that you prepared. Oh, I have not. so it is automatically taking miles i mean since we have only one column it will pick it as i can also add a miles manually it will read it yes. that is why so previously we looked at it right so if you look at here this command uh, where is it where did i write oh i deleted it right yeah so if you are having only one column by default if you calculate a mean or something it will by default pick up that column But if you are having more than one, you have to say miles. And then do that. Okay, I'm sorry if you wanted to put it down. So, oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but yeah, that's correct. So ideally, when you write the code, you have to mention that your column is miles, right? Yeah. So then you have to say which column you want. So if you have more than one column, then it will not automatically do. So it depends on different pandas version. So in one of the pandas versions, what it does is that it will it will do that for both. So if you have like four integer columns and two float columns, for all six columns it will calculate. There is also not something you don't want. You want only specific column. So you have to say group by then the whatever columns you want. Then in square list you have to say this column I want, right? But anyway, if you have understood this, I have an in-class assignment for you, right? Look at here. Can you? Okay, so this is again same thing, right? You are grouping by start, miles, then mean and head. This is already we have done, right? This is same thing we have done, and you can also do like this for each start location, find the mean and the total distance traveled. For example, like this. So this is slightly only start location we have. In my example, I calculated start and stop. this example here you have only start location how to label this i'll i'll show you so right now the labeling is bit weird because if you look at here you know i actually have only four columns the first two columns are fine but you know again here you have sort of like an indexed columns 
Now we can actually do one thing. If you assign this to a variable, uh, now if I am assigning this to Raghu and if I do a Raghu dot columns, hmm, what, what it says multi index levels and then labels. So basically what is happening is that it is nesting. It is actually nesting your data. I will show you how to uh, uh, you know remove it and add proper column headers. But right now can you try this in class assignment? Find the most recent and the earliest travel date and mean distance travel for each star city. So like in every class the assignment is more complicated than my explanation usually right. But before you try this let us try to understand the problem right. So what do you want to find? The most recent and the earliest travel date and mean distance travel for each start city. So let us break this down. What will be the grouping column first? Hmm. So you have to say group by start correct and then so this is first level. Then once you group it you want to apply some logic whatever it is that is on where what is your uh, uh, you know uh, aggregation columns that you are talking about? No, no dot agg is uh, so that is where you apply the function not that on which columns you want to apply the function. Find the most recent and earliest traveled what? So you have two columns one will be date one will be miles. So the grouping will be start right then the aggregation columns two will be there one will be date one will be miles hmm? and then the function on miles what you want to apply? I do not know what you are uh, each mean distance. So here your AGG will be what? Aggregation function will be mean correct? On date what it will be? Minimum. Ah, so we want to find out the earliest what is that? Earliest and most uh, recent. So we can say min and max. If you have a date you can calculate the min and max. Min date will be what? The first ride. Max date will be what? The last ride, recent ride. So here you can to say aggregate, you will have min and max. So this is how you break down the problem. First you want to find out what you want to group. So that is for sure start. I want to from each city I want to find something, right? Find uh, on what column, right? So on date column and miles column. Right? On the miles column I want to apply mean, on the date column this but but do not try this, do not try this there is a trick. Uh, this may not work if you write in any ways, why? I mean the logic is correct but you need to do one small thing. No, no, I am not talking about this method there is one small problem because if you are if you want to work on date this is this date is string. So what do you do? So how do you so you will say pd dot you know convert to date format right probably I will help you with that because one more problem is can you look at the last uh, row of our this one this one uh, as for the problem it should be the earliest one right so it should be the minimum right earliest and recent earliest and recent means the first trip and last trip right yeah that is what i meant i mean earliest and recent will be same or what no what is what do you mean by earliest trip first trip first trip what do you mean by recent trip last trip it will be min and max right I do not know maybe my English is bad. <laughs> yeah I want to find out the first trip and last trip that is the logic basically right. So, so do not do this the problem is you need to first convert the date to um, the, the date column to the date format because it will be string. How do you know? Because do one thing uh, do one thing create a new column 
and just do a what is df is our this thing right dot d types ah it's an object for sure start date is an object right now if you do a df dot tail mm now you have a so what do you understand from this no 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 uh, see the last row we don't want the last row is what something we don't want so from the data frame first you have to remove the last row okay so tell me how do you do it df equal to df dot so why don't you use i lock i want all the rows except one so the first task is that you are removing the last row so you will say df dot i lock uh colon minus 1 that means all the rows except the last one then again column because i want all the columns i don't i am not interested in the removing any column and assign that back to df because otherwise it will not affect and now if you do a tail you can see the last row is removed actually right now what you do convert that to df of uh start what is the column name date star right date star equal to pd dot to date time df of now you can think about the logic so now just see if you can build it i will also help you i mean i'm just giving you some time so probably if you can try it out you can see some error uh, eul while scanning Oh, uh, while writing the statement, right? Uh, for the statement, I can't. This one. Yeah. This one. I can't convert the column. This one should work, right? Uh, which one? The I lock one. So uh, the second one, uh, not able to convert. <coughs> Are you sure this is exactly how you typed it? Because yesterday we did it, right? Yeah. Yesterday we converted this column. Df. This is in list square brackets. Yeah. Equal to pd to date time. There is a bracket of df. Again a square bracket. is there anybody who is not able to do this date time thing why <laughs> we were all doing that yesterday right what error you are getting not the assignment i am just talking only about converting to this forget the assignment yeah so some of the problems might be you might be using a very recent version of pandas maybe so it might have you know sort of like removed uh, what uh the support for ilog ah uh, it's giving an error for the viewer the viewer which one minus 1 yes it was the viewer so this ilog if you don't want you can use lock also Sure. Here, what is your problem? Because group by column is fine. We are grouping by what is that start, right? Then uh, the condition columns are a bit tricky because you are saying that I want to apply min and max on date and then mean on miles. Then it should be different, right? Yeah. So then, how do you differentiate, right? 
So that is you need to use a dictionary there. So it is slightly tricky because previously I am saying only one. So if I have only one condition, I can simply say, say AGG call average, I will do it. But if I have multiple conditions, because I need to say for date, this key, I want to do these two operations because I want to multiple. And for you know miles, I want to do only mean. So if I try to write it, let me see if I can write it, then I will show you. So I'm gonna assign this to something like rest. So how do you start? Can you help me? DF dot help me. Uh, start date, right? Uh, start start. No no. What is that? No start date, right? Who said start date? You are confusing me. What is the column name? I don't know, I'm just asking. Huh. Then you will say what? Hmm? It should be start date, right? No, it's for every No, 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 no. It has to be start star. Start date is what? The date. I'm grouping by what? The location, right? You are grouping from where the trip is starting, right? Not from where the date is starting, right? <laughs> so it should be start star. Okay, I just looked at here. Start star. Hmm? And now, uh, what is the technique that you want to do? You want to pick a column and then apply the function, right? So I should be doing an aggregation, right? Okay, so what I will do? I will call an... Prabhu, but uh, hmm? that list has to be given here. Yes. So, normally when you write, you will say list of columns and then apply. But right now I cannot do it because I am having one column and two conditions, then another column and one condition. So, I need to represent the whole thing inside a dictionary. So, I am first saying that I want to do an AGG, okay, and I will open a dictionary. Now, let us let me see if it works actually because I have not tried. What are the columns we do for aggregation? Mm, no, no. Aggregation is a function, right? Sorry. Uh, you will open a dictionary and then you will say miles, right? So within this, I will have miles star. And what do you want to do on miles? So you can say what? Mean. I can either pass it like this or I can pass it as a list. Let me write it, okay? Then I will come back to you. And what is the second thing? Start date. Start date star, right? And here, what will be my values? What do you want to do? Min, comma, max, right? Um, you will write like this. You will say a group by, okay? So normally you will say group by some column. Okay, and then you will say I want to pick only one column. Okay, so let's say column two, and then you will say dot agg, and then you will say mean. This is normally how you write. Hmm? But here my problem is, first of all, I have multiple columns. So if I'm passing a column two and a column three, okay, how do I tell that for column two I need to have two things to be calculated? So I cannot write it like this. So that is where the dictionary comes into picture. So when you're writing a dictionary, how the uh, you know syntax will change, you will again say group by, this will remain the same. You will say I want to group by this column. You will not directly call the column. You will say I want to apply an aggregation function. So this is my aggregation function. And then you say what function on which column inside this. So inside your this thing, you will define a dictionary. This is key value pair. So here I'll say column one and what are the things I want to apply, column two, what I want to apply. So can you try this and see if you get the output? Yeah. Excuse me, Rupa. So why don't we just uh, learn this, the, the second format only? Uh, yeah. Even, even if it's similar. Let's say. Ah, but this is again a bit more lengthy code. If I have only one column, this is easy to write. So it's just the way of writing. So if I have like multiple conditions, this makes sense. But the first example will work, that minus three will work. Uh, 
Ah, it will work even a single element. Also, you see, I am passing a list here. I can pass a single column here. So here, I am saying mean is a list. I don't have to say list. I mean, why I am using it? Because I want to just maintain the same way that I am using here. So these are all some of the, what you say. And one thing which is very confusing is that even this is not something you can buy hard. Okay, in certain pandas versions, if you write something like this, it will start throwing errors saying that, you know, errors in the sense the syntax, there will be no error. But, you know, there is no generalized way to say that this is the only way to write it. Right, so common syntax is like this. But depending on the pandas versions, sometimes what happens is that it will say that, okay, uh, list or dictionary that you are passing here, uh, the, the proper format has to be there. So, what we normally do is that if you are having a single column, you will always follow this method. You will say group by and then the column and then you say aggregation. But if you are having multiple columns and multiple condition on the columns. So here the confusion is that for the start date, I need two uh, aggregation functions. That is where I cannot say start date of min and max. That is where I am defining it as a dictionary. Otherwise, in the aggregation you are saying but here inside this I have represented as a dictionary. So it has to be a key and value. So I cannot say miles dot mean here because this is a dictionary, right? Dictionary has to have a key and value. So it has to be a key. Why dictionary? Because the start date has two values. So if start date had only one value, I can say dot and it should work, right? For both. Then you don't even need a dictionary. You can directly use the previous method, right? What we were doing. That way, that way you can do. Well, these things will, uh, uh, so what we will do, I will give you some assignments on this further than this so that you can understand more about grouping. So this is just an example, but some more simple assignments on different columns and tomorrow you will have a practice session. So where you will have around 3-4 hours to spend only on these things again, right? So it's not over like after we finish today, the class is not over. You will still have some more time to brush up and some more assignments and all this. I just want to introduce that these kind of things are possible. Um, are you sure there is proper number of brackets and syntax and all? <laughs> because that might be one reason, right? Okay, yes, sure. So I'll just zoom this, okay? Give me one moment. So I have a question to you, okay? I have a question to you. Now, now, I have a question in the same example. In the same example, if I wanted uh, only the average miles and the recent trip, what will you do? I want only the average miles and the latest trip. Will you write it like this? Well, you can, but you don't have to, right? Are you getting the point? You can write like this, but you don't have to, right? Because if I'm having only the min or max, I can simply call the column and call it there itself, like we were doing previously, right? So this dictionary notation came since we had multiple things we are passing actually, okay? Now somebody was asking a, a very good question. This is fine, but if you look at the output, it's like weird, right? Because there is like all these cluttered columns here. So normally when you do a grouping, uh, nested columns will appear in your output. So right now my data frame is called RES and RES columns are like very weird. So what you need to do is, once you have done this, okay? Yeah, so here also if you look at the start date, it is unique, right? There is no duplicate. So you are grouping by what uh, column? Start. So it will pick up, so uh, in Agnew there are like 11 trips. So Agnew is repeating 11 times, but you see it only once. It grouped, right? But what you should also do is that you should do a reset index 
कैन यू टेल मी वाई एम आई डूइंग दिस एनी आइडिया एनी आइडिया वाई एम आई डूइंग दिस हाँ सो लुक एट लुक एट द कॉलम्स नाउ नाउ एम गोना रन इट अगेन so when i did a reset index what it did previously uh, the index was this agnew almond and all that is how it came right when i did a reset index it started this 0 1 2 3 as the index but again i am not happy because you know these are the different columns i have so i can simply say res dot columns um, equal to so what are the columns you want first will be start city what is the second column hmm average distance right what is that mean right what is the third column earliest uh, first trip right not the recent trip what was that earliest trip then what we had recent. recent trip recent trip happy this is what you should do because once you do a group grouping these columns will all get nested so you need to re remove it just add an index because otherwise this will be the index so this will become your index and then you just say what columns you want so now you have a proper data frame in this format right you can have your own columns now you can work with the data index was by default it should be there right? by default the index was start city when i ran it i don't want that to be the index why did it take the indexes of the previous one it will not when you do a group by it doesn't select the index as such index is only for selection after group by the output that you get is based on which columns you selected for grouping so by default that will become the index column that is sort of like something so if i am removing these columns right let's run this again uh, no 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 let's run this again hmm see this so what is my index now start star this is the index start star now if you want that to be the index it's fine maybe my requirement is like my index column has to be the start column that's okay for me i don't mind but a better option will be to remove it and add your normal index 0 1 2 and then you are interested in removing the column names and giving your own names so just say whatever column names you want so in real time whether it's required uh, this index it is uh, yeah so this index is actually there are some operations where the index actually comes into picture for example uh, you can take an existing column and add it as an index so in those cases you want to call based on the index number you can do that that is only it's not yeah it's not mandatory so when you do reset index it will become 0 1 2 standard index um but in say so let's say there is a country column i can say the country column has to be my index column so my index so whatever values are there in the country that will become my index then i can operate horizontally also so usually all the operations are vertically in a data frame but there are horizontal operations also i can do like when you are talking about loc lock right what if i want to use lock in the horizontal way so let's say i got the data from uh, 150 countries right and i load it in a data frame now that will have a horizontal index of 0 1 2 3 right now i want to do some calculation where it is horizontal so then i have to say select 100 select 200 i don't know what to do so if my country column is index i can just say select japan then do something right so that for selecting it might be important otherwise you can leave it as 0 1 i will show you an example probably uh, we have a sales data example where the indexing might be very useful there is a sales data example where the indexing might be useful list is similar elements dictionary is if you have a key and a set of values so if i am using like if i am saying that i have three columns and i want to apply min max on each column so let's say you have a three columns on each column you are applying one aggregation function then you can use a list so no yeah so i am saying that i have revenue revenue is a column okay 
then I have another column called sales, then I have another column called profit. Three columns are there, right? Now on each column, I want to apply some sort of a, a mathematical function. So what I can do, I can pass all of them as a single list. I can say revenue, sorry, what is that? Sales and then profit. So this is a list because this is a set of columns and my aggregation I want to do, I can say I want to do aggregation. Again, I can pass, let's say mean. If I simply pass only mean, what will happen on all three columns mean will be calculated, right? Or if I want all three columns to have different things, I need to pass mean, let's say max, let's say min, like this. So, so this is two lists actually because on each column I am saying that this is what I want to do. But now my requirement is that on revenue column, I want to calculate, let's say min, max and uh, uh, mean, three things. So I have a revenue column, I want to calculate the min, the max and the mean, three things on the same column. So then what I need to do, I need to use a dictionary. So I will say revenue is my key, okay. And the values are, I can pass as a min, max and uh, mean, these things. Because you understand, right, one is a column, one is a function. This is what a column that you are operating. This is what a function you are applying. So the question is that are you applying one function on one column? If you are just interested in applying one function on one column, you can pass the list of columns as a list and the function also as a list, it will apply, okay? Otherwise, you need to use a dictionary. A dictionary, right. Exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. Exactly, exactly. So list is like you have one-to-one -one mapping. List is one-to-one -one mapping. So I pass a list of columns and a list of functions, first, first function will be applied, second, second function will be applied like that. But on the other hand, I have one, two, three columns, for each column I am doing three, four functions separate, I need to say, I need to map them, right, what function should run in which column. So there I need to use a key value pair. So uh, the idea of a key value pair is that for one key you have three values. So all three things will be applied for this key. So for revenue, so for In, in this example? Yes. Ah, right. So if you are passing as a list, one to one will be applied. Yes. And profit uh, min will be applied. Exactly. But otherwise, if I have multiple, I will say dictionary. This is the key. These are the values and then apply them. Drop. Yeah, you can drop. We did, right? Oh, we didn't do. Okay, but if I drop it here, then it may not be good, right? Because my intention is to keep uh, index starting from zero. So in the original, okay, so here, uh, give me one moment, okay, I'll just comment this. So here you have the grouping. From here you want to drop the index. Yeah, so RES is your result. Yeah, the index is start star. This this line you are saying. Oh, okay, okay. So you are saying that uh, only after this you are able to add the columns, right? No, even without that also you can do. Which one? Ah, so now you have RES. Oh, now you are saying, uh, will you be able to do this? You are asking. Let's try. Ah, no, that cannot be done. So what it is saying, length mismatch. Expected access has three elements. New value has four elements. So what it actually says? Why it is saying the value has four elements? Okay, let me show you this. Um, 
what is that res right res dot res dot <coughs> columns oh i need to mm, exactly so let me just print this okay uh, so when you look at uh, this uh, multi index right so 1 2 3 so actually you are having three columns in this after grouping even though you see multiple columns it is all nested so if you look at the uh, you know number of columns you have here you have something called levels it is picking this as one column then this max mean minute is picking as another nested column and then this labels it is picking as another column so you are having three columns and you are saying that i want to you know uh, have four columns for my data frame that is what it is saying that value doesn't match so you need to reset the index you have to first say reset the index so properly it will add an index okay and then the columns and then only you can uh, you know remove it so did you guys understand this after you group it after so this is the grouping result right after the grouping if you look at the columns these are the columns so how many columns you have three columns even though it displays like in this fashion if you actually look at the columns it says multi index column so this is not your normal column this is not your normal column it does an indexing so it is saying that on one level you are having miles and start date so what was the grouping column what did we group by start date right so start date is there then you have what miles miles is what where you are calculating the average right distance travel right then it is saying that you are passing this max mean min these are the operations you were doing on date and the other thing and then it is assigning some labels also for each column so when you look at the columns of your grouping output you will see there are three columns and i cannot directly change it that is what i am saying that i want to reset the whole index of my columns so when you run reset index what it will eventually do is that it will add a column for index starting with 0 1 2 3 and then level your columns and then you will be able to add that my custom column name whatever i want which one let me see so this is after leveling right so i will do a res reset index right now if i run res hmm. so now if i run res you have this index and then these columns one two three four columns so you want to drop this uh, you can say drop index there is a drop index but then what will be the advantage hmm. okay so after you rename so let's say you are adding these columns right let's say we are adding these columns then anyway that is gone right where is it okay from here you want to remove this index right mm, i don't think that is possible no because a data frame must have an index if you are removing this then what will happen your start city will become the index column hmm? no there is no way you can so that is in the first class i told you right data frame is not like your excel sheet in an excel sheet you have only columns you don't have a row right if I remove it or drop it, how do you use I lock on horizontally or lock on horizontally? How do you access a row? Not possible, right? If somehow, I, I, let's say I am dropping the index, okay? Then how do I say I want only the third column or fourth column? Not possible, right? Lock or whichever. No. No, no, she is saying I don't want the index at all. I want to remove the index. That is not possible, right? Huh? Wait. You can access using the huh. huh. So this I can keep my index. If I want, I can keep this as my index. Okay. Now she is saying that I want to hide this, right? I want to remove this. So I don't think that is possible. Because you have column indexes and row indexes. Column indexes are column names row indexes by default start from 0 1 2 3 if i want i can take a column and say that i want this to be the row index but whichever way i just need it right for accessing 
So I don't think uh, it is possible to completely remove the row index. Then how do you say that I want the fifth row? There should be some way to say that I want the fifth row, right? So this number has to be here in one way. Mm, I have another uh, data set. Probably I will show you um, how you can select a particular column and then probably make it as an index if you want. So I just want probably this column as my index. Yeah, because this output can be a base now, like this but one more thing I'll tell you, uh, you can try that. If you save this as a CSV file, do you think the 0, 1, 2, 3 will come? No, I'm not quite sure about it. Can you try? How do you save it? You say pd dot to CSV, give a CSV file. Can you try it right away? Create this, you have the 0, 1, 2, 3, okay? And then you say pd dot to underscore CSV and in the brackets, in double quotes, give a CSV file name. This is only RES. Yeah. So, but it was mentioning only miles and start rate, not the start start bonus. So, is it like that whatever we are passing in the aggregate function? Ha. Huh. That is only one which is printing, right. So, in fact, directly if you do like this, it is very difficult to access the rows and columns because they are nested, right. That is why we are saying that add an index and give proper column names. Since the data frame is consist of star star columns, right, then why it is not included in the labels? Which one? That is the index column now. You do not have, so it is picking the first column as index column now, that is why. So, when you say columns, it will not usually show that, right. So, in this data frame, that is the, so you can try to do an ILOC or lock on that column, it will give you. Okay, so here, star star will give the index for Exactly, exactly. So, if the requirement is like that, you can keep it like that. I want that column to have my index column, but that will not be calculated. In my actual data, that will not come, I am saying. Index column is not part of your data, right. So, that is why it is not showing there. Ah, it will not be there. <coughs> right. So, in this example that this column is not there. The first column is like an index column. That is why you are not seeing it. But that is bad because I want that in my data. That is why I am saying the reset the index because I want my own index column. So, this will be pushed as a regular column. Start star will come as a regular column. Then I can just rename and keep it for me. So, can you guys save it as a CSV and tell me what you see? The first column. Hmm? Not taking? It should take, right? Uh, let me run this, okay? I commented this. Uh, okay, I forgot. I think it was two CSV, right? RES dot. It will take, right? Can you see my screen? Ah, that is a good question. It will come here. See? Ha, so, uh, this will be your uh, workplace, workspace. So, this is your root directory. You can just download it. Hmm. So, this is my CSV. And if I open that, let me see what we have. Oh. I can't even open it. No, no, that's not a problem with the file. Ah. Okay. Oh, actually, index comes. Index will come when you are saving it. So, uh, this you have to, uh, you know, here you can probably, if you want, you can hide. I'm saying. So, I'm saying in the in the data frame perspective, I may not want to hide because I want to access them. So, I want to say from 5 to 10, I need the data. So, but in the Excel, when I get, I do not want this column because I know how to get data in Excel. So, I can either delete it or hide it from Excel when you are saving it finally. Even I am not 100 percent sure if you are saving it, probably there is an argument to remove index and save it also. Probably. Index is equal to index equal to false. False, right? Then it will remove it, right? Ah, there is an argument. So, when you are saving it. But when you are working in the data frame, you do not want to remove the index. 
because then how do you access the rows? There is, it's not possible, right? But, but in the original Uber drivers uh, 2016, there was nothing actually. Yeah, there is no nothing. So this index was added automatically. When you read it, it will add it automatically. Ah, so while saving this Excel, right? ah. if I don't uh, reset index and I save it, ah. right? so it will start with uh, what index it is? Yeah, the original data, whatever it was there. So it is tracking with 455 index. You can ah. start with the 455. Ah, you can try that. Check it. Just see how the data looks like when you save it. Original data, right? So, guys, in the event of time, I'll move to the next topic. As of now, we are done with grouping. Okay, I'll give you more examples. Uh, we will also clear some doubts uh, offline. I just want to finish one more topic before we go to uh, NumPy and other kind of topics, right? So, um, looping, we will look into that. Yes, so um, have a look at here. Um, this is a very simple example, probably, uh, you know, so this is something that we do. We did not go in depth into uh, control structures in Python, like for loops, if loops and all. But something very commonly we do is that if you have a list like this, right, I can open something called a for loop. So, I am saying that for i in temp, so, when you say for i, it will pick up each number one by one. I am saying that res dot append. Yesterday I showed you, right, append, you can add something. And I am saying i star uh, i. And then I am returning res. So, res is an empty list. Basically, what this is happening is that this for loop will pick up each number, multiply the number by itself and add it to this empty list. So, if I run this, you can also run, you will basically get 14916. So, instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, each number will be multiplied. It is a simple for loop, nothing. So, in, in Python, it is very common that if you want to work through a list and do some action, you write a for loop. Because programmatically, you can say that for every element, I want to do something. And this is one way of doing it. And there is the same thing, there is also something called list comprehension. So, look at this example. So, here what we are doing is called a list comprehension. The same uh, technique, I can just open a list. Within the list, I can say x star x for x in temp. So, basically, I am saying that take every element in temp and then multiply by itself. So, this is probably the long, long way. Like this code is very lengthy, but the same code I can write. This is called list comprehension. So, very commonly in Python, you will see this. You will see a list and within the list, they could have written a for loop. That means that loop is running inside the list. To, to manipulate the elements. That is called list comprehension, this technique. See? For as many elements are there in the list. So, this x star x for x in temp, temp is nothing but your original uh, what okay. list, right? Ha, temp is here, right? And what is the difference between a for loop and a while loop? I mean, I will give you some examples, but. Hmm? Yeah, uh, or in a uh, while can become an uh, indefinite loop. For loop can never become an indefinite loop. It is always fixed. You will never end up in an infinite loop in a for loop. Only in while loop, there is a chance. I am saying while greater than zero, then some number then will keep on running for infinity, right? Now, I want you to do one thing. There is a data set I want you to upload. Can you open your uh, data you downloaded yesterday? Uh, final. Uh, in Python files, there is a file called store sales. Can you see? Can you rename the file? Uh, just keep it as store sales. So remove the one and upload that into your uh, Python like this. So, here I have uploaded, can you see? Store sales, see? So, once you upload it, you come back here and you should be able to read it like this. So, can you read it? And this is a very interesting data set because uh, here we are having a store ID. So, you have like S1, S2, S3 up to some 100 stores. There is a city for where each store is and then there is like months. Uh, Jan, Feb, March, etc. and sales in thousands. 
So there's like eight thousand dollar, twenty thousand dollar, etc., etc. Right? So this data is particularly interesting because here there is a horizontal way of working it, and there is a vertical way of working it. Right? Like like you can look at it both ways. So basically, you are having store IDs, then the cities, and then the months and the store that you have. So are you able to read it? What is not defined? <coughs> PD dot read CSV. You might. So did you import pandas? If not, do this right. Ah, for me it is working. Okay, rename the file, no store sales, or give the store sales one. Ah, no, I thought he didn't do it, so I just added it. Not required. Now, first time you imported pandas, right? Then it is not required. Ah. Yeah, huh. Oh, you are reading the file, right? Yeah. And then you are doing a head. Uh, that I did. Okay, yeah, okay. I also hmm. Okay. Uh, so, so tell me one thing. Uh, tell me one thing. I just want to calculate the average sale for Jan month. What will you do? Only for Jan month, I want to calculate the average sale. Ah, across Jan column, I want the average. So you can say uh, store sales. Then what you do? You want to group by? I can say. should work right so i am just interested in calculating the average or the mean for jan the easiest way to do that will be you can just also i think some some i thought some of you might ask me but nobody asked what is the speciality in this code is there anything interesting that you find well i think yesterday we discussed so normally you have to say store sales dot lock of jan i am not using that right Ah, so that is like a shortcut. So ideally, it has to be what dot lock of Jan. But you can also say just Jan; it will pick up. And I'm just saying mean. So what do you get? You get the mean of all the all these things. Uh, that's only the Jan column, right? But now I'm not interested in that. I am interested in calculating, let's say, uh, the mean <laughs> of store ID S1. So probably for this store. I have like Jan, Feb, March, all these months. I just want to calculate the average of this one thing, right? Probably. So yeah. So store one is in tech sacks. I just want to operate in horizontal way, right? Plus possible, right? And vertical is like right now we have picked up only Jan. Maybe I'm interested in picking up multiple columns also. So let's see how to do this. So one um, interesting function that I want to introduce to you. Now this might depend on your pandas version. It's called the apply function. So I can simply say store sales dot apply. Okay. So apply is a function. Okay. And you can simply say mean. So can you take a guess what happened if I ran this? <laughs> yes. So basically, apply is a special function we use, and within apply, you need to say what you need to do. So here I am saying mean. What it did was that it pick up each month and then calculated the mean. Is there anybody for whom this is not working? Throwing an error. You might. Just run only this. Huh? If you are getting this output, it is fine. Otherwise, if you are getting an error, then sometimes you may get an error saying that some pandas version uh, it, this directly it will not. So, because can you tell me why it might give an error? So right now you are getting it fine. 
So if you think about it, what this technique will do, it will pick up each column and then apply mean. But then what is the problem? We have a column which is string, right? So in some pandas versions, what will happen if you run this, it will throw an error. It will say that I am trying to calculate mean of all column, but the second column is a string. So I don't know what to do. So I will show you what you need to do there because that might be very handy. So there you have a command called select data types. So you can say that include only integer and float. Don't consider string. But if it is working fine, then it is fine. Now what if I want to do it horizontally, right? For example, right now you did this uh, and I want to calculate for store ID S1 mean. Mean for the year, Jan, Feb, March, April, right? So this is what for S1 I want all the mean horizontally. That is also possible, right? For per one particular store, I'm interested in the yearly average. Then you can simply say, comma, axis equal to one. So there is a concept of axis. Hmm? There is an axis zero and then there is a axis one. Axis one will be row wise, axis zero will be column wise. By default, it is column anyway. Hmm. So if I say axis equal to zero, what will happen? Columns will come. By default, it is this. I can say axis equal to one. That will be each and every row. Each row it will calculate the mean. Uh, but this apply function is not used for these kind of things because this is like calculating the mean. That is like very common. But you can also have a bit more complicated functions in apply. We will see that. Okay. Axis one is row, row wise. So for each store, it is calculating the mean of this line. That is what you see here. Axis zero is column. Yeah. So it is uh, very rare that you want to do. Uh, even I need to. You might uh, want to add as a, uh, yeah, so how to add a row? I need to check because adding a column is easy and removing a column is also easy. I need to check because it is, uh, no, columns is possible. So can we add this column to the one which we have calculated? This one, yes, I'll show you how to add it. If I give access a zero, uh, it is again showing the same what we have done for Columns. Yeah, axis zero is column. By default, it is column. <laughs> By default, if you simply call, it will work column wise. The apply function works column wise. That equal to axis zero. You don't have to explicitly write axis zero. What if I have two integers? Now that there is just okay, just take it on the channel. Okay, what is how many I have? It, it calculates. But but what I'm saying is that in many cases what I have seen when you start working in production probably you will have a data frame that will have a mixture of string then float then integer and so many other columns. So sometimes when you simply call the apply function let's say you're doing like mean it will throw an error saying that I was trying to calculate it but I encountered like 10 or 20 string columns which I don't know what to do. So there you need to use a small technique. Uh, I will see if it works. I am not quite sure. Uh, so you have to say mean. Mm, no. So I will show you how to do this. Directly you cannot. Okay. Here it is just the mean of the whole. Each column it is calculating the whole mean or each row. Can't pass any argument with these columns should be calculated for No, but. <laughs> ah, so store ID is uh, what? City is string, right? It is not considering right now, but I am saying that sometimes you will see that you have a string column. It will throw up an error saying that I cannot convert. So in case if it occurs, what you need to do, I will I'll come back to your question Okay, in a moment. You have to say uh, dot select D types. You have to say include, include, mm, I think you can mention like this. Let's say integer 64, comma, float 64. Guys, give me one moment, okay? 
Yes. So, just make a note of this um, because this is not something which you see normally, but if you are getting an error saying that I am not able to calculate the mean, you just add this thing, select D types, you can say include integer 64, I mean whichever. So, this will say that I want only integer, it will uh, forcefully omit the string columns, right? I will show you, just give me a moment. Apply and aggregate. See, apply is a function which will work row wise and column wise. Hmm? So, there uh, in apply it is not directly possible to say that I want to apply only on selected ranges. I will show you how to do that. In AGG, it is an aggregation function. So, where AGG will work is that first you will group it and then on that you are saying that I want to apply a function. So, this is like in a common data frame, I want rows and columns to be done something. This is how you do it. So, Prabhu, uh -huh. if, if for example, let's say across cities we have like multiple entries for the store IDs. For uh -huh. example. Let's say S1 was like spread across multiple other cities also. Uh -huh. right. So, let's say we wanted to do for, let's say it was like Walmart, Texas, uh -huh. Walmart, uh -huh. whatever. So, uh, all. Then you need to group it. Okay. Right. So, no, then it will not work. So, that is what I am saying. Apply is something which normally takes a function like mean or something and applies to either whole rows or whole column, columns. That is the idea. And I will show you where that actually matters, where that condition will come. So, group by and then uh, the function that you are writing, that is where I want to group something, then, up, then you know probably aggregation function I want to write. So, for that aggregation, the logic is that first I am combining all the, so can you try to find out the um, city wise uh, sales probably, can you do a group by what, city, I want to do a group by city, then so I want to group the stores by city and then want to calculate what, probably average or means uh, sale, can you try to do that. What I am saying, usually when you apply the uh, apply function, if you have string and integer, it will omit integer. But in some pandas version, it will not. It will try to calculate the strings uh, mean and throw an error saying that I cannot find out what is the mean of a string. So, there you need to say. But still you cannot, right? Because the end goal is that you take the value and calculate the mean or whatever you want. So, if my values are all string, I try to do a mean, I will not get anything, right? It will throw an error. So, I did not get your situation. Where will be such a situation come? Can you give me an example? Where you have a column name as a? Column name. Uh, okay, okay, fine. How come that? But that will be string only, right? It will not be numeric. Yeah. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. So, now you tell me what you will do. So, he is saying, Okay, so uh, there is a question, he is saying there is a column, let us say the column is what? Sales, there is a sales column, okay, this is defined as a what integer, right? String, string column, this is a string column, okay, but inside the values are integer, for example, I have 3.33, what is the solution? Two integer, right, we just discussed today morning, right? today or yesterday? It will not, it will, it, I mean, so in my version of pandas, it will avoid that column, omit that column because it is a string column because it is looking at those numbers, but they are within the chords, right? It will come to them as string strings only. D types, uh, D types, dot D types. 
can you do it by providing columns, column names? No, the apply function works on the whole. So all the columns or all the rows. So usually the idea is that if you want to select certain columns and do it, either you need to subset it, okay, or you can say group it and then. This one you are saying? Yes. Huh? I will show you. So, this is not apply function. This is simply the mean I am calculating. So, same thing you can apply for store ID. Now, I was asking, uh, you know, if you have a data frame like this, apply function usually works on whole rows and whole columns, not like selected ones, right? And one thing I showed you is how to apply the mean actually. But some more interesting example will be, so, let me show you this. Probably rather than discussing, I'll just show an example. Uh, insert a cell above. Yeah. So have a look at here, guys. Uh, do you know how to define a function in Python? So normally, if you want to define a function, let's say I want to define a function like add. I will say add. You can say a comma b. I want to pass two elements. Sorry. And then, so if you are passing A and B, what will happen? You will say there is something called RES equal to A plus B and you can simply return RES. And how do you call the function? You will say add and then you will say 3 comma 4. So have a look at here, what I did, I created a simple function. It is called add hmm? and I am saying that there is A and B. If you pass a and b, it will add a plus b. This is how you define a very simple function in Python just to show you the syntax. Now my condition is that, so look at the store sales data. I have the store sales data, right? I want to uh, probably give a bonus. Hmm? So I have stores, right? There are store IDs. And what I want to do is that I want to pick up a column, right? So let's say the Jan month sales. If the Jan month sale is let us say more than 10,000 for a, for a store, then I want to give them a bonus. So my idea is that, so these are the situations where apply function will come into picture. So it is not like apply function is used for everything, but one common example is that I have the store data and what I want to do, I have the Jan column and my condition is that if the store has made a sale, okay, which is more than 10K in Jan month, then I will call this store as eligible store. I will give them bonus. If the value is less than 10K, I will say not eligible. Now, can you tell me how can you make sure uh, whether it is more than 10 or less than 10? Any technique? We did yesterday, right? NP dot where, right? So, what I can do, I have already written it, I think. So, then I can save some time. Look at here. So, I have defined a function called bonus function hmm? and the bonus function takes something called sales numbers okay? or I can say sales column, right? And probably I wrote it as a comprehension, okay? So, I will just write it in a bit more easy way so you guys can understand. So, tell me how do you write the bonus? So, you can say np dot where, right? How do you write? What will be the condition? So, first let us do one thing. Let us call it something. So, I will say I have something called eligible values. Uh, if you guys want, you can write it along with me. We will see if we can define this function. So, I will say just type def and then bonus function and this function is taking a column. I will say eligible values, okay, where I will say np dot where, what is the condition? When my sales column is greater than 10, I will say eligible or I will say what? Not eligible. And then what you need to do in the function, return what? Eligible values. 
So what am I doing? I am defining a simple function which will take something called sales column and it will compare this. It will say eligible, not eligible. Right. But that is not the end of it. So I can, I will just see whether it works. Store sales. I can just say Jan bonus. Then I can simply say bonus function and I will pass what store sales. What is the column J A N, right? Some error for sure. Oh, no, no, I need to import it, right? I don't have. So, how do you say? Import and numpy as, as np. Ah, very interesting. So, what did I do here? This is my function. What my function does? It takes a sales column and it will just say np dot where if the column value is more than 10, it is eligible otherwise not eligible and return that true or false eligible or not eligible to this and I am just adding a new column. So somebody was asking how do you add a new column. So this is one way I am just saying that I want to add a new column called Jan bonus and what is a new column? I will pass this Jan column of store sales to the bonus function and the result will be the new column called Jan bonus. You can see that here. Yeah, so np dot where uh, what it will do it will so what are you passing to the function? So what is this sales column? This will be Jan, yeah. right? So if you take Jan, it will take all these 8, 12, 16 all will be compared. So 8 will be not eligible, 12 will be obviously eligible. Ah, you can also say return np dot where everything you can write as a single one. So that is how I wrote before I guess. But it has to be a list I guess if you are doing like that. Let me check that. So you were writing what return? Oh, oh no 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 I don't think directly you can say return np dot where. No 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 I don't think that's possible. Def is a keyword for defining the function. Ah, and this is the name of the function called bonus function, right? Now let me ask you one more thing. Okay, so a little bit about the function. Let me ask you one more thing. What if your manager is saying, what if your manager is saying that, you know, so this month we will give them bonus if the store sale is more than 10. Next month it will be 20, right? Not every month it will be same. So how do you do? So this 10 is not fixed. Every month, hmm? so what do you do? You will say sales column, comma, sales number, number. Hmm? and then what do you do? Instead of 10, you write sales sales so you will say, do you guys understand this? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So here you are passing it as a variable, right? Well, it's not required. I'm just saying sales column is less than 10. <laughs> But what is more interesting will be this, I can say store sales new df equal to store sales, I can say dot apply Ah, uh, hmm. 
Now, so I have to say select B types include equal to integer 64 one moment okay <coughs> why it says invalid syntax where where include right Ah. Mm. So uh, now see what I have done, right? Now see what I have done. I have so this is the actual use of the apply function. So like I said, apply is something which will take your function and apply to every column by default. In the, the function that I am calling here is bonus function. So what is the bonus function doing? It will compare each value whether it is more than 10. Okay. And I am applying to the whole data frame. So for each month I decided if the sale is more than 10, they are eligible. So if you look at my new data frame I created, it has just the eligible and not eligible stores. Of course, you have only the ID, right? But now you have a problem, right? What is the problem? So this is fine. The previous uh, data is gone, gone in the sense like we created a new data frame out of it, right? But by looking at this uh, alone, you may not be able to make sense like which store is actually uh, up, uh, eligible or not eligible. So that is where uh, you can do one more thing. You can actually concatenate two data frames. Like my original data frame is what? Uh, DF, right? Store sales, right? I can say I want to add store sales and new DF together. I can do a concatenation. But you have to be very careful when you are doing concatenation because ideally when you do concatenation, you can either add them horizontally or vertically. Horizontal adding means two will be added like this, vertical means like this. So ideally their rows and columns should be equal. Otherwise you will end up having problems. So now my requirement is I have two data frames and I just want to add them together. <laughs> right? So let's see how to do that. Then I will pick up your questions. Ah, so I can say something like this pd dot one moment okay concat I think the function is called concat what are the data frame names store sales store sales and new df right right Mm. So, what do you think happens? So, and it is always uh, good to check this. And I'm just uh, let's do one thing. Raghu dot. What you do? What happened? I concatenate. How many rows are there now? Two hundred. So my data set has 15 columns and 100 rows and I did a concat and what happened it appended horizontally below. So you don't believe again do a ragu dot tail right and you see so if you don't want this you can say what one or zero. Ah, now we are talking more or less looks like you know easy to so you may argue that this is much more easy in excel to do but uh, yeah but if you have 100 rows I will not come to this to do it actually but if you have 1 million rows probably this is not a good idea. So what did we do we created a data frame called new df right where I have applied this bonus function. And check with your uh, pandas version when I apply this I got an error cannot convert string that is why I added this d types here okay and I created a new df 
and now my original data frame is store sales the eligible not eligible is new df i say concatenate them together access equal to 1 because i want to add them horizontally just after that and look at the shape and print it you are getting the data frame that you want ha huh. so that yeah so so you have to either rename them or because it will have the same uh, column names this frame is created now so how do i pick up march yeah so if you do if you do a march so you need to reset the column names actually this bonus function had a parameter hmm? which one this function bonus ah. function this data frame is created remove it so if i say jan but 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 if you want to add it you cannot if you are picking up jan you will get two jan so either you can rename the columns okay you can just say that select you know lock of this to this range and change the names dot columns so one way is you can say dot columns and manually reset all the column names so instead of jan you can call it as jan bonus or something like that but in the default operation it will add the same column names we are not changing it so the but this is also good i think because not good but you can see jan and jan eligibility probably it causes some confusion because generally in this returns are series रघु डॉट कॉलम्स नो दे आर नॉट ने आर हैविंग ऑल द कॉलम्स बट दे आर सॉर्ट ऑफ लाइक हाउ डू आई से repetitive right so one thing you need to uh, take care is that if you are doing this kind of concatenation store the column names you might have to change or manually add them they will remain the same ah uh, you can one thing is you can say dot columns and then you can manually add it that is one way to do it then you can pass as a list and give a new name so you can say df of the column name equal to and then you can give another column name this like i log do we have like i column by numbers i log this like i log ah uh, rows by numbers so your columns column in in i log you can access columns by numbers when i say dot i log i can use only numbers either row or column so i log is to fetch the rows right no to fetch the columns also you can use You have to use the zero, one, two, three like column numbers. It won't consider the column headers. No, uh, there might be a method. I don't remember. <laughs> so, I don't think. Ha. Huh, so, not in the original data frame. You can say select. You know, lock and then move it. आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू डिस्कस वन स्मॉल टॉपिक विच इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट बट इट इज नॉट देर इन योर दिस थिंग नॉट बुक आई हैव एन अदर नॉट बुक आई विल शेयर इट विथ यू बट दिस सीम्स टू बी अ बिट इंपॉर्टेंट so can you guys tell me what is happening here hmm okay so i will just run this oh you need to import right how do you import import pandas as pd so um guys have a look at this uh, i just brought this example to show you something what i'm doing here what is years a list list what is f1 dictionary. dictionary so i can create something called a series okay by passing f1 and index equal to years well these things may not be really important because it's very uh, unlikely that you manually enter some data and create a data frame usually you read it but my point here is that what will happen is that series is a single column even a single column with row index 
even though you say single column, it has a row index, right? So here, if I show you, let me um, firm one, right? Okay, so uh, is it printing something? No, it's not printing. So if I say print firm one, hmm, this is how firm one will look like. <coughs> okay, what is firm one? Firm one has an index of years. So, 90, 91, 92, these things will be the index, right? And then it will also have this F1. So, it will look at this dictionary and find out the values. It will add it here and create it like this, okay? So, basically what I did by running all this, I created a data frame like this. This is my data frame. Hmm? So, in the data frame, the index is this 90, 91, 92 and all. I have three columns, firm one, firm two, firm three. The, the point that I want to actually discuss here is this NAN values. So, it is very common that when you do data analytics, you will get a lot of NAN values and what to do with them. So, one of the things you can do is that you can say there is a drop NA method. So, I can say, so what is firm 2? Firm 2 is a series and here what is this data frame called DF3, right? So, I can say df3 drop na, <coughs> df3 dot drop na. So, can you tell me what happened when I did a drop? Huh. So, my question is, is it dropping them row wise or column wise? Are you sure? Only 93 and 94 was retained. Row wise, right? So, it will drop it row wise NAN values. So, wherever you have an NAN value that row was dropped and you got only the remaining one. That is okay. But if I say DF3, if I say DF3, what will happen? The original data frame is unaffected, right? So, ideally you should assign this drop NA or I think you will be also able to do a in place true. So, if you want the original data frame to have this, what you say? In place, true. What will happen? It will drop from the original data frame and, and so your original frame will get affected, right? And usually you do not want to do that. So, you can assign that to a different. So, this is one way of dropping the value. You can also do something else. For example, hmm. You can say axis equal to 1. What will happen? Row wise, row wise or column wise? Yeah. So, axis equal to 0 means column wise, right? In the sense like it is picking this, axis equal to 1 means. So, it is checking wherever NAN values are there and it is dropping them. That is also possible, right? And another interesting thing is there is a threshold you can mention, okay. So, have a look at here. I am saying I want to drop axis 1 threshold equal to 2, okay. So, what do you mean by this threshold? So, let us say threshold equal to, what are the values we have? Okay. Yeah, so threshold df. So, what is the original uh, data frame? df3, right? So, let us print that also. Print df3. Okay, not here because this is the last line anyway, it will print. I will say print threshold df and I will print df3. So, did something happen? Nothing happened right? Because my threshold is 2. So, let us say the threshold is a bigger number 8. Empty data frame. Okay. What is the number? 5. 90, 91, 92. So, this is also having same, right? So, what is this threshold value doing? So, you can define a threshold. In this case, rows having more than two NAN values, it will be dropped. So, threshold works like that. So, it will look at 
the other values and if you mention a number then anything more than that will drop otherwise it will keep it. Why this is important because you will uh, encounter probably millions of NIN values in the data frames and you might want to uh, you know change them or drop them. You can also replace them. So one common thing that we do is that we replace them. You can say fill NA. So what am I doing? Fill NA0. So instead of all NAN values, it will be filled with what? 0, right? You can also say, for, you know, uh, fill with a mean, right? For example, huh. so here what am I doing? I am saying fill NA DF3 dot mean. So the mean will be calculated or you can pass a function and that value can be filled. So that's something we commonly do because uh, let's say you are getting the annual uh, revenue of 10 companies every year, okay. Now it comes in a data frame, right. Now what happens in one year, there is no revenue, they forgot to give you the data. So that will become an NAN, right. So now when you start working with it, you just don't want to consider there is no data. So what we do is that the last 10 year uh, data we have, only one year is missing, you say mean of it and fill it there. So you have some value to experiment with. You cannot simply say drop everything, right? So if it is zero, doesn't mean like, so you have to justify that. So what we do is that we'll replace that NAN value with a mean. So 10 year revenue of the company is this, one year is missing, the mean will take care of it. It's mean for that series or for the For that company is all uh, years, that column mean. I mean one technique I'm saying, anything you can do, I'm just saying that that will make sense. Otherwise, if you say that value is zero and then you are calculating something, it will have a huge impact because <laughs> that it is as good as like the company didn't do any business on that year. But ideally, they forgot to give you the data or something like that. So always it is a good practice to find the NAN values and then manipulate them, right. So I will share this notebook with you. Uh, this has some explanation also of these NAN values. This is not with you right now, but I will share it with you. So you guys can uh, practice on this. Now on data frames, uh, there is an assignment, not now, don't worry. <laughs> so later, but I'll share this file with you. Uh, where is this final? Okay, final pandas, okay, where is it? Practice pandas exercise, huh. so pandas lab. So there is a, can you see this? There is an automobile data and there is something called pandas lab exercise. So the idea is that you load this notebook and try to see if you can get the answer. If not, there is something called solution. So in the solution, uh, there is pandas exercise solution you have. So if you are not able to get it, for example, I will just show you one of them. Uh, how do you upload it? You will go here, upload. And you can say practice, pandas exercise and we want the automobile data and this and say open, <coughs> upload both. Uh, and I can just open this, yeah. So this is like this, we shall now test your skill <laughs> using pandas package, answer each question. So yeah, check the head, so you are supposed to read the data frame, that is not given, right answer each question, load pandas as PD and upload the automobile data. So what is automobile data? Uh, practice, here is automobile data, let me open and show you. So the automobile data actually has lot of columns. So there is a make and model of the car, how many tires it has, what is the engine, what type, that is automobile data and check the head of the data frame how many rows and columns are there, what is the average price of all calls, which is the cheapest make, how many cars have horsepower greater than this, three most commonly found cars, which cars are priced, etc, etc. So this is one sample practice. So we will give you more like this, so it is easy for you to go through and understand, solution is also there. Have you guys uh, heard about uh, Kaggle? Yes, right? Uh, why it is not giving any output? Oh, yeah, so for those who are not aware of it, uh, Kaggle is probably one of the best places where you can find all the data that you want. 
it is a website which shares data to you. You get lot of data and there are a lot of competitions that happen in uh, Kaggle. So, you can sign up for a competition, they will give you the data and then they will ask you to find a solution. So, for data science and ML this is the best place to get all the data. You can also see the previous competition results which people uploaded and, and that also can help you get more idea. So, this uh, automobile data set is actually taken from Ka uh, Kaggle right. You can get lot of free data sets in Kaggle hmm. and I have shared this notebook with you. It will be uploaded in LMS now. You can just download it and add it to your uh, Jupyter. Okay. Meanwhile, let us have a small discussion about NumPy right. <laughs> Um, see, uh, basically what is NumPy, like I said it is called numerical python, that is why it is called NumPy. Uh, NumPy is a special uh, data uh, structure library that is available in python, which allows you to play around with uh, multi dimensional arrays. So, the basic idea is to create multi dimensional arrays, right and uh, NumPy supports something called array. Okay, so, the array can be one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional that is what it is. The practical application may not come right now for you. Uh, you will see NumPy arrays later when, when you, uh, you know start working with deep learning or any other you know projects as such. Uh, so, NumPy is very useful and the pandas and data frames were actually built on top of NumPy right. Now, but so that is like very simple. So, you are saying that okay there is NumPy, but I have a very simple question to you. Uh, can you see this distance and speed thing I created? What is distance and speed? What are they? No, they are not array right list. It is a normal list you square bracket. Now, do not run this I think you do not have the notebook. <laughs> so, I have a question. I am saying time equal to distance by speed okay. And then I am saying printing time what will happen? So, I mean you can take your time. Okay. So, you are saying 45 by 5 or 50 by 10, 35 by 7. Absolutely wrong. <laughs> Nothing will happen. You get bunch of errors. It will not work right. How it will work? No, it will not, it will never work actually. The question is why? Yeah, yeah, it is a collection. A list is a collection where if I want to really do this, I should write a for loop. I will say for every element in this, take every element in that, do a uh, division. I mean, why am I saying this is that, but it is very common that I am looking at some data points. So, again like the Uber data. I got the Uber data probably not in an Excel file, probably in some other format where I have a distance covered by each Uber driver in an array or a list and I have the speed of each car okay. and I just want to do a distance by speed, but I cannot do this here on list. If I do it as a list or dictionary or anything, I will end up in a error for sure, right. So, I mean I just wanted to show you that it is not possible first, then if I say it will make. So, what is the error you are getting if I scroll down? unsupported operands for this list right. Well, now what I am going to do is something very simple. So, I am just going to import numpy as np okay, and this part is not required okay and look at what I am going. So, this what is distance? It is a list. You can convert this to a numpy array by simply typing array of distance. Then I can say uh, so, you do not have to say np dot array I think. Did we import it separately? Import numpy as np. Okay. Let me do one thing. Just comment these things for a moment. Hmm. So, let us run them one by one. Okay. Uh, no, you have to say np dot. Hmm. So, this is how you create a numpy array from let us say a list called distance. So, I am just converting this into a numpy array and again the speed I am converting np dot array and then we can just print them. So, let us have a look at how the data looks like right now. The data looks pretty much like a list as of now okay, but now what is interesting is that I can simply 
do this. I can directly say distance by speed and the result is time and if you check the data type of time, it's a numpy n dimensional array. That is how you know it's an array, uh, a numpy array, right? Excuse me. So, uh, you have already imported array, right? From uh, numpy array you have imported. Yeah. Then again, why we have to use np dot array? No, I override it actually. So you have to say np dot array ideally. I originally imported numpy as np. So whenever that import statement is there, you have to say np dot, right? Now, so the the real question is that why this is useful? <coughs> why this is useful? Because this numpy data structures like arrays are pre-compiled pre-compiled data types meaning if you create an uh, numpy array of let's say integers like this they are already compiled and any operation you write on them like addition subtraction they can apply that on all the elements really fast so uh, a numpy operations are 10 to 100 times faster than normal list operations you have heard about this uh, fortran right fortran what's the language fortran fortran is considered to be one of the fastest languages ever created. So NumPy array operations are as uh, fast as the Fortran operations. Because once you create an array, <coughs> it has pre-built uh, functions and uh, data types on the array. So when you say sum, it takes the whole uh, array as you know an integer and apply whatever logic you are saying. So the common use cases will be that I have data points in uh, different formats like length, width and all and I want to apply a common operation in them right now a question to you okay so let it be there are you able to get the this thing uh, this uh, notebook now you can also do things like this okay so what about this now you will be able to answer my question right uh, can you have a look at uh, this code i'm going to run will it work these three lines it will work but what happened concatenation right so when you say add to list what will happen it will concatenate the list that is the default nature of a list but you don't want that your idea was to add the uh, you know individual numbers right that will not work so but what I can do so this is how you can create an array I can simply say this np dot array Give me one moment. Where it is giving the error? F plus G. Okay, I'll just comment this. I'll tell you why it is not working. Oh, we don't have F and G, right? From where you're getting F and all? <laughs> F and G is there, right? Okay. Hmm. So, I'm just creating an array with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 10, 20, 30, 40. I can print A, print B. Uh, but one thing did you check? Because I was trying to do a F plus G. I got an error, right? I did an F plus G. I got an error. Why do you think we got an error? Huh. Because if you are manually creating an NPy array, their dimension has to be exactly same. What do you mean by dimension? The number of rows and columns. So if I add a 50 here, it should work. It works. Right? So if you do an F plus G, this will work. You can also say I want to print add 5 with every element. So all these common operations can be broadcasted to the elements in the array. That's the advantage of an umpire array. Are you able to run these things? Hmm. But if you closely observe, the data type is integer 32. Hmm. In the array, the data type is integer 32. So when you actually go to uh, pandas and data frames, it is integer 64 and float 64. So they allow, I don't know, like more space to be there. I have a question. Don't try this. What if I create a numpy array with, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 4, Will it work? Will it not work? Will it throw an error? No? <coughs> NumPy is numerical, right? 
what do you into print f right mm. so can you tell me what happened here so ideally you should not do it <laughs> The numpy is a numerical python, so you are trying to play with numbers uh, and string values are not really, um, you know, advisable, but if your numpy array contains a string value, what will happen? So why this is happening, there is a reason behind this. If you look at the data types, there is something called object, this is your string, hmm? there is something called object then there is float, then there is integer. The lowest la layer of data type is integer. The next one is float, next one is string. So if in your NumPy array you have a mixture of float and object, it will automatically cast everything as string. If you have a mixture of integer and float, it will cast it as float, right? That is how it will automatically change the data type. So right now in my array, I have some numbers and then one string. So it is saying everything I will convert to string. So that is not a good thing to do ideally, right? But but if you encounter something like this, sorry, D type, D type. So this u11 is object, that is an object. How do you know if I remove this, uh, let us add it as uh, 5, what is that? Integer. So if I say 5.5 5 it will be what? Float 64, right? So you can do a d type for that. Um, so now some very uh, important functions you need to remember in NumPy. There is a function called a range. It's called a range. So I'm gonna comment some of this. Uh, let's say we don't want this. Okay. So a range is a function which will generate a range of numbers. Why is uh, again in p dot no no it comes by default we imported it right yeah it is np dot a range there has to be some problem guys no, it has to be np dot an array, then a range should work automatically. You don't have to say np dot array and np dot a range. That is not the idea. I don't know. Hmm? Hmm. So ideally if you say you don't need array at all ideally, right? You can simply do an a range. It should work. I think there is, I was trying to mess with the code, I guess. Uh, you don't have to say array. You can say np dot a range, it should work. So basically what is a range? It will generate a range of numbers and you say 10, so it will be from 0 to 9, right? This will be useful in case, you know, you are looking at some sampling data. So if I say 15, it will give me what? 0 to 14. So this will be a, uh, a NumPy array basically. Now where this can be useful is you can also mention this. So I am saying 5 is my starting point, 56 is the ending point and 5 is the step function. Ah. So can you see this? I did a NP dot A range 5, 56 and 5. So what will happen is start with 5 and 5 is the step function, so it will add 5, 5, 10, 15, 20, up to 55. It will never include the last element. 
there is a difference. So if I keep it 55 here, what will happen? What do you think will happen? Will it print? No, it will print only till 50. Because start with 5, add 5 till 55, last element is omitted. So it's like a step function to generate numbers. Uh, can be sometimes very useful because uh, you know you want to generate a set of numbers and uh, uh, work with them. Hmm? And there is also a very similar function called a lin space. A range and lin space are uh, very similar. The basic difference is this. Let me run it once, then you can understand the difference. I don't know why there is an array everywhere. I think I was doing something. I will just hash it. Yeah, so there is a np dot lin space function, hmm? and what it does is very simple. So let's say I want from thirty to hundred. Okay, and the step is five. Yeah. Um, can you take a guess? I ran this and I got this. What could have been happening? <coughs> so when you say 30 and 105, first will be 30, last will be 100. So two uh, numbers are fixed, right? This is fixed. And then what is this 5? Uh, so you will get 5 equidistant uh, numbers like 30 to 47, 47 to 65, 65 to 82, 82 to 100 will be same number. Uh, so and what is the formula? So how does it calculate this number between 30 and 47? 100 minus 30 divided by 5 or 4, I think 4. 5 minus 1, right? Can you do, can you tell me what is that number? 100 minus 30 will be what? 70. 70 by 4 is what? That is what you see here, right? Yeah. So the formula will be 100 minus 30 divided by 5 minus 1, 4. That's how lin space works. So, and, and you can do this for any number. For example, I can say I want between 1 and 10. I want some 30 equidistant numbers. But is it only for the floating? Uh, because I tried just for 10 to 100 in 10 steps. Okay. It's writing as 10 dot 20 dot. Ah, so the output will be in float. Because why that is? Because in many cases you will not actually get the integer. So the output of uh, uh, you know lin space is normally casted to float for precision. So here you see I am printing between what? 1 and 10, 30 equidistant numbers, right? So like that. So this might be useful. Um, are you able to run these things? Huh. So now comes the uh, uh, real thing, right? So dimensions, right? Huh. Thirty point. It won't. So if it is a whole number integer, it will just say 30. If you want to say 30, it will say 30, right? No, no, the answer is 30. No, 30 is the first starting point, right? You are, you are creating numbers between 30 and 100, right? So 30 is an integer. So it won't print 30.000, it will say 30 generally, right? See, uh, a little bit about dimensions, right? So, you know what is a dimension, right? So, normally we say there is one dimension, there is two dimension, and there is three dimension. Is there a zero dimension? Do you think there is a zero dimension? No. Theoretically, yes. <laughs> Practically, no. No, actually there is something called zero dimension. A dot is zero dimension, dot. Actually dot is called a zero dimension because there is no diameter or anything. In mathematics it's called zero dimension, zero dot. 
one dimension is what we created this array one dimension is what this numpy array we created right so you are saying 1 2 3 4 this is one dimension a two dimension is called a matrix not two anything more than two is actually a matrix three dimension three dimension is also a matrix uh, but See, when, when you visualize it, that's totally different. For example, if I want to visualize three dimension, I will say probably a globe is three dimension and a circle is two dimension. But in case of NumPy, uh, you can have two, three, four, five, any number of dimensions and you can visualize them also. Not like 3D and all, but normally in NumPy steps, right? So let's have a look at dimensions. Uh, here, if you scroll down, what are we doing here? I am creating an array. Can you see? These are the numbers I have. So, I just want to selectively, uh, you know, uncomment. That is why I am commenting everything, okay? <laughs> so, people are thinking like, why are you doing this? Yeah. So, basically what I am doing here is that I am creating an array, right? And what are the numbers? I have 32, 45, etc, 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 right? Now, one of the very common, uh, commonly used functionality in uh, NumPy is this reshape function. So, what is this reshape function? So, I am saying that data dot reshape 8 comma 3. What will happen? This will convert my NumPy array into a 8 by 3 matrix. So, you will have 8 rows and 3 columns. Can you see here? 1, 2, 3, 4. How many rows? 8 rows and 3 columns. So, how many dimensions this has? 2. 2 dimensions, but we will normally call it as a 8 by 3 matrix. Right? So, reshape is very useful. For example, I can say, I want to have something called data 2. I can say reshape. 2 comma 2 comma how many elements we have total 24 total numbers are 24 so I can say 2 comma 2 comma 2 times 2 is 4 4 times what is 24 6 I'll tell you so so right now let's say you do this this is three dimensional array how because I said reshape 2 comma 2 comma 6. What does this mean? Two rows, you cannot say two columns because it is three dimensional. Axis 0 will have 2, axis 1 will have 2, axis 2 will have 6. So if you look at the data, it will have two rows. One row, two row, in each you have 2. Each you have 2. And within each, you have six elements. Can you visualize? Hmm? That is how a three-dimensional array will look like. Well, it is not, uh, uh, I mean, important to visualize this. I mean, nobody is going to ask you, like, I'll give you a data, visualize in your mind. Uh, but sometimes your data, mathematical uh, calculations and all, right? The data will come in this format. The data will have a three-dimensional matrix format. Now, somebody was asking, so take a guess. If you want, you can do. Take Why a uh, hmm. Correct. 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 Right. 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 You can do. Now one more thing. Huh. No, no. This is actually three dimensions. Right. So this, this, when you do a reshape, you just pass three arguments, that means three dimensions are there, right? How do you visualize this is a totally different thing. So one way I told you that you can just imagine. So if I am looking at this six, this number six, it is in the first, so you have two, right? One, two. So in the first axis, okay, you have two columns. In that again, the first, the fifth element is this. That is how I have to access it. So there are three layers I am saying, three dimensions are there to this data actually. Hmm? Now what will happen if I try to do this, can you tell me, I, I say a 2 comma 2 comma 10. Error, absolutely error. Why? You can't fit, right? 2 comma 2 comma 10 will be what? How many elements? 40. 
how do you fit a 40 into a you know this so, so the shape actually matters so you have to say 2 comma 2 comma 6 then it should work right how do you make this four dimensional four four yeah so sometimes yeah so that's fine but sometimes it is more easy to add a one right that is four dimensional right so this is how four dimensions looks like christopher nolan stuff right well it is difficult to see but you got the idea right i mean the numbers are in more brackets you see more dimensions you have i mean i don't know how to explain this so some things are very hard to explain don't worry about four dimensions right now ah so so right now i think uh, 8 comma 3 is enough for us because two dimensions are easy for us to uh, work uh, which is data 2 uh, data 2 okay data is so you can do things like this for example what is data oh i didn't run reshape the problem is this all will get confused <laughs> end of the day so your original is data and let's say we keep it as data 2 i reshape it and let me just print it data 2 okay is it working yes that is working so i can do this i guess yes and i can print this ah, so this is very similar to your uh, uh, what you say pandas concept in pandas you remember we had a filter so same way what i am doing here i am saying that take data to what is data to your matrix percentage to equal to zero what so what am i doing even numbers right and if i just print it i'll get true false because it is getting applied on the matrix and I can just pass it as an argument to filter my data, right? So I can simply say data to even data. And you will get this. So you are getting only even numbers on the array. Just as an example, I'm saying. So what does percentage two mean here? So you are calculating the uh, whether the number is divisible by two or not to get the even. Uh, mod you can say right hmm. so whether I, I so this will pass through each element of the matrix right and the output necessarily uh, may not be the same structure because here it is properly 8 by 3 or something but not every element will satisfy the condition so here it can be a normal array output can be a normal array hmm. you also have a method called np dot zeros which can produce 50 zeros if you want right but this might be more useful because i can say np dot zeros 3 comma 5 plus 6 so what is happening you are creating a 3 by 5 matrix adding 6 to every zero so you will get a matrix like 6 and 6 this so these things will become handy when you start going further in machine learning okay so not right now you may be wondering why you have so many zeros but there is also a np dot ones method which can give you like ones, right? And I can say five by nine, any shape I want, right? Uh, what is an identity matrix? Anybody know what is an identity matrix? Ah, so if I'm creating a matrix, let's say four, right? Uh, Then what do you do? What is this? This is a identity matrix. What is the speciality? If you flip the rows and columns, the matrix will remain the same. So diagonal values are 1. 
right? That is called an identity matrix. Hmm? Now this might become useful, but you can actually create an identity mat matrix. I can simply say np dot i and just say five. Question to you, can I do a np dot i 5 comma 6? No, uh, don't run this, I just have a, so np dot 5 will create 5 rows, 5 columns equal, can I do a np dot identity of 5 comma 6? I want 5 rows, 6 columns. Yeah, so theoretically this does not work as an identity matrix. But strange it is, it will create a 5 by 6. <laughs> so some concepts are very confusing. <laughs> the command is trying to create an identity matrix, but this is not identity, right? Now this will become, right? So probably close one column and show to somebody, this is an identity. I absolutely have no clue why it is working. Don't ask me. <laughs> Okay, why? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> so, I've been trying to find out. I mean, God knows how it is working, but normally an identity matrix should have equal number of rows and columns. Then only the concept makes sense. But you can also say I want more columns and then it just adds. I don't know, maybe it works like that. Now, if you want to print something like, so what is happening here? I'm just filling the diagonals with the numbers, 1, 3. So, identity matrix will have ones, right? But in, in certain use cases where you want to, you know, fill it, you can actually fill it like this, right? Uh, well, that, that is all you need to know right now about NumPy, not much. Just understand that, uh, you know, that these operations are possible. So, um, see, when you, when you are building a machine learning model or something, right? So, let's say your customer comes to you and say that he gives you some data and you want to build an ML model on top of it. One thing that people do is that they will actually build the model and test and all, but it is always uh, very good that if you can come up with a story about the data. So, visualizations actually help you to make a story from the data set and then show to your customer or somebody. So, in Python, we have a library called the matplotlib, okay. That is actually the original library for visualization. Uh, but these days, it's very rare that you use matplotlib directly. We are using a library called Seaborn on top of it. So, Seaborn is the actual library that people use. Seaborn is built on top of matplotlib. And this has much more visualizations. There is also one more visualization library that's very popular. Tableau is BI, business intelligence. That is not this. So in Python, there is a separate library. There is a hmm? not SK learn. I'll, I'll tell you what it is. But mostly what we use is Seaborn, but I'm talking about an external library. So now let me ask you something. So let's say you have some data, okay? Let's say you have only integer. So when you say visualization, normally we say there is something called a univariate and bivariate. There is something called univariate and bivariate. Univariate means you are looking at a single variable and then you are visualizing the data. Bivariate means you are looking at two different variables and then you are visualizing the data. For example, let's take uh, the, the ages of people in this class, okay? So let's say I want to plot a graph, okay, considering all the ages of people in this class, okay? So that is my intention. I just want to plot a graph and I'm just considering only one thing, which is nothing but the age of people in this class. Oops, sorry. <laughs> So, so can you tell me what kind of visualization, not in Python, in general, if I'm asking you to plot integers, what will you do? What is, do you know any names or anything? 
So if you are having integers or floating numbers and if it is a single univariate, it is called a histogram. It is called a histogram. And how does a histogram look like? It will look like this. Okay? And you will see this kind of or like this. Ah, so here you will have the age of the people, right? So different different ages will be there. So let's say I don't know like 20, 30, 35, 40. Pie charts normally is categorical, right? Different categories you want. Bins. This is bins. So th this is a bin actually. So you will have an age between 20 to 25 or 25 to a bin and then how many people in that. So basically the idea is that you have an axis where the integer or the float, normally integer number is there and there will be sort of like a bin, right? A range, right? So 20 to 25, 30 to 35 and then how many are there in that. So I have like 5 people or 10 people. So you look at it, it will look similar to this. I will show you this practically but I am just saying normally. Now in the same thing if I want a string, so this is like people but let's say uh, I just want to draw a graph of people from this class based on the city you are coming from, say Bangalore, Chennai, that's a string column. What is that called? That's not a histogram. That's a bar chart, right? So that is a bar chart. Well, there is not much difference between these two. The only difference you can see is that here you will have, I don't know, Mumbai, Chennai, Bangalore and these bars will be separated. They won't be together. In a histogram, these are all together. Here you will have separate, separate, separate ones like Mumbai, Chennai, Bangalore because you are basically looking at a string column and saying that how many people are from Mumbai, from Chennai, from Bangalore. Categorical. Hmm? You will have spaces between the this thing, bars in this. That's why it's called a bar chart actually. So in univariate, normally you will draw a histogram or you will draw a bar chart. That's very common. Now let's talk about bivariate where you have two variable to compare. I want to compare. Which one? Uh -huh. So uh, usually we say uh, there is something called histo or you know the other one is bar chart, right? Now what if you have two uh, variables, right? Bivariate analysis. For example, I am just considering two uh, integers for example. I am considering two integers for example. So I am looking at the age of people and then the salary. So I want to compare age and salary. So both of them are what? Integer or float or let's consider them as integer. So what kind of plot will you do for this? 2D. Yeah, XY, XY is there always. <laughs> Yeah, who said scatter plot? It's a scatter. This is called a scatter plot. Why? Because your graph will look like this. Hmm? So you, here you will have, I don't know, age. Here you will have salary. Right? And then you will have people like this. Scatter plot. Hmm? So each dot will represent a person, a, a combination. So age of 30 and the salary, it will be like this, this plot. So you'll have a lot of dots like this. Now this is a bit uh, uh, confusing. Confusing in the sense the plot is good, but normally you just don't want to plot it. You plot it and it is in, in, in most of the statistical methods, you will learn statistics afternoon. What we do is that we try to fit a line into the plot. So you will fit a line like this. Why? Because this will show you the trend of your, uh, you know, analysis. By simply looking at a scatter plot, you don't know what is happening. There are so many things, right? So there are statistical methods using that you can fit a line. So now if I fit a line, the line is in the middle and it is like this. 
So this means there is a relation. As the age goes up, the salary also goes up. In some other scatter plots, when you do, let's say you are plotting something else. If you fit a line, the line will fit like this. That means there is no relation. So you have some commands and methods to fit a line using distributions. You can call a distribution and say that I want to fit a line to this and I will show you. So it will fit it and show you that what is the tendency of your graph, right? Uh, towards what side you have. So this is called a scatter, right? Mm. What if you want to do something else? You want to look at people who are coming from different city, bivariate analysis. You want to take a look at people who are coming from different city and then compare the salary. So I want to find out whether salary has an impact of a person who is coming from a city. So that is again bivariate. But what is the problem here? My variables are the city is a string and the salary is a number. What will you plot? You can't plot uh, this thing. Scatter will not work. Bar will not work by pie chart okay pie charts we are not discussing now that's off topic <laughs> i'll discuss that later so you may not four bubbles or you three bubbles for the chart for the... Uh, there is something called uh, you have three bubbles like you can plot each bubble like uh, bangalore uh, with, a, with a bubble with a mm -hmm. ah, uh, i mean so technically there is something called a box plot i mean this is what we use in seaborn so i am so there are thousand types of plots we are discussing specific to C bond, like uh, your analytics, right? So we, because you are learning for more from the statistical point of somebody, uh, if somebody asks you like, what kind of a plot? Your answer is block box plot actually. And I don't think maybe you have uh, seen box plot. It's very rare, right? Uh, but the idea is very simple. What box plot does is like this. So let's say there are three cities. Hmm? Uh, you, so city will be here, Bangalore, Chennai, then what is there? Delhi or Mumbai, something. Three cities and then you will see something like this. It's a weird uh, kind of plot. I don't know how many of you have seen this. Have you seen this kind of a plot? Probably something like this. Have you seen some weird a plot like this? This is called a box plot. But it is more uh, important to understand what it means, right? So, <coughs> by looking at it. So, uh, what it actually does is that uh, there is something called mean and median. You will know already. Mean is mean. So, what is the difference? Are they same? No. Median is different. For example, you are calculating the average salary of people in this class. We are all here. Now, let's say I invite Mark Zuckerberg to sit in the class. And then if you calculate the average salary, all of us will be millionaires. That is mean. Understood. What will happen? It will impact it. So, Mark Zuckerberg has billions of dollars salary. You calculate the mean, what will happen? The average class salary will be 10 million, 100 million, you know. You all can easily become millionaires. That's mean. But if I do the same with median, what it does, it will order the salaries in the ascending order and pick the middle value. You will get much more sense on the data, right? So in the box plot, what happens is that it will pick Bangalore, okay? And the salaries will be arranged in percentile in a median fashion and it will show you the middle value. So right now, if I look at, you can see that people from Delhi has more salary because this is the median of Delhi and this is more than this. So by looking at this, you can say that people from Delhi has more salary compared to people from Chennai, compared to people from Bangalore. So this will draw you percentiles, 25 percentile, 50 percentile, 75 percentile and box it like this. So when you have an integer and string, normally what we do is a box plot normally to get an idea, right? Now the point is that what if I want to further divide this into male and female? So going from you bivariate, I want three variates. So I want to look at Bangalore, Chennai, Delhi. I want to plot the salaries. Within that, I want male and female. 
So things will become more complicated. You will see some more like this. Here one more box will come. That's how the drop the thing will work. Because now again you are categorizing what? Male and female. But that's not a good idea because if you do three, four variable plotting, plotting will work, but you cannot make sense of what is happening, right? So, so the visualizations are not very powerful. But so normally we do univariate and bivariate analysis. Anything more than that is not typically a good idea to do, right? And that is exactly where your uh, ML and all are going to help, right? Machine learning and all. So for example, I have some sales executives and my sales are declining every month. So I want to know why the sales are going down. So I can easily draw a graph. I can say the age of my executive and the sales he is doing. That will give me a graph and it will show me that, okay, uh, probably the reason is age. But now I am thinking I want to include the age of the person, the sale and also from which city he is coming. Now I want to include age from which city is coming, is he married, how much distance he is traveling. So I want to include let's say seven or eight parameters. So you cannot draw that. That is where you say call a machine learning algorithm. Let this guy work on all these features, seven or eight features and then tell me why, why my sales are declining. That is where actually ML works, right? So basically you can say that it is an extension of your visualization. Not visualization but problem solving basically, right? So uh, sometimes I handle the intro to ML class and I give a very interesting example. But this is not related to visualization. Uh, so we, so normally people ask a lot like, what is machine learning? Can you explain it? You know, so people talk a lot about machine learning, but I always give them a very simple answer. So if you draw a quadrant like this, right? So let's consider four scenarios. So first quadrant is called a KK. So that means there are things which you know that you know, right? For example, um, you know Java, for example. So you are a Java developer. So you know that you know Java, right? I mean, that is your understanding. So first quadrant is where you have the knowledge of something which you already know. The second quadrant is KDK. Meaning you know things you do not know. So what is that? For example, machine learning. You don't know machine learning, which you know, right? So that is the second quadrant. So what will be the third quadrant? Yeah. Things which you don't know that you know. Right? I went to Kashmir and I went to this, uh, what you say, skiing. Right? Have you ever done skiing? No, right? Yeah. So I went to skiing and these guys fitted all these things to me and then normally what they do, they will come with you because you don't know skiing, right? And they will slowly, slowly make you ski. But for some reason, I don't know whether he didn't like me or not, he just pushed me from the <laughs> top. Then I was in the third quadrant. I knew I know skiing. I really skied. I mean, I, I never thought I know skiing, but he pushed and I, I'm like, oh my God, I'm actually skiing. Right, so, so the third quadrant is things which you do not know that you know, you learn from experience or feedback. Then what is the fourth quadrant? Huh? Things you know? Don't know that you know. No, that's already there, right? Okay. Maybe things, uh, yeah. Things which you don't know that you will never know, right? <laughs> well, yeah, so now how do you put it in perspective? So this is your normal analysis. This is like your SQL queries, you know, programming, right? Because uh, things which you know that you know. So you have some data, you want to write a SQL query, you know already the data is there, you know the query, you do everything. And the second quadrant is things you know that you don't know. For example, this is where business intelligence and all comes into picture, BI. For example, I have some data and I have a visualization tool like Tableau. So I'm plotting a visualization in graph uh, or graph. So things which you know that you don't know. So I have the last 
uh, year sales data. Uh, but I don't know whether my company is doing good or doing bad. So I use a visualization tool. It will visualize the data. After it does, I know that, okay, I know what is happening. Third quadrant is things which you uh, do not know that you know. So that's like a feedback mechanism. Hmm? So some of this uh, data mining and all will help you to do this. So data mining and all falls in this. This is machine learning. <laughs> Fourth quadrant is the gold mine. That is where you are. Meaning, somebody is going to give you some data and they are going to tell you that, tell me something which I do not know about this and I can never figure it out, which will help me as well. That's where you fit. And that's the actual definition, right? The machine learning is where you have some data and you have no clue. I mean, you already know something about the data, but you are trying to figure out something which is not possible through any three quadrant. <laughs> Right? You are trying to understand something which nobody can otherwise give you an idea about. So you are just going to get some data and then you have to get a useful insight from the data and then show. That's all you are doing in ML. So fourth quadrant is actually where uh, ML algorithms and all will come into play. So I usually give this example and that is why this is actually very costly. Right? The people who are working in this quadrant. So this may be the lowest salary. I mean, not generally, but then these guys might get more salary, more salary. This is the highest salary probably because. When do we use, when do we use plotting? For plotting these graphs, I'll show you. I mean, how do I know? Yeah, so we use only Seaborn. Plotly, we don't use much. So the only difference between Seaborn and Plotly is like Plotly can have this kind of if you hover your mouse and all, it will show the data. Seaborn doesn't do that. So if you do a plot, you can see the plot, it will not show the numbers. Plotly is much more interactive. Apart from that, not major differences are there between them, right? Um, so let's look into this uh, visualization also from the, uh, you know, notebook point of view. So you just need to upload a notebook. I'll tell you which notebook. Just go to upload. And in the desktop, you should have a notebook. Can you see this Python visualization? Just to open that. Upload it. Also, we need some data. So, I can say upload this uh, housing prices. There is a housing prices data. You can upload it. Both. One is the notebook, one is the data you are going to use. Well, I'm not uh, covering everything, but something which is important for you. So just run this first cell and also the second cell. So basically, what are we importing? We are importing pandas as PD. You are importing Seaborn as SNS, NumPy as NP, Matplotlib, Pyplot as PLT. So we are importing Matplotlib, Seaborn. And the last line you see, this Matplotlib inline. What this means, normally when you plot graphs, uh, the problem is that the notebook will not display that. Graph will be plotted, but it will not display on the screen. So you have to add this inline functionality, so it will display that in the cell. That is why we are adding this inline. And what we are, what we are doing here is that we are just reading the housing data and just look at the shape of the data. So this data set is actually quite complicated in the sense it has around 81 columns. Uh, lot of columns actually. So if I show you that, where is it? Housing prices. See, this has around 81 columns. So it's very difficult to show the whole columns. But what it actually has is that uh, this is the housing sales data from US. So you will have the square feet, number of bedroom, number of bathroom and all the properties of the house basically and the sale price and all right. So we have different different columns. 
you can actually do a head uh, to understand uh, how see so you have uh, lot frontage lot area street lot shape utilities pool area you know, these are all the columns we have you know? so many many columns are there so read the data you can also look at the columns so these are all the columns we have what is the foundation what is the basement square feet what is the basement exposure what is the bedroom square feet and all these things are there so you can actually are you able to read the data i mean load the data yes right yeah so let's look at a univariate analysis so what i'm going to do i am going to do a dist plot on the lot area column so lot area is a column which has integer kind of value and normally uh, in cases of uh, your uh, c bond when you want to do a histogram you will say dist plot dist plot is your histogram hmm? and it is very easy you will say sns dot dist plot and you will say i want to look at uh, lot area there is something called kde which is false i'll tell you what it is but if i run this this is how it looks like so this is uh, a histogram which is talking about uh, what the lot area and there is something called kde kde stands for kernel density estimate i'll tell you what it is it is false right now okay but can you make some useful inferences from this plot if you see this are you able to make any inferences from this plot no no yeah so what uh, one inference which i can make is that there are a lot of outliers in the data or what you say there is lot of skewness in the data meaning a lot of data is actually shifting here right i mean most of the uh, you know uh, data that is coming in this 600 or 500 range right this range actually and here also you have points but they are very very small so this is called outliers in the data outliers means uh, in some of the uh, machine learning problems and all you need to remove outliers right so a common example is like i said the uh, salary of mark zuckerberg like you know so if i am plotting the salary of everyone and if there is a millionaire or billionaire that's called an outlier because that may impact our overall you know analysis in some cases in ml algorithms we consider them as an outlier in some cases we remove them to to avoid uh, you know messing with the data so this actually has outliers this is actually shifting towards this side okay it's not a uniform distribution that we have that's one thing and if you keep this kde as true what will happen so let's keep this kde as true what is the way it is ha is the way it well this there is only one dimension x that is a lot area so you are you are taking the lot area and the lot area starts from 0 to let's say 2 lakh or something and then you are finding how many points are there so there are probably uh, 200 or more than 100 houses in this lot area 0 to 50 or something and then again this much like that right so these are the number of houses which has this lot area hmm? so if you run this with kde equal to true the only difference is that it will sort of like draw a graph kind of structure within this and try to fit all the points so the total will be 1 so you will learn about kde distribution later but basically what it tries to do is that it will try to fit all these points within sort of like a graph so that the sum is actually 1 if you add them together so kde is uh, a technique we use in uh, statistics more so how do we make it plot only in the 50000 yeah so only range of the x axis can we remove that range of x axis you can so right now you cannot there is a way to remove outliers i'll show you how to do that okay um so now if you are looking at this have a look at this here i am saying an sns dot count plot okay and what is the thing that i am ca- considering here exterior first and data is housing so let's 
just run this and see what it is. So, what is this? Can you tell me? What kind of a graph is this? Ah, it is a bar chart because what are you doing here? If you want a bar chart, you will say count plot hmm? and the exterior uh, the coating the exterior uh, you know uh, coating what what you are using that is this vinyl metal you know so these things. So, it will plot a, a bar chart like this. Now, what is the second line I have uh, added? So, if I just comment that I will tell you. So, this is useful. See the second line is actually what I am doing is that I am taking the x axis and rotating it a bit to fit the points. See now you have vinyl and everything, but you are not able to read them right because they are all cluttered. So, to remove that it is like a standard line of code you add this code you will say set x tick labels you will say get rotation 40. So, basically what will happen they will just spread evenly so you can read them. So, this line you can add if you just want to read them. So, right now you can see that most number of them are vinyl and least is what something else brick or something. So, this is how you plot a uh, what what plot is this bar right ok. Mm, give me so let us go to uh, yeah so have a look at this. Huh. So, what is this this is called a a uh, reg plot in case of uh, uh, C bond it is called a reg plot. So, what are you plotting here it is a bivariate analysis you are plotting lot area and sale price. So, you are thinking whether there is a relation between the lot area and the sale price and lot area and sale price both are what integers right both are integers. So, what is that it is a scatter right and what it will do is that it will fit a regression line along with this that is this regression line. This is the regression line that it fits. Now, I think I have added it. Uh, hmm, so, I have added it here. So, let me show you something. Uh, so, now again if you look at here even though this plot looks nice there are a lot of outliers look at this point right and look at this point. So, here is where the density actually shows it very clearly, but you have lot of outliers here. So, this is your sale price and this is a lot area. So, there are some houses like this where the lot area is very high and then the sale price is very low also and here you know you have some houses where the lot area is very less, but the sale price is very high right, but they can be very less not very more, but so you just want to remove the outliers you do not want them. So, there is a way you can do it. So, in C bond let me see if it works alone have a look at this code what I am doing there is a function called quantile there is a function called quantile what I am doing I am picking the lot area I am saying that I want quantile 0 0.5 0 0.95 0 0.99 what do you think this is doing this is finding the percentile. So, in the lot area I want to find what is the 0 0.5, 0 0.95 or 5th or 95th or 99th value if I arrange them in the median order. So, if I run this I can see uh, 0.5 is this, 0.95 is this, 0.99 is this. Now, there is a problem because uh, 0.5 is 9478, but when I go to 0 0.99 the value is very high 37567 etcetera right. So, because of outliers because that is very high. So, what is 0 0.5 this is your median median value is around 10,000 right, but your highest value is around 37 uh, 5. So, that means clearly there are some outliers in my data. So, if I want to remove the outliers I can do things like this I can simply say uh, I am again doing a, a plot, but I am saying that housing lock I just want to pick the lot area which is less than quantile 0 0.95. So, I am removing everything which is above 95 and if I do a plot now uh, ok. So, we need to housing sub right. So, data is housing sub if I do this now can you see. So, now what I did I just saved it as housing sub ok. Now, I am plotting again with lot area and sale price can you see it is much more you know what you say without outliers because 
I am considering only the data till 95 point and the points are much more you know uh, aligned together. So by looking at this graph you can probably say there is a uh, variation I mean the uh, you know line is actually pointing towards upwards. So you can say that as the lot area increases sale price also. So one way to remove your uh, uh, outliers is to use the quantile. So find out the quantile and get the median value then if you feel that uh, after 70 percentage every value is very high you say I want to filter it I don't want after 70 then put it and removing individual values I don't think that is possible like I cannot pick an individual value and remove it some of the values you can remove like this. No I just took 0 0.95 it can be any number so right now when I did the quantile I saw that 0 0.95 is 17,000 right so my median is 10,000 okay that is a middle so 20 up to 20,000 is fine so up to 0.95 I am okay but when I go to 99 it is huge difference so I just thought I will keep it at 95 so it can be any number so that you need to decide and uh, take a decision what number you want. I, I run here this line of code. This 0.5. So that is we need to decide. So that number is from 0 to 1. No, how do you decide? No, any data the numbers are same. 0.5 is 50 percentage. Yeah, I agree. So it is common for all the data. Any number of data you get. So let's say you have 1 million points. Okay. 1 million houses are there and price of 1 million houses. If I say 0.5 will give me the middle value, that's it. It will arrange them in the order and give me the middle value. Right. No, that is depending on the column. That is depending on the column, right. You are not looking at the whole data. So here, my analysis is on lot area. So I will first pick the lot area and run the quantile to get how the distribution is. So this quantile gives no, I am running quantile on the lot area column. It does not consider a data, it considers only lot area column. So, what it does is very simple. Mm. Ah, that is what. So, I am saying lot area, right. Lot area dot quantile and then I am saying let us say point 0.2 just as an example. Okay. So, what it will do, it will arrange the lot area in the ascending order. Hmm? So, lot area may start with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up to whatever number you have and then it will calculate the median of that. So, if I say 0.5 the middle value will be given, if I say 0.2 to uh, 20 percentile whatever value comes in that part will be given. So, then you can look at the data and say that ok 0.2 so this, this is roughly the 20th 20 percentage of the data if you reach at that point this is the value coming in. So, then you know right ok whether it is an outlier or I should remove it or not and then you can make a decision. Well, uh, that is up to you to decide how to make a decision but this is one way of doing it. Hmm. So, now you see this is much more uh, what you say. Okay, So, I just want to pick up one more interesting thing. So, basically what it is uh, if you look at the columns of our data there is something called square feet. There is something called square feet but uh, what is the original data? What is the name of the data frame we created? Housing. Insert cell above. Housing, is it housing? I do not know. Housing, right? Housing. So, when you look at the columns, right, uh, there are certain columns where the square feet comes into picture. Mm, let me show you. Where is it? Ha. Huh. So, here you have basement square feet. Here you have total basement square feet, then again some basement, then again some basement square feet. So basically what I am doing here is that by running this, I am just selecting all the columns where there is an SF. So you want to do some analysis based on the square feet. Hmm? Now imagine uh, I want to plot a graph where you know I want to plot multiple graphs. So, how many columns are there uh, with square feet? 9 columns. I have 9 columns where there is a square feet in it. Now, for each column I want to plot a graph Be because there is basement square feet, 
there is square feet of the kitchen, total square feet. For each I want to plot a graph, multiple graphs I want to plot but all in a single canvas, right. So if you want to do that, uh, let me split it otherwise. So basically this, if all names, ah. this is the function of the string actually. No, this is a, a list comprehension we discussed, right, x star x in list. This is called list comprehension because all of this is within a list, okay. So I can say column name for column name in housing dot columns. So basically what it does. Okay, it is actually for column names, it is ah. not for a data actually. No, no, no. For the housing dot columns, it will say if SF is in the column name, it will just return it. That's what and store it as SF underscore columns. So if I look at SF underscore columns, somewhere it will be there. SF underscore columns. You will get all the column names where there is uh, SF square feet written. So now my uh, problem is I just want to plot nine graphs in one graph, okay? Because I have nine square feet data. For each square feet, I want to plot a sale. Probably my customer is saying that I just want to know whether the square feet of my basement affect the scale, affect the sale or probably the kitchen square feet actually is affecting the total scale. I don't want the total, I want each area to be plotted. So how do you do it? Uh, but in order to show this, I need to first show you something before this. Hmm. So there is a very useful function. Uh, I don't know how to show this. Can I? reduce, ah. can you see? So what I did, uh, you have the notebook with you, right? Uh, there is something called a subplots. You can say number of rows 3, number of columns 3, fix size 10 by 10. Basically what it will do, it will return a canvas to me where there are 3 columns and 3 rows. Basically it is like a subplot. So what you are doing here, you have one canvas, within that there are like nine individual graphs within that. So the uh, command that you need to use is that uh, plot dot subplot, how many rows and how many columns and if you change this fixed size, the total size will uh, change, that is only what is happening. So if you run only this line, what you get is this plot and if I want to get the first graph, I can say 0, 0, then I can say 0, 1, etc. So if you look at this code. So here what I am doing is for i in range column and let me say, let me say if I want to print it, print rows and columns. Oh, I am, I just increase this font. <laughs> so now I think you are able to see that, right? Uh, yeah, let me see if it works, okay. Hmm. Have a look at what I am doing. This first line is basically plotting a canvas where you will have three rows and three columns. So totally you will get nine small graphs within that. Then look at this for loop. For i in the range of 0, comma length of SF column. What is length of SF column? Nine. nine. So I am opening a for loop. I am saying that the range is 0 to the 9, so 0 to 8. I am saying rows equal to i division 3, columns equal to i percentage 3. So what will happen for each, so this will basically if you run this code, it will print 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0. Can you understand how it is printing this? Because first i will be what? 0. So if you take 0, it will say 0, modulo 3, this one, you will get 0, right? Again 0, percentage 3 will be 0. So this is like accessing the first uh, graph. If I say 0, 0, I will access this graph. I will show you how to use in the code. But if I say 0, 1, it will access this. Again 0, 2 means it will access this, right? So I am just first writing a simple for loop. So I have the index positions to access the individual subgraphs, right? So basically if you run this code, you will get this. And then what are you doing? If you scroll down in this code, I will say 
rows and columns and again I will say I want to write a regex plot okay where I will say x equal to columns of i so this will start from 0 to y equal to sales price data is housing if I run this I should ideally get it can you see so basically what is happening here is that again you are doing a reg plot this is a reg plot only the only difference here is that you will say sf columns of i so what will happen initially it will be columns of i means it will go to 0 0 then 0 1 0 2 etc y sales price and data is this so you can plot multiple graphs so here you can see uh, probably you look at this second graph there is this basement uh, fi and sf2 the graph is very linear the the middle line right it's very horizontal so this means there is no impact on the basement fi and sf2 square feet with the sales price but if you look at the first graph you can see there is a very steep uh, climb so that means there is a impact on that right so you can also plot like sub graphs and all of you want so just to show you a simple example ah, so that is so you are plotting the basement area with sale price on each of this the y axis is actually sale price that is just right no so see it is a bivariate analysis right what do you mean by bivariate there are two variables what are the two variables one variable is sale price what is the other variable other nine variables are there square feet of basement square feet of this so for each this x axis is changing can you see this x axis is what basement sf1 this is what basement sf2 this is basement unit but y axis is same right sale price so for each square feet you are plotting against the sale so imagine like you have a house with 10 rooms for each room square feet you are plotting a graph so you have to pass the y axis right what is the y that's why i'm passing here sf column i which one sf column i this one right so basically here what will happen if i call this i so this is like the first if you run this for loop what will happen it will generate i showed you right ha ah, 0 0 0 1 yeah ah. so ax i'm getting so uh, probably the first time it runs so it uh, actually the first I is calling this uh, basement SF whatever is there this variable this column whatever you are having the column you are plotting on X you need something on the X axis right so each column name I am calling because my uh, you know where is that SF underscore column is a list so if I just print SF underscore column let me just print it okay uh, sf underscore calls right if I just print it it is just a list sf underscore call is just a list right from this I am calling the individual what values let me run it again then I will show you so this is the x axis right what is the x axis from sf underscore columns 1 2 3 4 each each one did you understand this give me one moment uh, let me go up uh, did you understand this this line no so this is where we created sf columns right i think probably you missed it see the point is uh, where is it if you go up my original data is called housing and if you look at the columns of housing I have around 80 columns right and in that there are nine columns which has uh, square feet so which are those columns uh, where is it in this yeah so this is one column it is called basement final uh, SF1 wherever you have sf that is square feet hmm? then you have total basement square feet so here what i am doing i am writing a list comprehension i am saying that i want to filter all the columns which matches sf and store it in something called sf columns and if i simply run this you can see the columns sorry 
these are the columns. So how many columns are there? Nine columns are there. From that I am plotting in x axis, that is what is happening here. Ah, so you are getting one by one, right? Okay. So there are uh, more visualizations, but we will not go to everything. I mean, uh, so you just need to have a basic idea, right? Okay. Oh, we didn't see that uh, this thing, right? Box plot thing. I think I removed it. There is a box plot. Somewhere it is there, right? Ah, uh -huh, here, here. But there will be one problem. Mm. Okay. So what are you doing here? You are saying that box plot. <coughs> You are plotting exterior and sales price, right? Mm. But uh, again, the same problem will happen here because if I do a box plot uh, at the x axis, if you look, uh, you are not able to understand, right? So you need to add that uh, line. Let me just get it from here. Where did we use it? Scatter we use, right? No, no, here we used this one, rotation. So I just need to add this, I guess. I scroll down. Yeah, so now if I add it here and then run it, ah, now it's more like it. No, it's not printing. Uh, should print, it right? You ported it to a plot. Sorry, okay, I should set it first, right? Where? It should work, right? Let me just keep it here. Sorry, sorry, I didn't get the second line you need to assign it to second line you should assign it to a variable then use that as a plot. Okay, okay, yeah. So sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah, what I meant. Got it. So why that because got it, got it. So you need to assign it first because why you need to assign it? Because the original plot cannot be altered. So you are saving it as a plot and then you are saying that on the label I want to change it. So this is how the box plot looks like. And what are we plotting here? You are plotting the material used for exterior painting against the sales price. Right? So you can see that. So what is the inference you can use from this? Uh, what do you understand by this plot? Make some inferences from this. Uh, outlier is fine apart from outlier what this tells you about the house so if somebody is asking so uh, how is the cost involved in this for example if somebody is using uh, vinyl vinyl is here right vinyl is here right then what do you have this is what metal right metal is cheaper right because here you have the different coating and there you have the sale price. So you can see that vinyl is actually you know very high. But also look at the length of this guy. That also matters. So this means, uh, what is this thing? I don't know, plywood or something? No. Cement. So this is very big. That means there are a lot of houses actually in this. That also matters actually. Right? And these dots you see, they are the outliers. In this box plot, these dots you see, right? They are the outliers. There is a way to represent them, but normally you see it as a dot. So probably, uh, you know, in this plot, most of the uh, ranges are here, but there may be outlier here. Actually, that is what you represent here. And if you look at something like this guy, this is very costly. I don't know what it is, something, but it is again very costly because the median value is very high. So you always look at this median value and see how the plot is actually going. That's a box plot. Hmm? This line, now this is a standard, uh, how do you say, axis representation. Oh, this one. Ah, so this one actually, so if you look at some of them, this actually encounters the outliers also. So it just says that this is pointing towards outlier. Some of the, in general, there is nothing to be done. The size actually matters. For example, this data is very big, right? 
So, if you look at this line, you can see that the total length is actually big and this one is very small because the amount of data that you have is very small. This one, which I do not know, uh, I do not think so. No, I do not think the length actually matters, the median line actually matters where it is. Median line is what actually matters where is it is, right. I do not think length, length actually matters. But general consideration is like if the amount of data you have is more then the length will be more, total line I am saying. These are the values that falls in that range. For example, uh, plywood these many values are there, you do not get a number but if this, if this, this box is bigger more values are there. Now, line is just a sort of visualization, this is actual values are here only. Because you look at this guy, this is very small right and this is bigger. So, box plot actually starts with two lines actually. No, 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 you should not consider this, you should consider this boxes actually, not these guys. And also in the middle what you see, this line what you see, that is a median value actually, right. This is the total range. This this is 50th percentage. Uh, yes, in this range. Oh, that is what you are asking. Yeah, so if you look at the whole graph, this is the minimum, this is the maximum. Okay, this is the minimum value, this is the maximum value and this is clearly an outlier and this is the uh, what you say median value that you have. So, most of the points are centered over here it seems. Okay, so a visualization I think basic visualization we have covered if anything is else pending that will be discussed in your respective statistics classes right. Because um, you should know what is the difference between let us say a box plot and a normal plot and how it looks like what is the use of it. Apart from that conditions and all later when you get the actual data you will be adding and discussing them, okay. What you now need to do is you now need to be able to get the data to solve this problem. So, therefore, the statistical way of thinking typically says you formulate a problem and then you get the data to solve that problem. The machine learning way of looking at things typically says here is the data, tell me what that data is telling you. Many of my colleagues and I myself have run into this problem when going for interviews etc. etc. and so uh, um, sort of statisticians say that um, uh, we are not getting jobs out there. And so, I go to, uh, go to people who are hiring and saying that why do not you hire statisticians. And I reach an interesting conclusion to this entire discussion um, that sometimes around the way the interviewer who is interviewing the statisticians for a data scientist job asks the question, um, here is my data, what can you say? And the statistician answers with something like, what do you want to know? And the business guy says, but that is why I want to hire you. And the statistician says, but if you do not tell me what you want to know, how do I know what to tell you? And this goes round and round, right? No one is happy about this entire process. So, there is a difference in the way these two communities approach things. My job is not to resolve that, because in the world that you will face, you will see a lot more of this kind of thinking than you will see in this Because in this world, the data is cheap and the question is expensive and you are paid for asking the right question. In this world, the question is cheap and the data is expensive, you are paid for collecting the data. So, sometimes you will be in a situation where this is going to be important. For example, let us suppose you are trying to understand who is going to buy my product. 
you're asking the question, let's say that my products aren't selling and you want to find out why, what will you do? Get what data? So let's say that you're selling, you, you're, I don't know, what do you want to sell? Um, you want to sell watches, say? So let's suppose people aren't buying, buying watches anymore, which is a reality, correct? So you're a watch company. Who buys watches these days? The entire business model of a watch is disappearing. Do you have watches? Some of you have. He has. Actually, a surprising number of you have. Maybe they do different things these days, right? That, that seems like a very... That, that, that's a fitness device. It's not really a watch at all. So, so something like this was actually with my daughter at lunch today. So she got something like this. I'm not sure my, 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 uh, my wife who's an entrepreneur runs her own company. She came back from Delhi. She came back with two of these. I don't know where she picked them up. So my, my daughter, the first thing she did, she took one of this and she took this thing out. Because she thought of the whole wristband as an unnecessary idea. <laughs> I mean, she, th that didn't occur to her. I mean, that's a separate thing. That's a nice little beautiful red wristband, etc. So a watch is a different thing, but let's say that you're a watch company, nobody's buying your watches, or fewer people are buying your watches. Now, how are you going to solve this problem? Or how, how are you going to process this information? What do you want to do? What do you want to know? <coughs> okay, but remember, <coughs> I'm asking this question also from an analytical perspective. So when you say that, to check the model and see what is not sold, that assumes the whole data question. So you'll, so first order, you'll see sales. For whom and when and how? How do you structure your data? How will you, how will you arrange the problem? <coughs> okay, that makes problems even harder because now you are going to look for data that isn't with you. No, no, he's right. He's right. He's right. Maybe people are not buying watches because they're buying something else. That's a reasonable thing. But let's keep this problem simple. Let's consider only data that is within you. We'll go outside, not to worry. But let's say that I'm looking at my data. What data do I want to see and what questions do I want to ask of it? Let's, so sales year by year, types, and then what comparisons do I want to do? Year on year. Year on year? Region wise. Region wise, age. With what purpose? What question am I asking the data? What section of uh, customers are buying my product or uh, what section of customers are buying my product compared to what? What has changed in terms of the What are my biggest set of customers? So that's so what that's one thing. Who who are my biggest customers? Okay. That's a very interesting question to ask, except that that question implies that I needed to know who my biggest set of customers sort of could have been. <coughs> but it's a good point. Where is the bulk of my sales coming from? Then someone else says something about time. You know, is it going, is it going down? So you can look at things like saying that for which group of customers are my sales going down the most? For example, you could ask that. I'm not saying that's the right question, but that's a possible question to ask. So let's suppose you follow that approach that I'm trying to understand. I know that my sales are going down. That's an obvious thing. My CEO is telling me, my CFO is telling me, and if I don't stop this, we're all going to be out of a job. Correct? The HMT factories in Bangalore are not in good shape. One of them, I think, has become the income tax office. Right, somewhere in the Maleshwaram area. So that's going to happen to me if I, if I don't do this well. So I know my sales are going down. But I don't know by how much and particularly for whom. So are there segments for which the sales are going down? Which segments are sales going down the most? In which segments are they going down a little bit? How fast are they going down? I can, question, I can ask questions of that sort. Now, what conclusions at the end of this do I want to be able to do? How do I need to, how do I want to use this information? Now, for this, you usually follow something like a three-step process. And you may have seen this. And this covers both these sides. And these words sh should, be, should be familiar to you to some extent. The first is called descriptive. The second is called predictive. And the third is called prescriptive. Have these words been introduced to you? At least in this, con at least, you've read it, I'm sure. You, you, you all cruise the web and look at blogs and things like that. Nothing new in this, I'm sure. 
But I just want to set a context because it's going to talk a little bit about what we descriptive. There's a C here. So descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. Now, what is a descriptive problem? The descriptive problem is a problem that says that describe for me where I'm, I'm losing my sales and when I'm losing my sales. It just describes the problem for me. It tells me where the problem is. It locates it. It isolates it. The predictive problem says, look at this data and give me an idea as to what might happen or what would happen if I change this, that or the other. So let's suppose I do the following kind of idea. I say that, let me relate my sales to my prices. Let me try and understand that if I reduce my prices of my watches, will more people buy them? Conversely, if I make my watches luxury items, increase the price of a watch, remove a low-end brand and make a watch an aspirational thing, a decorative item, a luxury item, a brand item, so that people wear a watch not to see the time, but also as a prestige statement, as a fashion statement, whatever it is, if I do this, then what will happen? That's predictive. I'm trying to predict something based on it. I'm trying to say if something happens to, let's say, one part of my data, what will happen to the other part of my data? And then based on that, the doctor carries out a predictive analysis of you. Because I see this, I now think you have this issue. You have this thing going on. Let's say I'm diagnosing you as being pre-diabetic. You're not yet diabetic but you are happily on the way to becoming a diabetic. Now because of this, I now have to issue you a prescription. I now should tell you what to do. So there is the data that comes from you. That data in some way is modeled using the domain knowledge that the doctor has. And that model has translated into, a, into an action. That action is designed to do something. Typically, it's designed to do something actually fairly complicated. The first action that the doctor tries to do is number one, let's say, do no harm, the Hippocratic Oath. First, let me make sure that, that I don't do any unnecessary harm to the patient. Then, let me, shall I say, optimize his or her welfare by making sure that I control the blood sugar the best and that I postpone the onset of diabetes as best as I can. It's a complex optimization problem of some sort. In a business also, it's a complex optimization problem. Right? I need to be able to sell more watches. But I also need to be able to make money doing so. I can increase my sales, but if I increase my sales and my profits go down, or my earnings go down based on the cost, then that's a problem. But at the same time, if I try to run a profitable business and nobody buys my product, that also is not a particularly good idea. Then there are other issues maybe in running the company. I've got employees that I want to keep on the, on, on, on the boards. How do I run the company in such a way so that it needs that particular labor force? I have finances to take care of. I have loans to repay. How do I get the cash flow in order to repay the bank loans that I have? So the prescription has to meet lots and lots of requirements. If you are building an autonomous vehicle, you'll have situations saying the car has to do this. <coughs> but it also has to follow certain other rules. For example, if it sees someone crossing the road, it should stop. But it shouldn't stop very suddenly. Because if it stops very suddenly, it's going to hurt the car, it's also probably going to hurt the driver. So it, can, it should, needs to stop, but it shouldn't stop too suddenly. It has to follow the rules of the road. Because otherwise the computer will simply say, oh, you want me to avoid the person crossing the road? I'm just going to go behind the person. And you're going to tell the car, please don't do that, because there's a house next to it. You can't just sort of do that, oh, you didn't tell me that. You just told me to avoid the person. You didn't tell me about the house. Okay, we'll put that as a constraint in our program and see how well it goes. So prescription is problematic. Hmm. Another simple way of doing it might be to say that description is how many centuries has Virat Kohli scored? Look up Crick Info and it will give you the answer. Prediction might be, try to guess how many centuries Virat Kohli will score in the World Cup. Prescription might be, how do we get Virat Kohli to score more centuries in the World Cup. And as you can figure out, 
you're going through a purely data-based version of the problem into something that's only no notionally about the data. Data will help you, but there's a lot more than the data when it gets to that. What we'll do today, what we'll do now, once I've finished talking to you, is we'll, we'll take a look at what descriptive, what the, the descriptive part of analytics is. So the descriptive part of analytics is talking about simply describing the data without necessarily trying to build any prediction or any models into it. Simply telling you the way it is. This is hard. This is in itself not necessarily an easy thing to do because you need to know very well how to do that and what are the ways in which one looks at data. This is skillful in itself. So, for example, let's suppose that you are, you, you're the, I'm, you're a doc, you go to the doctor and the, the doctor is looking at you, looking at your symptoms and the doctor recommends a blood test. Now, how does a doctor know what blood test to recommend? Based on the symptoms. Based on the symptoms. But remember that potentially there's an enormous amount of information in you. All of us as biological things carry an enormous amount of information in our, in our blood, in our neurons, in our genes or wherever. You know, if you're talking about big data, as I said, there's two meters inside every cell and there are a few billion neurons in your head. You don't need to go far to see big data. You are big data. You are one walking example of big data. We all are. Right? Now, in that big data, what little data does the doctor know to see? That's a descriptive analytics problem. The doctor is not doing any inference on it. The doctor is not building a conclusion on it. The doctor is not building an AI system on it. But it's still a hard problem. Because given the vast amount of data that the, that the, that the doctor could potentially see, the doctor needs to know that I, I, this is interesting to me and this is interesting to me and this is interesting to me. And this is interesting to me in this particular way. For example, a blood test. Let's suppose that I draw... I draw blood from you for a particular purpose, let's say for blood sugar. Correct? Leaving aside the biology of how much blood, etc., etc., to draw, um, just neither, none of you, I guess, are a doctor. Any of you are doctors here? Any doctors in the room? No doctor, so I can say whatever I want to. You won't understand what I'm saying. Anyway. No, no, but so, but I'm, I'm old enough that this is a real problem for me. So, you have, a, you have a large amount of blood that's flowing through you. We all do. This blood carries nutrients. What that does is that every time there is a nutrient inflow, the blood looks a little different. So if you eat, your blood looks a little different. Because that's your blood's job. The blood's job is to carry nutrients. So if you want to run, you want to walk, if I'm walking around, my legs are getting energy from somewhere. The energy needed to my legs is being carried from the blood and it is being generated through inputs that I get. Some of it because of the air that I breathe, from where it gets the oxygen to burn things. Some of it from the food that I've eaten, the nice lunch that I had, where it gets the calories to do that. So therefore, based on what my energy requirements are and based on what I've eaten, my blood is not constant. My blood content is what is known as a random variable. What's random about it? Because it looks a different, it looks a little different all the time. Your blood at 12 o'clock is going to look a little different, 12 o'clock at midnight is going to look a little, little different from 12 o'clock at noon. Because it's doing something a little different. The same phenomenon is there everywhere. If I were to, for example, measure the temperature of the oil in your car or in your two-wheeler, what do you think that temperature will be? It depends. First of all, it depends on whether the car is running or not. It depends on whether it has run or not. It depends on how much oil there is. It depends on how you drive. It depends on the temperature of the car. The answer is it depends. And the same is true for your bodily fluids. So this becomes a slight problem. Because if it is random, then from a random quantity, how do I conclude what your blood sugar is? How does a doctor reach that, reach a conclusion of any sort? 
average of what? Average of particular duration. So there are multiple averages that you can get. First of all, there is a question of saying that if I take blood from you, how is the blood usually collected? So the phlebotomist comes and usually takes an injection from one point. Let's say by some strange accident, this is thoroughly inadvised, but let's say by same some strange accident, two different people are drawing blood <laughs> from two hands at the same time. Do not try this at home. <laughs> but let's suppose they do do this. Will they get the same blood? Ideally, Ideally yes. yes. Ideally, yes. 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 It depends. What time? Same time. Same time. <laughs> right, at the same time, as I said, do not do this at home. But at the same time, you're getting two different samples. There's not just a question of time. Your blood is not going to look the same even within your body at one period of time. Ooh. Even from the left hand, even from the right hand at exactly the same period of time, it's not going to look the same. There is a slight, there is a slight problem that's somehow a little obvious that, that you know, your, your, your heart is in the middle. Right? Your heart is actually in the middle, but it beats to the left. Why? Because the, the heart is what? The heart is both a pump and a suction device. The pump side is on the left, the suction side is on the right. So your blood pours out from your left side and it goes back in on the right side. So there's a slight asymmetry in your body between left and right. One side tends to go out, the other side tends to come in. It's slight, it mixes up all in the middle. <coughs> so one sampling idea is that I'm taking a sample of blood from you and it's just one example. The second question is, as you were saying, it's a question of time. So you can average over time. Now, if you average over time, this is a little easier. You can say, I'm going to do this maybe before eating, after eating, a little after eating. So for those of you who have blood pressure tests, for example, oh, sorry, blood sugar tests, once they ask you to do it, fasting. And then they ask you to do it some two hours after eating. Do they tell you what to eat? Sometimes with glucose, okay. sometimes they don't. They, they sort of say that based on what you naturally eat, let me figure out what you are processing. They expect you to eat a typical meal and not go and eat, you know, large amounts of KFC if that is not what you normally eat. Just eat what you normally eat. If you're a vegetarian, eat normal vegetarian, eat normal food and then figure it out. Let's see how, how good your body is at trying it out. So it's saying, do a normal thing and I'll take another normal sample. Then one of you said something very interesting. They average things out. Now what does averaging do? Neutralize. That's an interesting word to use. Neutralizes things. Provide a general idea. Provide context. Provide context? Context of what? Context, that's a good point. So, so what is the doctor trying to do? So let's, let's simplify things a little bit and say that let's suppose that the doctor has a threshold. Let's give it a number. Let's say the doctor says that if your blood sugar is above 140, I'm going to do something. If your blood sugar is say less than 140, I'm not going to do anything. I don't know whether this is the right number or not, but just let's make it up. Now the doctor is going to see from you a number. It may be a single reading, it may be an average, it may be a number of things. How is the doctor going to translate what they see from you and compare it to the 140? How is that comparison going to be made? Maximum number of people normalizing the value. So let's suppose I have just one reading. So let's suppose that I have one reading and that reading, oh I don't know, is 135. I've just got one reading from you, 135. What does that tell me? No test required. One, argu one argument is, it's simple. Let's take a very machine learning computer science view to this. 135 is less than 140. Ha. Ah, so now he's saying, yeah, but you know what? Let's say that 135 and another guy who say 140, 120, there should be something that says that this 135 is a little bit more trouble than 120. Closer to the threshold as he says. So maybe in other words, this threshold isn't quite as, as simple as I thought it was. So I can solve this problem in one of two ways. One way to do this is to make this 140 a little range. 
This is something called fuzzy logic. Right. In other words, the question you're asking becomes fuzzy, not as crisp. You're not fiddling with the data, you're fiddling with the boundary, you're fiddling with the standard. The other way to do that is to create a little uncertainty or create a little plus minus around the reading itself, around 135. Saying that if this is 135, and let's suppose that I go and get another reading, and the second reading that I get is say 130, and the third reading that I get on the day after that is say 132, and I'll say, okay, seems to be fine, I might say. But let's suppose after 135, the guy goes and I do go my usual thing and I measure it again. And this time it comes out as 157. <coughs> and I do it again. And it comes out as 128. And I do it again. It comes out to be 152. So in both cases, 135 was probably a good number, but in one case, 135 was varying very little, and in the other cases, 135 was varying a lot. Which gives me different ideas as to how to process it. So what descriptive analytics talks about, essentially, is trying to understand certain things about data that helps me get to conclusions of this kind a little more rigorously. Now, to be able to quantify what these plus minuses are is going to take, a, take us a little bit of time and we will not get there this residency. We will get there next residency. To say that in order to, in order to say, it's not 135 but 135 plus minus something, that question now needs to be answered. But to do that, I need to have two particular instruments at my disposal. One instrument that I need to have at my disposal is to be able to know what to measure. I need to say what does an error mean. I need a statement that says that maybe I am 95% confident that something is happening. I am 95% sure that this is below 140. I need a way to express it and that is the language of probability. So what we will do tomorrow is we will introduce a little bit of the language of probability. It will be sort of unrelated to what we are doing today. So there is going to be a little bit of a disconnect. But what we are going to do is we are going to create two sets of instruments. One instrument that is purely descriptive in nature and one set of instruments which is purely mathematical in nature so that I can put a mathematical statement on top of a description. And the reason I need to do that is because the pure description is not helping me solve the problem that I have set itself, that I have set. So therefore what will happen is you will see in certain medical tests you will not see points like this, you will see intervals. Your number should be between this and this. Your cholesterol number, your HDL whatever should be between this and this. You won't see a number, you will see a range that typifies a variation. And in certain cases you will see thresholds and maybe they are, it's just a lower limit or an upper limit. But you will also see a recommendation that says, please do this again. In other words, I'm going to compare, I can't compare one number to, to one number. One number to one number is typically a very bad place for any kind of analyst to be in. Because you've got no idea of which is error prone and where the error is. So therefore what happens is you try to improve one of those numbers. And so either by fiddling around with the range or by getting more measurements. And you'll do that and you'll see that as we go along a little later. So this is a context for, <coughs> for what we have. Uh, in terms of, in terms of data, let's see. So this is a set of files that has been loaded. Uh, it's a very standard set of files. It's not mine to be honest. Uh, I just want to make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So for reasons that are more to do with security, my understanding, the notebook will not access your drives. So keep it on your desktop and not complicate life. So, uh, and there is this notebook. It's called cardio goodness of good. The word statistics refers to the idea that this is, comes from the statistical way of thinking. 
which as I said opposed to the machine learning way of thinking is tends to be a little more problem first, data next, which means we worry about things like hypothesis and populations and sampling and questions like that. And the descriptive part refers to the fact that it is not doing any inference, it is not predicting anything, it is not prescribing anything, it is simply telling you what is there with respect to certain questions that you might possibly ask of it. Now, what is the context to the case? The market research team at a company is assigned the task to identify the profile of the typical customer for each treadmill product offered by the company. The market research team decides to investigate whether there are differences across product line with respect to customer characteristics. Exactly what you guys were suggesting that I should do with respect to the watch. Understand who does what. Entirely logical. The team decides to collect data on individuals who purchase a treadmill at a particular store during the past three months. Like watches, they are now collect, looking at data for treadmills. And that is in the file, in the CSV file. So what you should have is, you should have a CSV file in the same um, directory and through the magic of Python you don't have to worry about things like path. Before we get there, remember because we are looking at this statistically, before we get the data we should have a rough idea as to what we are trying to do and so they say that here are the kinds of data that we are looking at. The kinds of products, the gender, the age in years, education years, relationship status, annual household income, average number of times a customer plans to use a treadmill each week, average number of a customer expects to run walk each week on a self-rated fitness scale on 1 to 5 where 1 is in poor shape and 5 is in excellent shape. Some of this is data, some of this is opinion, right? some of this is opinion masquerading as data like for example number of times a customer plans to use a treadmill, right? hopeful, wishful thinking, it's still data, you are asking someone how many times will you use it? Her rose, daily, no problem, 7 times a week, oh we will see. Huh. But it is still data, it is come from somewhere. So, so what has happened, the way to think about this is to say that I want to understand a certain something and the certain, some, certain some, something has to do with the characteristics of customer, uh, customer characteristics and to do this you can then use either, you can either take let us say a marketing point of view, who buys? You can also take a product engineering kind of view, what sells, in other words what kind of product should I make etc. In business as you probably know for those of you, any of you entrepreneurs? One hand up, there are one hand up, they are closet entrepreneurs from what I could figure out. Right. Sometimes it is unclear what that word means, in other words you think you are or you are not confident enough to call yourself one or you are doing that. Uh, in, in IT space, if you are an entrepreneur for example in, um, in, in physical product space or even in software space, one of the things you often think about is what is called the product market fit, which is you are making something, how do you match between what you can make and what people will buy? Because if you make something that people do not buy, that does not make any sense. On the other hand, if you identify what people buy and you cannot make it, that also does not make too much sense. So, the conclusions that we will draw on this, we will not draw on today. But the purpose is to be able to go towards the conclusions of that kind, either isolate products, isolate customers and try and figure out what, what they tell us. Pandas generally has a fair amount of statistics built into it, that is what it was originally built for. NumPy is something that was built more for mathematical problems than anything else. So some of the mathematical algorithms that are needed are there. There are other stats type plots in Matplotlib or Seaborn and many other things that you have seen already. Um, Python is still figuring out how to arrange these libraries well enough. Uh, the, the shall we say the, so the, the programming bias sometimes shows through in the libraries. So I for one do not remotely know this well enough to know what to import up front. But a good session you know what to import up front and you do all this up front. So you do not get stuck with what you want to do. 
The naming is up to you. If you like the names as they are, then that's fine. If you want a standard set of names. So when you wrote the data set, if this is in the right path, just this will work. Dot CSV. It's usually smart enough to convert Excel forms into CSV. In other words, if you have this as XLS and things like that, it's usually smart enough. But if it isn't, then just go in and save an XLS file as a CSV file and operate that way in case it doesn't do it on its own. But more often than not, what you see is that when you, when you, when, when Jupyter sees it, it will see an, any XLS file as a CSV file or go and make the change yourself. Or you can have other XLS, other read statements uh, in it as well. You can change functions inside it and you can figure out how much to head. What this tells you is there's the head and the tail of the data. This is simply to give you a visualization of what the data is. Um, this gives a sense of what variables are available to it. Um, what kinds of variables they are. We'll, do, we'll see a little bit of a summary after this, etc. So for example, some of these are numbers. Income, what is income? Income is annual household income, that's a number. Some, for example, let's say gender, male, female, this is a categorical variable. This is not entered as a number. It's entered as a text field. If you are in Excel, for example, right at the top, if you go in and you see that, it will tell you how many distinct entries there are, how many distinct settings there are. So usually what happens right at the beginning and a data frame like this, if it is created, this is a data frame. If a data frame is created, when it gets created, the software knows as to whether it is talking about a number or whether it is talking about categories. <coughs> there are certain challenges to that. You can see one particular challenge to this. Um, what does this 180 mean? It counts. Why do you think there are so many decimal places that comes here? 14 years of experience, 16 years of experience. Why is it going 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0? Because I No, that's because mean, median, and By default, Yes, it does this because it sees other numbers where those decimal places are needed. So what it does is, what any software typically does is, when it sees data, it sort of says that at what granularity do I need to store the data. Sometimes this is driven by your computer, your 64-bit, your 32-bit and things like that. But what it does is, it means that the data is stored in the data frame to certain digits. Now usually you don't see that, you'll see it in this way. But sometimes, for example, when you say include equal to or and you, and you ask for a full description, the data comes out in this slightly irritating way. Because of something here, because of let's say the income field or any of that. Now, when it recommends, when it looks at the descriptions of this, what is the description that it is reporting and how does it choose to report out the description? So in this particular situation, so let's take a little bit of a closer look at this. <coughs> One thing here, look at the way it's done here. So count, unique, top, frequency, and then there are certain things here. Mean, standard deviation, minimum 25%, 50%, 75%, and max. When it sees a variable like gender, it reports out lots and lots of NANs. What does that tell you right off the bat? It can't do that, which means it's not a number. This is not a number. In other words, if you ask me to find the mean of something and you're giving me male and female as inputs, I don't know what to do, which is an entirely reasonable stand to take for any reasonable algorithm, right? It, it requires another kind of description for it to work. But the problem with describe this syntax is that it's asking for the same description for all of them. Whether it's in significant digits, whether it's in columns, etc, etc. So it's chosen this description and it says that that's all that I'm going to give you. 
But where it makes sense, let's say for example, I look at age. Now for age, I've got 180 observations. And it is calculating certain descriptions for it. Correct? So what are the descriptions it is calculating? Let's look at these. It's calculating a description like say minimum. Minimum is what? 18. Maximum is 50. These are easy to understand. Then, let's look at something a little interesting. Suppose I want to report one number, one representative age for this data set. This is like asking the question, how do I get a representative blood sugar number for you? I can give you a minimum and a maximum. But to do the minimum and the maximum, I need to draw blood many, many times from you. But let's suppose I want, to, this is, I want one representative age for you. Somebody asks you, what is your blood sugar? You want to give them one number. Similarly, somebody is looking at this data and asks the question, give me a representative age. How old is your typical user or what age do you want to build it for? Or you're even asking, a, you're even asking let's say, a product question. You're a product designer. And a product designer building a treadmill. Now, how do you design a product? Those of you are engineers? Based on? Based on the weight. Now, very good. What weight? Whose weight? Huh, who's the user? What is the weight of the user? He's got a good point. As a, as a design engineer, I need to know what weight will be on that treadmill. Now, what, what is, is the answer, answer to that, that question? question? Max? Max? Users who visit the gym. Huh? So there's a question of saying that if I want to measure a variable by one number, how should I even frame that question? What makes sense? What is a one uh, average? No? Max? In this particular case, you might argue the max is the is the right number because I want to be able to say the, if I can support him, I can support anyone. But there's also a downside to that. I've now engineered that product. I, you could argue that I have, shall I, shall I say, over-engineered that product. Correct? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry? Factor of safety. A factor of safety? Okay. <coughs> All right. So let's suppose that you are, you are doing this for a mattress. You all sleep on mattresses. We're all relatively wealthy based on the fact that we're here. So we probably sleep on a mattress. Not everyone's fortunate enough to sleep on a mattress, but let's suppose you do sleep on a mattress. How much weight should that mattress be designed to bear? If you over-engineer it, what will happen is that number one, for, for, for a reasonable weight, let's say weight a lot below that, that mattress is not going to sink. Let's say that you design it for 100 kilos. Now if you're 50 kilos or 60 kilos, that mattress is not going to sink for you. Because it's going to feel comfortable for someone who is 100 kilos. And for someone who's 50 kilos, you're just going to bounce on it. You're not going to feel a soft silkiness or whatever it is you want to feel from the mattress. It won't work. So what to do? So that's a hard problem. It's a description, but it's a hard problem. Who do I engineer it for? And so therefore, for, uh, people have different ranges of what I mean to represent it. So here's one version of it. This is what is called a five-point summary. I report out the minimum, the 25% point, the 50% point, the 75% point, and the maximum. Variable by variable, I report five numbers. I report the lowest. What does 25% mean? 25% of my data set or the people are younger than 24. The youngest is 18, 25% or a quarter of them are between 18 and 24, a quarter are between 24 and 26, a quarter are between 26 and 33, and a quarter are between 33 and 50. This is what is known as a distribution. This is what is known as a distribution. Statisticians love distributions. They capture the variability in the data and they do all kinds of things with it. So I'm going to draw a typical shape of a distribution. We'll, we'll make more sense of it later on. 
this is a theoretical distribution a distribution for example let's say has a minimum has a maximum has say a 25 percent point has a 50 percent point it says 75 percent in terms of probabilities there's 25 percent here 25 percent here 25 percent here 25 percent here if you want to think in terms of pure description this is not a probability it's just a proportion if you want to think in terms of probabilities what this means is that out of 180 people out of 180 people if i draw one person at random if i draw one person at random there's a 25 percent chance that that person's weight is going to be below below 24 sorry age 24 correct if you want to think in terms of probabilities we'll do that tomorrow but this is a description so what this description does is it gives you an idea as to what value to use in which situation so for example you could say that i'm going to use 20 26 as my representative age if i do that what is the logic i'm using this this 25 percent this 50 percent point so to speak this is called the median this is called the median and we'll see it median means the age of the average person first sort take the middle person and ask how old are you the age of the average person i could also ask for the average age of the person which is what which is the mean which is 1 over n x1 plus xn now this is algebra what you have to do is you have to put n equal to 180 this is the first age the second age the third age up to 180 1 by 180 age 1 plus age 180 this is called the mean this value is what 28.79 the average age is about 28 years or 28 and a half years 28.8 years but the age of the average person is 26 yes the difference between the two So I described the median as the age of the average person and I described the mean as the average age of a person. <laughs> now he's looking at me like saying you have to be kidding me, right? <laughs> That's confusing. I admit to it. The easy way to understand it could be this. What is the mean? Add them all up, divide by how many there are. What is the median? Sort them from the smallest to the largest, pick off the middle. If they are an even number, what do you do? You take the average of the two middle ones. If they are the same, it will be the same number. If they are not, it will be a number between them. So sometimes the median may show up with a 0.5 or something like that for that reason. If there is an integer counts, but there are an even number of counts. Now, which do you think is better? Ah, you are giving the right answer. It depends. You will figure out that I like that answer. <laughs> they both make sense. They both make sense. It depends on what, what context you are going to use it for. <coughs> In certain cases, yes. It, it, it's, it's, the, it's the age of the average person, it's the reading from the average person. So, what is the parameter we are saying? It is the average person, how we are getting that average? Okay, so if, if you're talking in terms of parameters, so he used an interesting term. He's saying, What is the parameter I'm after? Parameter is an interesting word. Parameter refers to something what generally in a population, it's an unknown thing. 
that I'm trying to get after. For example, blood sugar is a parameter. It exists, but I don't know it. I'm trying to get my handle on it. Correct? So if I'm thinking in terms of, of, of parameters, then these are different parameters. So let's let's look at a distribution here. I'm not sure whether this will pick up things. I hope so. So the median is the is the median is a parameter such that on this side I have 50% and on this side I have 50%. This is the median. The mean is what is called the first moment. What that means is, think of this as a plate of metal and I want to balance it on something. Where do I put my finger so that it balances? It is the CG of the data, the center of gravity of the data. You can understand the difference between these two now. If for example, I push the data out to the right, what happens to the median? Nothing happens to the median because the 50-50 split remains the same. But if I push the data out to the right, the mean will change. It will move to the right. Your lever, the lever principle, right? If there's more weight on one side, I have to move my finger in order to counterbalance that weight. So these are two different parameters. If the distribution, for example, is what is called symmetric. Symmetric means it looks the same on the left as on the right. Then these two will equal. Because the idea of going half to the left and half to the right will be the same as the idea of where do I balance because the left is equal to the right. So when the mean is not equal to the median, that's a signal that the left is not equal to the right. And when the mean is a little more than the median, it says that there is some data that has been pushed to the right. And that should be something that you can guess here because the mean and the median to some extent are what? 24, 26, etc. The lowest is 18. That's about 6, six years, 8 years less than that. But what is the maximum? 50. That's 25 years beyond. The data is pushed to the right a little bit. Instead of saying pushed to the right, the right technical term is right skewed. Hmm. There, are, there are, shall I say, people are more not average on the on the older side than on the younger side. There was a hand up somewhere. <coughs> yes. I was just confused with the statement that median would not move, but then you explained it. Yes. So, so therefore, one reason that the median often doesn't move is because it is not that sensitive to outliers. So let's suppose, for example, we look at us, us, us and we ask ourselves, what is our mean income or our median income? And we have that. Each of us make a certain amount of money. We can sort that up and, set, and put that in. Now let's suppose that Mr. Mukesh Ammani walks into the room. Now what is going to happen to these numbers? Mean is going to go up, right? He alone probably makes a very large multiple of all our incomes put together. Possibly. I don't know how much you make. I know how much I make. <laughs> but what's going to happen to the median? It's going to stay almost the same. The typical person may move by at most half. Because what is a typical person going to be? The typical person is going to be an actual individual in the room or maybe an average of two individuals in the room. And that person is not going to change. Yes. Yes. That, that's, that's one conclusion we can draw, draw on this. There are other plots below which will also show the same thing. You are not being able to draw that conclusion. Well, good logical reason. I haven't shown you the full data. Huh. We'll see the history and we'll do that. So hold on to that question. The conclusion was drawn is that there are two pieces, there are two things to do. See here. One is, if I simply look at this without seeing any more graphics, where is the middle of the data from a median perspective? At 26? Correct? Now, from 26, look at the difference between 26 and the smallest. 18. Between 18 and 26, that's 8 years. This 8 years contains 90 observations because there's 180 total. Now, what is on the opposite side of this? 26 to 50. That's how many years? 24. 24 years. This 24 years now contains how many observations? Same 90. So there are 90 observations that are between 18 and 26. 
and there are 90 observations between 26 and 50. So if I were to draw a picture, what would, what would that picture look like? Yes, exactly as you are drawing it, right? This usually by definition is called right skewed. This is a problem that BABI has. Does this mean it's left skewed or right skewed? As a word, right, it's called right skewed. More data to the right. More data. Uh, oh, sorry, more data is a dangerous word. Ha. Huh. No, that's it's the same number of observations. I, I'll say the data is pushed to the right. Hmm. More variation on the right side. More variation on the right side is probably a safer way of putting it, yes. So skewness is often measured in various things. One measure of skewness is typically, for example, mean minus median. Mean minus median, if it is positive, it usually corresponds to right skewness. Mean minus median negative usually corresponds to left skewness. This is a statistical rule, but sometimes it is used as a definition for skewness. There are many definitions for skewness. Skewed data sometimes causes difficulties in analysis because what happens is the idea of variation changes. Being va variation on one side means something a little different than variation from the other side. Um, by the way, uh, what's happening to you with respect to things like books? Are you getting books? Are you not getting books? Are you have no idea what the books are? You got one book, which is what? Which is the statistics book? Okay, I'll take a look at that book later. So, <coughs> this book, right? Okay, show me the book. Okay. Comment 1, very nice book. Comment 2, not a Python book. Right? That doesn't make it a bad book. So, if you're looking for help on how to code things up, this is not the right book. Get a book like ThinkStats or something like that. But, if you want to understand the statistics side to it, it's an excellent book. So everything that I'm talking about is going to be here. I might talk about which chapters and things like that at some point. And I might talk about how to use this in the book. So for example, at the back of this book, there are lots of, there are tables. There are tables at the back of this book, which we'll learn how to use. And then I'll try to convince you that you shouldn't use them. But remember, many of these methods are done in ways in which either you don't have access to computers or if you do have access to computers, you don't have them, shall we say, at runtime. In other words, when I want to run the application on it, I can build a model using a computer, but I can't run it within one. The runtime environment for statistics is often done when there are no computers around. The build environment can include computers, but the runtime environment cannot. A lot of statistics is done under that kind of situation. Even yes, very much so, very much so. Okay, so definitions of skewness and things like that, do it, do it in the way you usually use a book, which means you go to the index and see if the word is there, and then you go back and figure it out and it will give you some ideas as to how that works. It's, it's a nice book, it's one of the best books that you have in business statistics, but it's not necessarily a book that will tell you how to code things up. That is not a deficiency of the book. Not every book can do things of that sort. There are other books around that will tell you how to code things up, but will not explain what you are doing. It's important to know what you are doing. It's also important to know why you are doing it. But books can't be written with often everything in mind. Yes? Can you suggest some book that which tells us how we can think that way? The thinking is here. I think this is good for thinking. I, I would absolutely recommend this book on the thinking side. Because the problem is lies that in which situation what we need to apply. Yes, it. yes. And that answer I think is very, very good here. Where you won't get is it will say do this and it won't give you the Python syntax to do it. That, that will not be here. So if you can solve that problem through some other means, I used to have a colleague in, in corporate life who had a very big sticker on his board. It said, Google search is not research. Right? Now nobody agrees with him anymore. <laughs> so I suppose that when in doubt, you do what normal homo sapiens do today, which is you Google for an answer. Hmm. So one possibility is that you, ex you, you, you understand something from a book such as this and if you want to understand the syntax, just Google for the term. Say Python, that term, whatever, it will probably give you the code. 
things are very well organized these days. Um, there's also the question, and I should give you a very slight warning here, not to, not to discourage you from anything. But in the next nine months or thereabouts, the, the, the duration of your program, there's going to be a fair amount of material that will be thrown at you. Correct? The look and feel will sometimes be like what we would, what we would often call at MIT as drinking from a fire hose. You can if you want to, but you will get very wet. Huh. So therefore, pick your battle. If you want to understand the statistic side of it, please, please go into the depth of it. But if you try to get into equal depth on every topic that you want to learn, that will take up a lot of your professional time. Now the reason we do the statistics part first, one, it's, it's a little easier from a computational perspective, although harder from a conceptual perspective, so we begin it this way. But hold on to that idea and then as you keep going, you know, see if this is something that you want to learn more on. And if you can, you're welcome. Just write to us or let us know or let anyone know that Hoyta has just come in, let her know and we'll get the references to you. But if you want to, for, say for the first two residencies, please read the book and see what happens. If there are doubts, Yes, but it's a, it's a well written book. It's, in, it's, it's, it's instructor is one of our colleagues here. You know, if you want, you know, we can also help explain things. So, all right. So, this is the summary. What did the summary tell you? The summary gave you what's called the five numbers, five numbers that help you describe the data minimum. 25, 50, 75, max. We'll see another graphical description of this. It also described for you a mean. There is also another number here. And this, is, this number is indicated by the letters STD. STD refers to standard deviation. STD refers to standard deviation. And what is the formula for a standard deviation? STD is equal to the square root of little bit of a mess, but two steps. Step one, calculate the average. Step two, take the distance from the average for every observation. Ask the question, how far is every data point from the middle? If it is very far from the middle, say that the deviation is more. If it is not far from the middle, say that the deviation is less. Deviation being used as a synonym for variation. I'm talking about variation. Variation can be more or variation can be less. More than the average, less than the average. If someone is much older than average, there's variation. If someone is much younger than average, there is variation. So therefore, both of these are variation. So what I do is, when I take the difference from the average, I square it. So more than x bar becomes positive, less than x bar also becomes positive. Then I add it up and I average it. There's a small question as to why it is n minus 1 and that is because I'm, I'm, I'm taking a difference from an observation that is already taken from the data. Now I have squared. When I have squared, my original unit was in age. When I have squared, this has become age squared. So I take the square root in order to get my measure back into the scale of years. So the standard deviation is a measure of how spread a typical observation is from the average. It is a standard deviation, where a deviation is how far from the average you are. And because of the squaring, you need to work with a square root. In, in, in sort of modern machine learning, people sometimes use something called a mean absolute deviation, MAD, MAD, very optimistically called. So what MAD is, is, is you don't take a square, you take an absolute value. And then you do not have a square root outside it. And that is sometimes used as a measure of 
how much variability there is. So why it is square then? Why, why is it? Why we do it just We square it because we want to look at both positive and negative deviations. If I didn't square it, what would happen is it would cancel out. What was the word that one of you used? Neutralize, right? I love that term. Your positive deviations would neutralize your negative deviations. So I went to so this x, x minus x minus. Yes. So uh, it should be like x minus x minus. And if you are seeing the positive and negative. This number is going to be positive if say x1. So let's look at the first number here. So if I look at the head command here, when I did the head command here, what did the head, what did the head command give me? The first few observations. So now this is an 18 year old. This is probably sorted by age. This is an 18 year old, correct? Now I'm, try, I'm trying to explain the variability of this data with respect to this 18 year old. What is the, what is the, what, why is there variation? This 18 number is not the same as 28. And 18 is less than 28. So what I want to do is I want to go 18 minus 28.7. What I'm interested in is this 10. This 10 year difference between the two. Now the person, the oldest person in this data set is how old? 50. When I get to that row, this 50 will also differ from this 28 by 22 years. So I'm interested in that 10 and I'm interested in the 22. I'm not interested in a minus 10 or a minus 22. I can do that. I can do that. In other words, what I can do is I can look at, I can represent 18 minus 28 as 10 and I can represent 28 minus 50 as 22. And that is this, as I said, 1 over n minus 1, absolute x1 minus x bar plus plus absolute xn minus x bar. That is this with n minus 1. And this is done, as I'm saying. This is what is called mean absolute deviation. And many machine learning algorithms use this. You are correct. In today's world, this is simpler. Now, when standard deviations came up first, this was actually a little harder. But people did argue about this. I think, well, 150, maybe more about, so I forget my history that much. There were two famous mathematicians, one named Gauss and one named Laplace, who argued as to whether to use this or whether to use this. Laplace said you should use this. And Gauss said you should use. Now the reason Gauss won was simply because Gauss found it easier to do calculations. Why is this easier to calculate with? Because Newton had come up with calculus of, you know, a century or so before that. And so, for example, let's suppose that you want to minimize variability, which is, a, which is some, something that we often need to do in analytics, which means you need to minimize things with standard deviation, which means you need to differentiate. This function, the, the square function is differentiable. You can minimize it using calculus. This is not. So therefore, what happened was Gauss could do calculations, but Laplace could not and Laplace lost and Gauss won the definition of the standard deviation. We haven't much used 25% or 75 so as in, as in okay uh, okay why do we not do that so today this entire argument makes no sense because today how do we minimize anything our computer program you don't use any calculus. You ask, you run fmin or something of that sort. You basically run a program to do it. So therefore, this argument that you can both do calculations equally well with this as in as in that. So today, what is happening is that Laplace's way of thinking is being used more and more. This one is a lot less sensitive to outliers. This one, what it does is, if it is far away, the 22 squares to 484 or something like that, which is a large number. So the standard deviation is, is, is often driven by very large deviances. Larger the deviance, the more it blows up. And so therefore, this is often very criticized. If you read, for example, the finance literature, there's a guy called Taleb, Nassim Taleb, or he writes his book called The Black Swan and Fool by Randomness, where he left and right criticizes the standard deviation as a measure of anything. 
So today, this argument doesn't make a great deal of sense. And when in practice something like this makes sense, it's often used. So a lot of this is done historically. It, it looks this way because of a certain um, historical definition and then it's not, it's hard to change. So today in, the, in you know, centuries after Gauss, sad people like me are trying to explain it and having trouble doing it. Because there's a logic to it, right? I mean, and that logic doesn't hold at all anymore now. Yes. Standard division in simple terms is uh, that PP, hmm. how far uh, generally is that from the median? How, how, far, how far on the average is an observation from the average? Confusing statement again. He's again going to be unhappy. But how far on the average is an observation from the average? If that answer is zero, that means everything is at the average. But you're asking the question, how far from the average is, it, is an observation on the average? If I take your blood pressure, how far from your average blood pressure is this reading? If this is exactly equal, then I don't need to worry about variability. Every time I measure blood pressure, I'll see the same thing. Hmm. What is your average bank balance? Don't tell me that, but, <laughs> but, but you know what I mean, right? You have an average bank balance. Your, your bank account manager or your bank actually tracks this. What your average bank balance is. Hmm. But you're not actually, you, your balance is almost never or very, very rarely equal to your actual average bank balance. It's more and it's less. How much more, how much less is something that the bank is also interested in in order to try and figure out, you know, how much of your money, so to speak, to get out there. Because the bank is going to make money by lending it out, correct? But when it lends it out, it can't give it to you. So it makes an assessment as to how much money, makes, I don't want to get into finance now, but you get the drift. Huh. So therefore, there it is a measure of that. It is not the only measure of that. So for example, here's another measure. So you remember this 25 number and the 75 number that you're asking about? Let's say that I calculate a number that looks like this. Let's say 33 minus let's say 33 is a 75 percent point minus 24. So 33 minus 24, let's say this is my 24 and this is my 33. Between this how much data lies? 50 percent. Why? Because this is 25 percent and this is 25 percent. This now contains 50 percent. This is sometimes called the interquartile range. Interquartile range. Big word. Right? Now, why is it called an interquartile range? The reason is because sometimes this is called Q3 and this is called Q1. Q3 stands for upper quartile. You can understand quartile, quarter. So upper quarter and this is the lower quartile. And the difference between the upper quartile and the lower quartile is sometimes called the interquartile. Why is it called the range? Because what is the actual range of the data? The range of the data in this particular case is 50 minus 18. And 50 minus 18, which is your max minus your min, this is simple, sometimes simply called the range. Range is maximum minus minimum. Interquartile range is upper quartile minus lower quartile and these measures are used. They do see certain uses based on certain applications. You can see certain advantages to this. For example, let's suppose that I calculate my five point summary. With my five point summary, I can now give you a measure of location, which is my median and I can give you two measures of dispersion, which is my interquartile range and my range. So those five numbers have now been twisted to give me a summary number which is the median and a range number. <laughs> Interestingly, I can also draw mental conclusions from that. For example, I can draw conclusions from these five numbers in the following way. 
24 and 33 half my customers are between 22 and 24 and 33 so if I want to deal with half my customers I need to be able to deal with a range of about nine years within this nine years is all that I'm interested to get this right so if I'm building my if I'm building my my, my machine I'm going to make sure let's say that the 33 year old is okay with this and the 24 year old is okay with this will the 50 year old be okay with this no yeah, may not be but if I want to make the 50 year old okay with this I'll have trouble with the 18 year old so I can do a lot with even these five numbers we'll see more descriptive statistics as we go along by the way this is only for age I can do this for you know usage I can do this for fitness I can do this for income I can do this for miles income is interesting here's the median income fifty thousand dollars and the mean income about fifty three thousand dollars if you see income in almost all real cases the mean income is going to be more than the median income the per capita income of India is more than the income of the typical Indian say what does this command do if I say my data dot info what this is doing is my data first of all is a data frame that I created just to review I read the PDF file this way now this is a describe and this here is info now describe and info in the English language are similar things description and information Hey, this is interpreted in the software as two completely different things information is like your variable setting it's like your integer field your real field is setting like that is giving you information on the data as data the word data means different things to different people to a statistician data means what to a statistician data means a number to an IT professional what does data mean bytes information you know I've lost my data I don't particularly care what the data is I've lost my data so this is that information it tells you tells you about the data it's an object this is description it's a 64 bit stored integer it's an object so it tells you about numeric categorical it tells you about the kind of data that's available non null fields in other words there are objects in the field etc there are so many integer types which are stored at 64 because this computer is probably capable at 64 and there are three categorical variables this is a this is shall we say a data object summary of the of what is there in that data frame not a statistical summary useful in its own way particularly if you are processing it and storing it for those of you who are going to go into data uh, sort of curation like careers this kind of a database is a nightmare because typically what happens is when you store real data you in, in addition to data you often store what's called a data dictionary sometimes that's referred to as metadata data about the data because simply storing a bunch of numbers is not enough you have to say what the numbers are about this adds a layer of complexity to the metadata you now have to store not only what the variable is about but what kind of a variable it is so many professional organizations say is that archival data should never be a mixture of both numerical and categorical objects and they pay a price for that numerical things should become categorical or categorical things become numerical but what happens is if you are storing large volumes of it and archiving it and making it available for people who have not seen it before it sometimes gets convenient so therefore fees like this are often useful to see how big a problem you have okay. now I want to plot a few things to plot you can plot anything Simon I think is coming a little later but this plot this is from matplotlib library and it is plotting through a command called hist hist means histogram which you've already seen you've covered histograms right I think yeah. you've seen histograms so this is a histogram now histogram as a syntax has bin sizes and figure sizes so what you can do is you can play around with these and see the differences in what this histogram does but there's a certain default that shows up and that default is quite good 
And here is a histogram distribution of the age. This is not a set of numbers. This is a picture. This is a picture. What does this picture have? This picture has a set of bins and it has a set of counts within each bins. Between these two numbers, between say 10 and whatever this is, let's say 22 or thereabouts, I have a count of let's say 17. So it gives a count and it does this by getting a sense of how many bins there are and plotting this shape. It's a little bit of an art to write a histogram program. There, there's, a, there's a Python book out there, I think things started one of it, in which sort of the first one third of the book is basically how to write a histogram code. It's a wonderful book, but because it treats this example, it got terrible reviews. Reviewers said, why do I want to learn how to code a histogram? And the book's author is, I'm teaching you how to write a code. A histogram is an, is an example how to do that. And I tend to agree. If you want to test yourself of your understanding of data and your understanding of any programming language and any visualization language, code a histogram in it. Hmm. And have fun. So, so it, it, it's, it's a nice challenge from many perspectives. The data challenge, the language challenge, the visualization challenge, all of that. Yes. Many companies do that. That they, that they want archival data to be of only one data form, only one format. Why is that so? Because, as I said, when you store data, how do you store it? Let's say that you've generated analysis. The analysis is done, correct? And you've decided not to destroy the data. You're going to keep the data in your company's databases or in your own database. How will you keep it? You can take a technology. Let's 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 pick an example. Let's say what's it? Pick an example. SQL, Excel, whatever. Let's say Excel. Let's say I keep it in Excel. Now, if I keep it in Excel, what will I now do? So let's say I have an Excel spreadsheet. Let's say my cardio data set. Let's say this data set. Now, in addition to the data, what do I need to store with it? Yes, metadata. How do I store that metadata? Yes. So one possibility is I can have a text file like that, like I had at the top of this, describing all of this which is typically what happens in Excel storage. It describes this and it describes, there's one file called .dat and another file called .disk or something of that sort, which basically describes the variables and the idea is that they have the same name and one extension gives you the data, the other extension gives you the description of the variables that are in this data. Correct? Now this is good. Now what's going to happen? On that data, certain code has been run. That code is going to assume certain things about the data. What do you want that code to assume about that data? Whatever you want that code to assume about that data should be available in the data dictionary. Now, if that code is stable enough to realize that whatever fields you give me, I will run on, that's cool. But if that code requires you to know what kind of data is being used, let's say discrete data, let's say continuous data, in the future, you'll be doing things like linear regression, logistic regression. Linear regression will make sense if the variable is a number. Logistic regression will make sense if the variable is a 0 or a 1. If you have that problem, now in the metadata, you need to be able to tell not only what business information this variable contains, but also what kind of a computational object it is. So the code can run. So therefore, what people often say is that I'm going to make it very simple and I'm going to assume that my entire data frame consists of only one kind of variable. So that when I run any algorithm on it, I know exactly what kind of data input that algorithm is going to get. But I'm saying it's a practical answer that many companies often, often have. And I've worked in a couple of companies, at least one company where this was very seriously done. So we had to, we had to when we put data back in, we had to convert it. And for the, in the situation that I was in, it wanted everything in categories. So what we would do is we take continuous data and we would do what's called fine classing, which means that we would divide not into four pieces, but into 10 pieces. Decile one, decile two, decile three, decile four up to decile one. And every variable was stored now, not in its original numbers, but as 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So let's suppose that I tell his income is nine. What that means is I know he's in the ninth decile. 10% of the people, or more have income more than him 
80 percent have less than him he's in that bracket and all variables were stored that way now what happens is every algorithm knows that every variable is going to be stored that way and you can keep writing algorithms that way otherwise what would have to happen is every algorithm would need to be differently and let's say you're doing credit scoring let's say you're doing CRM models you're doing something of this sort and you've built a very sophisticated CRM model that tracks your customers and it works now suddenly you've got a new variable coming in the Twitter feed and suddenly nothing works what to do go back and rebuild that entire model that's going to set you back three four months that's going to set you back a few thousand dollars so you say no any variable that has to go in has to go in in this form and if it goes into this form my algorithm can deal with it so well in such case it might not affect the I mean the efficiency of the model that we generate okay. yes yes and in practice I'm going far away from topic now in practice and professional analyst has to struggle between doing the right thing badly and the wrong thing well. You want to do the right thing well. But the right thing well is going to cost you time, money, data and everything. So you struggle between saying that <coughs> I'm going to get a flawed model quickly built on a new data set or I'm going to get an inefficient answer on a model that's already been built and let's see how far it goes and so these are more cultural issues with how a, an, an analytical solution is often deployed in companies they vary very much from industry to industry they vary very much from um, company to company from the culture of a company to a culture of a company they depend on regulatory environments in certain environments an auditor like entity comes in and insists on seeing your data show me your data let's say in finance this is sometimes happening regulatory agency let's say Reserve Bank of India goes into a bank and says show me your data all this NPAs etc show me your order book show me your loan book correct and now that has to be done and the decisions you made have to be done in a way that is patently clear why you have done this so very often people say I don't want to make the best risk decision I want to make the most obvious risk decision which may not be the same thing at all but I'm being audited so that's a practical question and, and I don't have a clean answer to that but I do know what happens is it right no it's not but we live in a world that has that kind of imperfection my uh, one of my teachers, his name was Jerry Friedman. You'll see some of his work later on. He came up with algorithms like projection, pursuit, cart, Mars, gradient boosting. He created many of the algorithms that you'll be studying. One of my teachers at Stanford. When he ran our uh, consulting classes, he would say this. Solve the problem, assuming you had an infinitely smart client and an infinitely fast computer. After you've done that, solve the real problem. Where you do not have an infinitely smart client and you do not have an infinitely fast computer. This was in the early 1990s where computer speeds were a lot slower. And we didn't have powerful machines like this around. So a lot of this is done in, in that kind of situation where, where you are uh, where you are struggling for continuity when you're figuring it out. Imagine yourself as an analytics manager, and I hope many of you will be, and you have an analytics team sitting in front of you correct you're looking at them and you're looking at them in the eye and you know how much you're paying them and you know that half of them are going to leave at the end of the year what are you going to do with regard to the modeling and things like that your first order of business is going to be to ensure continuity in some form keep it simple right keep it simple keep it obvious for the next bunch of people who are going to come in and for that you'd be willing to trade a little bit of make it right so now the new person coming in will now not want to solve a very complicated kind of situation this is not where you want to be but and I do not want to depress you on day one but it's also the fun part of the profession right it's also what makes it interesting and ex sort of interesting and exciting right? so it's not all bad 
Okay, so the histogram command summaries of what these histograms are and each gives you a sense of what the distribution is. And as you can see from most of these pictures, most of these variables, when they do have a skew, tend to have a right skew. Maybe education has a little bit of a left skew. Maybe education has a little bit of a left skew that a few people are educated and most people are here, but even so. Right. Now here's an interesting plot. Um, Matplotlib has this as well, but Seaborn has a better version of it. This is what's called a box plot. You've seen a box plot? This is a box plot. Um, people are unsure as to where this box came from because there's a statistician called box who's used this before but this box came from it used to be called a box and whisker plot these are the whiskers this whisker will go this is this is the median this is the upper quartile the top edge of the box the bottom edge of the box is the lower quartile The end of the whisker is 1.5 times the interquartile range above the box. Right? If you want a formula, Ooh. sort of the whisker, the length of the whisker is 1.5 times IQR. Should I have a break now? A little bit maybe, huh? So we'll, okay, 3.45 or whatever, we'll go up to there. I, I, yeah, I haven't stopped, I just got distracted. So, 1.5 times the, if a, so it goes up to that. If a point lies outside it, the point is shown outside it. If the data ends before it, the whisker also ends. Correct? What is the whisker? Okay, what is the whisker? All right, let me explain another way. The whisker is the maximum. The top of the whisker is the maximum. The bottom of the whisker is the minimum. Okay? Not okay. Okay. Some of the points are outside. So, this point here, now what is this plot here? age for males. So what this means is this is the minimum 18 or whatever it is and this is the maximum 48 or whatever it is. Minimum and the maximum. So if you see nothing else on the box plot, no other points other than just the box and the whisker, then your five point summary is sitting there. That's it. Right. Now what happens if you see points like this? Outliers. What is an outlier? An outlier is a point that lies more than 1.5 times the interquartile range above the box. So this whisker will not extend indefinitely. It will go up to 1.5 times this box and then it will stop. And if any points are still left outside it, it will show them as dots. You can treat this as a definition for what an outlier is. Same thing, same thing in the other direction. The logic is symmetric. No, no. That means this mean it hasn't, it's, the data is ended here. The data is ended here. Was there any other number tried instead of 1.5? I suppose so and you can change it. You can, I won't try it now, but you can go to the box plus syntax and change that. So you can go to box plus syntax and you can change that 1.5. It's not hard coded into the algorithm. I'm, I'm, I'm I think, 95% sure. As a statistician, I'm never sure about anything. <laughs> but, but I, but I, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a parameter in the, in, in, in the. Uh, you should be able to pass the parameter in the box plot function. Default is 1.5. Hmm? So you should be able to change it. And, uh, what's the color part? Is that the median? Which one? Thank you. Color. Color? Oh no, these, these two colors? These two colors are because I've asked for two things. I've asked for male and female. If I if I had three of them. That's okay. But 
Oh, this is Q3. The lower is Q3, and the upper is Q, sorry, lower is Q1, and the upper is Q3. So this is the quartile range. Quartile range. So, so for males, between the bottom bottom whisker to the end of the box is a quarter of your data. The box is half your data, and the top of the box to the end of the whisker is quarter of your data. So the middle line is the, the middle line is the median. <coughs> the middle line is the median. There is also a function in box plot you can play with where it will give you a dot. And that dot is the mean. I mean you can you can you can ask box plot to do that. But a, but a mean is not a general standard component in the five point summary. It's a different calculation, not a sort. But if you want to, you can make box plot to give a dot on the mean as well. By definition. It, yes. So, so mean median. So half the data is between um, twenty-four and thirty-four, or whatever that is. Half of all my all the men in my sample are between those two numbers. You, I think box plot doesn't allow you to change the shape of the box. I think that is set. That's sort of central to the idea of a box plot. It does allow you to fiddle with the size of the whisker, but I don't think it allows you to fiddle with the size of a box. In other words, if you change that to something else, let's say the 20% point to the 80% point, 80-20 rule, that's no longer a box plot. It's another interesting plot. The significance of it is exactly this, as we have seen before. The significance of it is, is that the data looks like this. It's right skewed. Think of the picture. So if this is your Q1 and this is your Q3, this is your Q2 or the median, then the median is going to be closer to Q1 than it is to Q3. In the same way that the minimum will be closer to the median than the maximum, same idea. This is a summarization for numbers. If you want to summarize for categorical data, what's called a cross tab or a cross tabulation this is simply how many products are there product category 195 498 and 798 they've got three kinds of treadmills and they're trying to understand which who was using what kind of treadmill our business problem is to understand who was using what products this is a cross tab what is this this is something that will be used for categorical variables no box plot will make sense here there are no numbers. So now you can ask interesting questions here if you want to and you can think about how to answer it. Is that for example you can ask the question is there a difference between the preferences of men and women? Possibly. Is there a difference in the products that they that the, <coughs> irrespective of gender is there a product that, that they prefer? You can ask all kinds of interesting questions and you can find ways to answer it which we will do not in this residency but next time around. For those we can categorize it also? Categorize? For those preferences? So this is simply once again this is descriptive. All this has done is it has simply told you the data as it is. What I'm saying is that if for this if you want to do a little more analysis on it you now have to reach a conclusion based on it. So for example one conclusion to ask is is that is that do men and women have the same preferences when it comes to the fitness product they use? Now that's a question. To answer that question, it's enough to look at the data. But just looking at it will not give me the answer. I need to be able to find a statistic to figure that out. A statistic that does what? That in some way measures that difference. Let's say measures the difference between men and women or what we will do is not measure that. What we'll do is we'll measure that if there was no difference between men and women, what should this table have looked like? And then we'll compare the difference between these counts and that table. But that's the interesting part of a statistical statistic, which we'll do. That's called a chi-square test. It's coming up in the next residency. But that's the prediction part or the inference part of this description. This is just the description.
You can do a similar thing here. This, for example, is for um, marital status and product. What product you use? Are you not very dependent on whether you're partnered or single? What is marital product versus product? Maybe it has to do with age, or maybe they're correlated. Should you use one as opposed to the other? Okay. You can use counts as well. If you say instead instead of instead of doing it this way, instead of seeing it as a table, if you want to see it as a plot, you can ask for counts. So there are things like count plots and bar plots, which allow you to do counts. In the lab, you'll do probably a few more of these. This is simply another visualization of the same thing. Uh, for those of you who like things like pivot tables in Excel, hmm, so Microsoft has made you know wonders of us all. In corporate life, they were to, I was told that you know you can have a you can have a masters in 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 bachelor's and masters in anything. Engineering is good, etc. And it's nice if you have if you have you know PhDs in a few areas. But what you really need is a PhD in PowerPoint engineering. I mean that's a necessary qualification for success. Huh. So certain tools have been used. So therefore, those tools have been implemented in many of these softwares as well. This is the pivot table version of the same data set. This is the last sort of well, not last, but still this is, this is a this is a plot. Uh, let me show you this plot and then we'll end or we'll take a break. This is a plot that is a very popular plot because it is a very lazy plot. This plot requires extremely little thinking. Pair plot of a data frame. Right? You don't care what the variables are. You're telling it nothing about the plots. You're simply saying, figure out a way to plot them pair by pair. And it does that. So for example, how would you read this plot? On this side, so it creates a matrix. The rows are a variable and the columns are variables. Hmm. What is this? This is age versus age. Age versus age makes no sense. So what it plots there is a histogram of age. Doesn't like the gap. Nature abhors a vacuum. I suppose Python does as well. <laughs> So, so, so it'll now plot a what it should have plotted is age versus age. It, you're right, it should have been a 45 degree line. Hmm. But a 45 degree line is a useless graphic, particularly if the same 45 degree line shows up in all the diagonals. So, to make a more interesting graphic, it plots the histogram there. This analysis. This kind of analysis sometimes has a name associated with it. The name is univariate. Univariate means I'm looking at it variable by variable, one variable at a time. When I'm looking at age, I'm only looking at age. It's called univariate analysis. It's just a word. Uni as in uniform, same form, unicycle, cycle with one wheel, things like that. Univariate. Uh, unit. But for the other set of data also, will it replicate the same kind of pattern? If I'm going to give the other set of data. Another set of data? It will replicate the same, it will replicate the same nature of the data. There will be histogram here again. So, yes. So, what it will do is, remember that this graph, the nature of the graph, so let's let's see this. So, where is gender here? Where is gender here? Is it there? Is gender is gender in my data? It is there? So, when I did pairs plot my data, 
what did he do with gender yes remember in info when we did info here remember how it had stored the data no, not any n here so it had product gender and marital status it had identified as objects in the data frame when it had formed the data frame so now what does it tell you about the about the command the pair plot command yes it will it will ignore those objects so in answer to your question if the data frame has been stored has been captured with integer 64 integer, basically integers or numerics in it it will plot if it's only objects it will probably give a null plot yeah say again age is not why like that this is the histogram this is the same plot this plot is the same as which plot this one it's the same as this one here no this is not age versus age this is just age age versus age would have been a 45 degree line but it's not plotting that it's not plotting that in the diagonal it is not plotting age versus age in the diagonal it is simply plotting age's own distribution with yes with the count so what it is doing is it is essentially running hist on age on all each observation and putting it on the diagonal yes so can we on the like 20 to 25 20 there is a bin. From each bin, it's a count. It's a count of the number of people who are in that age group. Here, this is age. No, this is miles. This is age. This is age. So, say, let's say between here, between uh, let's say uh, forty point five and uh, 43.5 or whatever these numbers are there are three people it's a remember the histogram is a visual thing you can data mine a histogram if you want to which means you can you can find out what those are and you can see it inside inside histogram just ask for a summary of that it will give you what the features are of that histogram but the histogram is not meant to be used that way it's meant to be used as a as an optical device it's to see the shape to see the count it's an art to do a histogram. If you change the bins a little bit, the histogram will look a little different. So I would suggest that unless you've got a lot of experience in this, or you really enjoy the programming, do not fiddle with the histogram. Its shape will change. I'll show you a little later after the break. Not change the histogram, but what shape is. No, not, not in default. You can go in and change it on size, hmm. but the bin width, etc., the bin width of histogram takes a little more to change. Right? So you can you, there, there is stuff out here. You can find other things in which you can play this. So there are ways to do it. Okay. So quickly ending, we are losing our food. So these different plots, and we'll continue after the break. The rest of it is simply an X versus Y. So for example, this is age versus education. This is age versus education. education. So the second graph from the first one is just rotated. This, yes, he's right. If this is education on the Y axis and age on the X axis or vice versa, then these two plots, one and two and two and one are just mirror images of each other. You are right, depends on where you look, where you put the mirror, but yes. <laughs> mirrors. So I remember when I was a, when I was a kid, <coughs> mirrors would confuse me. So I would ask a question like this, that when I see a mirror, left and right get switched. 
but top and bottom don't. <laughs> I never understood why. Hey, you know, uh, uh, due to gravity, <laughs> you can think. I mean, left and right get switched, but top and bottom don't. I thought it was something to do with the mirror, and then I thought it was something to do with my eyes. You know, maybe because they left. So I looked at it this way, and you know, that didn't help. <laughs> Uh, so yes, it's an important point. When you do symmetry, it's a good catch. It's a good catch. You realize that there aren't so many plots. There are actually only half as many plots because the plot on this side of the histograms and the plot on the opposite side of the histograms are the same. There was another question that one of you asked is that many of these seem to look like rows and columns. In the sense that, what are these rows? Now what does this row look, what does this mean? It means that this variable fitness this variable fitness actually has very few numbers in it. It has a number 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Now why is that? Because remember how I define fitness is my perception of whether I was fit or not in my original definition of the variables. Here you go. Self rated and fitness on 1 to 5 scale where 1 is in poor shape and 5 is in excellent shape. This was the created data. So in this data set, I now have that, this variable in it. These kinds of variables sometimes cause difficulty in the sense that they are some, there's a word for it. These are sometimes called ordinal variables. So sometimes data is looked at sort of, you know, numerical and categorical. And categorical is sometimes called nominal and ordinal. Nominal means it's a name. Name of a person, north, south, east and west, gender, male, female, place, etc. It's a variable. Essentially it's a name. Ordinal is, it's also categorical but there is a sense of order. There is a sense of order. Dissatisfied, very dissatisfied. So there's an order. Order, therefore ordinal. This variable, the fitness variable, can, if you wish, be treated as an ordinal categorical variable. So, for example, the Likert scale is that, so the seven point scale. Not satisfied, very dissatisfied, dissatisfied, moderately dissatisfied, neutral, sat moderately satisfied, satisfied, very satisfied. Mark one. This generates a data from a scale of say 1 to 7 or 0 to 6. So it will show up in your database as a number. Like for example here you can say instead of 1 to 5, very unfit, moderately unfit, okay, relatively fit, very fit. Instead of giving 1 to 5, give it that way. And you code it up this way, your choice. So sometimes when you have data that looks like this, the data, the Python or any database will recognize it as a number because you've entered it as a number, but you analyze it as if it is a category. So um, the opposite problem also sometimes exists in that sometimes you get to see a categorical variable show up as a number, but you know it's a categorical variable. A zip code is an example. A zip code shows up as a number, but it's obviously not. You can't add up zip codes, right? You take two places in Bangalore and you want to find a place between them, that's not the average of the zip codes. It might be close, but you can't do arithmetic with zip codes. The other difficulty with zip codes is that there can be many of them, which means that as your data set grows, the number of zip codes also grows. So the number of values that a variable can take grows with the data. And this sometimes causes a difficulty. Because what happens is that in the statement of the definition of the variable, you now cannot state how many categories there will be present. So you know that there will be more zip codes coming, you just don't know how many more zip codes will be coming. But you also know it's a categorical variable, so you can't treat it like a number. And so there are some special types of, you know, problems like zip codes that require special types of solutions. So the plot itself is a very very computational plot. If it recognizes it as a number, it plots it. If you don't want to make it plot as a number, change it to a character. Most softwares including Python will allow you to do that.
whatever uh, uh, news we have been hearing, eight, eight, L, eight air or eight ground uh, attacks. Those, those were uh, like say targeted missiles. Majority of all these or in all of all these applications, some algorithms like say which we call as like say reinforcement learning, okay, these algorithms are implemented. And when you actually get into reinforcement learning, there is good amount of uneasiness. It is very easy to talk about it like say how it works and all these things. Theoretically actually we can draw very nice diagrams on the board, okay. But when it comes to implementation, okay, uh, or even like say even think about implementation, okay, how to create data is one of the toughest tasks, okay. Uh, actually when I entered into reinforcement learning, I did not know all these uh, different uh, difficulties actually. Okay. Uh, we shared some of the material. Okay, today's uh, presentation in PPT uh, PDF form, and also there is one uh, write-up. Okay, that write-up actually I implemented uh, some time back, and I'm actually trying to go for patent of uh, that one. Uh, of course, I revealed to the extent that uh, my idea is not uh, completely, my idea cannot be completely copied. Okay, so that time, like say, as of now, you have SQL learn library for machine learning. Okay, and you have like say TensorFlow recently came up like say some uh, two, three years back for uh, uh, deep learning, okay. And when we actually started programming for the, this reinforcement learning, there was no library per se. We had to actually write our own uh, framework to uh, complete the task, okay. For just one application, it took around uh, nine months for me to complete uh, that end to end, okay. So I will be actually touch basing this one tomorrow at second off because I will not be able to implement and show you because that is a bigger application. But I will be walking you through like say different stages. If you take a real time scenario, how do you actually model and then get to that level where you can implement. And before that, we actually implement some toy problems. In fact, it is actually some two, three years old. I will be actually touch basing that framework and then we will get into a hands on. Okay, there is something called open AI gym. Yeah. That is the framework, okay. And of course, there are like say three, four more uh, frameworks what are mentioned in Quora, but they are not maintained well. And using existing framework for op uh, like say reinforcement learning is a challenging task. Reason is the data what I use versus the data what you use. Here the data I mean to say I want to actually get into self-driving car. And you want to basically hit some target. So the environments are completely different. So coming up with a generic environment where everyone can use that library is very difficult, okay. As of now, this may actually look little bit of jargon. I will explain and then it will be clear, okay. So the agenda is as follows. We start with introduction to reinforcement learning. And then uh, first of all, why should we actually get into this one? There should be some uh, business uh, value, right? So we will actually see patent. Uh, uh, patents in uh, different technologies. He actually had uh, already good amount of supervised learning, unsupervised learning, deep learning, and now today we have uh, reinforcement learning, okay. And this is like say, uh, as of now, one of the latest trending uh, things in the market. Uh, deep learning followed by reinforcement learning, okay. Uh, how many of you know DeepMind in uh, Google's DeepMind, right? So uh, you people are already aware about it. And Google's DeepMind AlphaGo actually defeated uh, this, uh, like say, uh, world champion uh, Go, uh, Go game, right? Yeah, okay. And it was like, say, I think 100-0. No, right? So that means like, and that was one of the toughest games, it seems to actually, I uh, don't have any intuition about that game, okay? So that was one of the toughest uh, uh, games, it seems to beat human, okay. So people actually came up with uh, combining deep learning and reinforcement learning and now they are able to basically beat world champions in that area, okay. And this happened just recently, right. So we will see like say what and all, what is the trend in patents when, uh, when it comes to these uh, technologies. You may expect like say supervised learning will be leading the patents, okay, we will see those surprises. Okay, and then what are the differences between supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and uh, reinforcement learning? Okay, and a few examples. Like, say, what are the dominant uh, uh, 
problems we solve using RL. Okay, and then we get into introduction to RL and what are the important concepts, uh, important uh, components in RL, followed by one of the celebrated algorithms in uh, for RL, Q learning. Okay, uh, well, if you ask me, like, say, why that name Q? I actually do not have, uh, don't have idea, but probably uh, the guy uh, who invented, uh, he has some Russian uh, roots, looks like. Okay, and then uh, uh, you have like a uh, couple of case studies. So, uh, smart taxi, and then I do that uh, smart taxi in class using this framework, whatever uh, our friend mentioned, open AI gene. Okay, and then you'll be actually solving the next one, frozen lake uh, four by four. That is, I say, we'll see what is that four by four. Okay, and then we actually start improving our Q learning from there onwards. And then uh, we get into second case study, uh, like say the same case study extension. Okay, and finally we go to the next level of Q learning, improvement of Q learning to the, like say Q learning first level uh, improvement, second level improvement, SARSA. Okay, the name looks like say some. Uh, uh, person name, but it actually state action reward state action. Okay, that's it. Okay, and finally, we'll be touch basing on uh, this uh, real world uh, case study. This document is already shared with you. Fine. So, what now? What we expect uh, by the end of this module? I mean, uh, this four hours and next four hours, you'll be able to actually program to some extent real world scenarios. Okay, today itself I will say, uh, uh, like say without this framework, how do you solve a small problem like say uh, programming environment and then, okay, I will say that, uh, that code as well. So that without using the built-in uh, environment, this op uh, framework, okay, how do you solve the problem? Okay. I believe that will be more beneficial, but I cannot use that one in the classroom because there will be like say hundreds of lines of code. Okay. But I can explain the structure, how it goes. Okay. And then we can describe uh, different scenarios in RL. Okay. Finally, examples. Okay. Explain uh, various models uh, in RL. That's what we can expect from this course, uh, from this module. Okay. And of course, uh, having said all these things, okay, you can see like say the top notch applications, uh, whatever we are actually seeing in the market now, most of them are programmed using some form of RL. Okay, so there will be good amount of complexity when you actually go for the bigger case studies. We'll try to actually keep it as simple as possible for a class, and towards the end we'll actually make it little more complex and more realistic case studies. Okay, so when it comes to patent search, I actually just uh, quickly browse through uh, the patents. Okay. Uh, for example, K means is one of the uh, trending words among uh, data scientists. Okay, for K means when I actually look at the number of patents filed using K means as a word, okay, there were around 620, not filed, patents awarded. Okay, and with the deep learning, there were like say around uh, 100k patents. Deep learning being one of the oldest technique, like say it actually started in 1960s, 70s, right? So, and then reinforcement learning, which is like say oh, one of the latest ones you can call, okay? That has like uh, 65,000 odd, okay? And if you see the latest one, I mean last two, three years, the amount of applications people are developing and going for patents are dominant in RL, combining RL and uh, DL. These two areas are dominant in uh, generating values. And also if you see the takeovers in startups, people focusing on these two, deep learning or RL, okay? These two are like say uh, dominant. When it comes to startup, yes, I have showcased some value with RL. You have higher chance of maybe taking over by Google. Okay. And recently, uh, like say some nine months back, it happened in Bangalore, right? One not, actually team itself was acquired by Google, AI team. Six month old team was yeah. yeah. It was not even like say some est established uh, startup. Okay, they showcased some value in uh, DL, and it was taken over by Google, and some undisclosed money. They have not, they did not disclose how much money they have paid. 
uh, let me actually uh, just to give you that confidence what is the trend in the latest one okay these are the two things what you can use lens.org and the google patents okay if i uh, it is like say open source patents uh, uh, patents information uh, maintenance website okay so if i actually do this one lens.org so i go for like say in recent first how the trend is okay this year just we have we are just in march that's why it, it actually came down but if you see the growth it's even bigger than exponential right maybe exponential of exponential let me call it <laughs> right and now if i actually look at uh, this is somewhat smoother in the recent past it is somewhat smoother compared to the previous one right so the growth in rl is pretty dominant compared to dl in recent past right because everyone is going for automation okay so if you want to generate value i think this could be one of the like say next steps you can take okay. fine and now you can actually look at other uh, supervised learning algorithms uh, in the similar fashion okay you can actually go to google patents and see and you can see like in these things what are all other uh, things like say say for example monitoring method and monitoring device of uh, deep learning uh, processor okay and you can actually see exactly what people are doing in recent past this actually sets up uh, our task like say yes we have to get into this field or to basically write the tide in traders terminology there is uh, something like say trend is your friend a trend is traders friend if some market is going up or going down that is the best thing where they can make money okay if market is fluctuating around a point they actually switch out the system and go for break okay so if you are able to see a strong trend in one of these technologies or some of these technologies let us actually write the trend okay. so in supervised learning we have like say x and y x is our independent set and y is our target variable and so we want to basically uh, predict y using x predict y using x in the sense we want to find a function f function is nothing but a relationship between x and y that's what we want to basically do in supervised learning so some of the examples like say you have classification regression then object detection of course again falling either in uh, classification or uh, regression predominantly classification okay image captioning you now combining multiple uh, technologies like say you have uh, your dl plus uh, nlp caption like say image captioning okay this is what we learned so far in unsupervised learning similar stuff but without why there is no target right so just as feature space we basically want to find hidden patterns in the data using this unsupervised learning okay so learn some underlying hidden patterns in the given data that's what we try to do in um, un using unsupervised learning techniques right so some of the examples clustering k means or hierarchical or db scan okay some of the dimensionality reduction techniques like say pca or factor analysis right and then uh, uh, feature uh, feature engineering of course feature engineering also you can use like say pca for feature engineering okay so and then uh, or density estimation using like a db scan sort of thing or any other statistical methods okay so that's what predominantly like say bird's eye view of super unsupervised learning we had okay and when it comes to dl okay if a problem is not falling under in uh, supervised or unsupervised learning okay you are not basically able to get some uh, data of friend which can be easily handled okay or which is like a combination of supervised and unsupervised say for example i want to hit a target okay that is like say uh, very ambiguous statement right because when i actually take off due to weather conditions 
my direction may be changed right my instrument direction may be that uh, what do you say aeroplane whatever it is the direction may be changed due to some external factors okay but i have to hit the target that means when i actually train the model the coordinates are like say if the information what system had was different compared to now when it is in the air that means it the flight should be able to take the decision on its own looking at the external factors but finally reach the target right if you actually listen to some of these uh, videos by what do you say our uh, iaf personnel we fixed the coordinate and we sent it and it did the rest of the work that's what they told right and if you actually look at it target is fixed and uh, like say missile is fired like say incorporating all external factors it did not miss the target the error they actually mentioned was few meters single digit few meters that's what they mentioned okay that means the problems which actually how to incorporate that latest uh, external factors those are the problems where rl can be very good your regular supervised and unsupervised learning will not be so effective in those scenarios right so more general than supervised and unsupervised learning okay this problems like say reinforcement learning problems you will be actually hearing this the following terminologies again and again there will be something called agent there will be something called environment there will be something called reward okay environment is like say uh, our external factors agent is aeroplane okay action go straight or take slight left or slight right okay based on wind or whatever it is okay so in frequent intervals there will be communication in frequent intervals it actually starts calculating wait what action to take left right right or go deep right so you have like say your environment weather okay your flight and it actually takes action when it takes action in the given environment that flight coordinates are different right now you look at the target and based on that now your coordinates are different that means your data has changed your state has changed you i mean to say agent agent state has changed now based on that state again you have to basically take the next action okay go another 10 or 10 meters ahead makes sense right so this act, this repetition will be continuous continuous till we reach the target okay and now there is this one how do you actually say my action is correct or not whatever action i have taken is correct or not there will be some sort of reward associated to that some reward associated to that say for example yes you actually uh, moved in the positive direction whatever is expected okay i'll give you uh, one point okay due to like say someone uh, tried to intercept you so you actually took the uh, like say slightly deviated direction now i'll give you minus 1 point uh, as reward i penalized you that means now whatever the action you have taken that instead of, instead of uh, straight you have taken right that action is not a correct one to reach the target to reach the target you have to go straight right now you see, you see like say going straight or going left going right those are the actions you are taking those actions are actually leading you to some reward reward in the sense like yes you are closer to the target or not if you are not closer to the target because of your action you are going away from the target that means the action you have taken is a wrong action it should be penalized makes sense so that's what on uh, like say birds of view what reinforcement learning is to solve this problem now people actually came up with a lot of algorithms okay so predominantly rl is the science of decision making okay and this is where like say people are actually running behind it automated decision making pilot is not sitting in this one your system is making the decisions right and it is not missing the target that is the power 
right? Your supervised learning, if there are outliers, algorithm will go for toss. Would need a huge storage space in everything. Of course. Just to capture the data. How do we know that you have enough data to make the change? Well, that is a slightly a challenging question to answer. Okay. The data itself you have to create. Okay. I'll show you some examples. After that, then I will take up that question again. Okay. So, how do I collect data and what, uh, like say, uh, what is the uh, volume of the data needed for to solve this problem? That is what his question is. The example. Okay. I have two examples now. One of the simplest thing, one of the simplest examples, you see, like say, we actually uh, live with, uh, live with in, in, in the sense, like say, we actually have a lot of animals uh, around us and many of those animals are our friends. Say for example, like uh, many people have uh, dog as their pet, cats. cats. Okay. Say for example, uh, I have uh, cattle at my uh, village home. Okay. If my sister calls, that buffalo comes. If I call, that actually comes to hit me. Okay. And it is very difficult, like say, to understand now, like say, how uh, the buffalo understands human language. It is very difficult, right? But that's what exactly is happening. Now, what is the logic behind it? Okay. Now, let us take a simple example. Okay. Let us actually try to teach something to the dog to do. Okay. So, consider a scenario where you want to teach something for a dog to do. Right. Say, for example, what normally these trainers do? They actually try to create some noise or create some action, hand signs. Okay. Based on that hand sign, if dog does the favorable action what the trainer wants. Dog will be appreciated by either a biscuit or a pet. Right? So, then next time when trainer actually does the same like say hand sign or like say some noise. Now, dog like say he, he tries to do something else and it is not getting that biscuit. So, again it actually goes, oh okay, I did that one, I did previous action. Uh, and uh, when I actually got the biscuit, let me try to do that one, whether I get biscuit. Okay. It tries to actually repeat the old action where it actually got the biscuit. Okay. Now it got the biscuit. So now it has the memory. Okay. Whenever there is hand sign of like say uh, lifting the hand, if I do this one, I'll get biscuit. Getting biscuit is reward. Not getting biscuit is punishment. Yeah. So, first of all, actions can be lot. It can be continuous space as well. When you take the, this flight scenario, it can actually take the rotation in continuous manner. Why only 360 degrees? It can be actually 1 degree by 100th uh, as well, right? 100th uh, 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 fraction as well. So, yes, it, you can have lot of actions, but in this particular one, Okay. Say for example, you, you lift the hand, you are a trainer, you lift the hand, you expect dog to get up. Okay. You uh, actually uh, put down your hand, you expect dog to sit down. There are only two actions, right? One is like say dog has to get up, it has to sit down. And say for example, third action, when you actually throw some ball from your hand, you expect dog to jump, third action. Okay. When it actually jumps, you appreciate it with biscuit. If it doesn't jump, you don't appreciate it, right? So you are increasing now action space, right? And now when you actually take the stick, it knows like say you are going to hit or you are going to punish it, right? So that is a negative thing for that. So when you take the stick, it will be very obedient. Whenever it was obedient, when you took the stick, it did not get that much punishment. That's why it actually starts acting as obedient. Make sense? Now, all these things, though they look qualitative, but they are all quantitative. We can actually make all these things as observable entities. Correct, right? Okay. Now, getting into the dog example, let us actually try to quantify. Quant quantify in the sense, let us try to get some sort of logic. What exactly is happening? 
how reinforcement learning works in broader sense okay so for example your dog is agent okay that is responding to the or that is exposed to the environment okay the environment could be your house or your lawn right and now the situations they encounter are analogous to state okay you are in the environment and you are standing that is one state standing with your folded uh, hands folded uh, your uh, hands and kept it in the back of your uh, body that's what state is okay when you do this one dog also actually comes and stands in front of you if you observe right and when trainer actually raises his hand okay it is actually seeing, seeing the change in the environment change in the environment state changed yes as a greedy person okay when i actually try to program i want to actually capture all the movements when i lift the hand whether all these things are important or like say keeping my hand in the back of my body and raising my hand and showing this one okay there are only two actions discrete actions sorry discrete states these two are enough or i want to actually capture everything as a greedy person as a greedy data scientist i want to capture everything but for our example let us say this is one state and this is another state okay so my as soon as my state changes the agent actually starts acting right so our agent reacts by performing an action to to the change in the state change in the state in the environment trainer actually gave the signal shout or hand signal whatever it is okay that is the change in the state okay then your agent the dog is performing some action and that action based on that like say you expected the dog to get up it got up and you are the trainer you gave the biscuit okay you giving the biscuit and it, uh, uh, the dog taking the biscuit is like say dog receiving the reward agent receiving the reward right so for every state followed by action there is a reward whether that reward is zero minus one plus one okay getting punishment getting food no uh, like say you don't actually do any uh, reward at all not giving any reward also is reward reward zero right so after the transition they may receive a reward or penalty okay once it actually takes the biscuit you throw the biscuit and uh, dogs takes the biscuit okay now again you have like say change in the environment the change in the environment is new state so from previous state from previous state i actually now come I came to the another state it could be my like i said previous state where i stood keeping my hands in my back or it could be like say lifting my left hand right so the states will be changing continuously based on the states there will be actions based on the actions there will be rewards rewards to the agent actions by agent environment because of the those actions and rewards environment changes environment changes in the sense the states in the environment changes right so it is a continuous process till you expect the agent to complete the task what it you wanted make sense right and now, now if you see it looked a tie example but it actually perfectly makes sense now we can generalize this topic right and in fact we are all or like say tuned to do reinforcement learning in our life but we don't program per se reinforcement learning with hand i mean computer programming we might not have not done we might not have not done but we all are tuned to do this activity okay the policy this is another term okay which you will be hearing again and again the policy in reinforcement learning is the following the policy is the strategy of choosing an action based on the state okay policy is chosen by agent and then if this policy is optimal policy or the best policy that policy is referred as optimal policy for a given state this is the best action okay for a given state this is the best action 
one of the simplest examples is you are on uh, highway and no vehicles uh, in your uh, hindsight and you are like say uh, driving looking at that uh, scenario most of the time you actually increase your uh, or like say you accelerate your speed that is the thing like what we have actually experienced in our life no one says us like say okay now you go by like say 120 or one, uh, 150 right our system is tuned to that one like say okay this is the environment let me actually take this action because this act this particular action led me into a lot of benefit in the past Okay, let me take that action for this, uh, uh, like say state, that's what is your policy. Action, state action pair is your policy. The state action pair, which is the best state action pair, I mean best action for a given state is optimal policy. Okay, and once you train your system, this is the beauty. Okay, once you train your system, at the end, what you actually store in your uh, what do you say automated system is list of all possible actions and their respective uh, sorry list of all possible states followed by optimal actions exactly okay it could be like say 1 million states it could be 1 million states and 1 million like say number of actions could be just 100 but these 100 actions are linked to for each each state. Say for example. What if an important state is missed? That's where DL comes into picture. Okay, when you have a continuous phase, how do you approximate? Okay, we'll touch base that one tomorrow. Assume that we have all states listed possible. All possible states are listed. Okay, so so let me actually say this is all states state 1 till state 100 okay these are all states i can actually think of or uh, like say showcasing in front of my agent which is dog like buffalo and the runway example is for the past yes. what what would happen like what i'm saying is like an odd state exactly uh, okay uh, so if some state is not experienced in the system when you're trained okay when in real life when you actually experience you are getting negative reward and the name of the algorithm is reinforce okay this is the new state and when i actually do some action on top of this new state i'm actually getting the negative reward let me not repeat the same action what i did for the new state because my experience is bad. But first time when I actually do that action for the new state, I am getting affected. I have to live with that. There is no scope. Okay. And another thing, what you actually can get uh, the uh, like say similarity is the new state, whether it is close to one of these 100 states. Maybe it is close to state 50. This is new state, it is close to state 50. Let me take that optimal action. Your clustering is coming into picture. Okay, and in fact, this is what I actually implemented in finance because finance you can actually you cannot uh, see all the states. So approximate states, and then based on that, you basically take the action. Okay, so I have like say states 1 to 100, right? And now for state 1 to 100, let me say for the dog, okay, hand lift, okay, this is that, that comes under state, okay, for state 1, dog jumps, this is one action, right, and for state 2, probably it sits, another action, okay, and these are actions these need not be optimal actions right so <coughs> once you train your system over the period of time okay for the state one probably walking to next point is the best action 
right. So, over the period of time you actually start repeating these actions, you learn your system and then come up with a list of uh, optimal actions, not list of optimal action, each state mapped with one optimal action, okay. Now, the output of reinforcement learning, once you train your system, okay, you have your problem, you have your problem and you train using RL, okay. Now, you say like you have your output, the output is going to be just like say two uh, like uh, uh, CSV file with two columns, with the two columns, those columns are nothing but states optimal actions that is it and this will be your output from the system. The better optimal actions you get the better system it will be. Definitely. It, it is uh, only one uh, like say one state can have only one optimal action. So, when you are on highway whether uh, you are nearby Bangalore or nearby Hyderabad if like say highway is clear and it is uh, six lane, you actually accelerate. That is different state, but acceleration is common action, whether it is Bengal, nearby Bangalore or nearby Hyderabad, right. So, different states, but same action, because your these states are very similar to each other, excluding the geographic location, right. So, so, in case optimal action needs to be changed, so okay, scenario has changed, environment has changed, let us say, something has happened, optimal action needs to be changed. Exactly. Then what happens? Uh, that, uh, that was my question. So, how much data we would need okay. to let, make let sure, to, to, uh, to come to a conclusion that optimal action needs to also be changed. Okay. In production, how do we use it? So, now I can erase this one, right? See, uh, you are talking about multiple states which are similar to each other, yes. then both can have optimal action. But your state are, states are different. Yeah, states are different. So. That is what there will, you have lot of states, right. You have lot of states and each state is associated with an optimal action, right. Say for example, your lion and other four uh, uh, like say four leg uh, animal like say cat, they are very similar. But the actions actually you perform when you are in that environment are different. Yeah, exactly because when you actually do the same action when cat is around versus when uh, line is around, reward is different, right? <laughs> Am I correct or not? So that is what now in the production how do you actually do it? So you have uh, let me say uh, this video streaming. Okay, you have your video streaming. Our eyes are saying that video. Okay, now every one second or every 500 milliseconds, you actually capture the scenario. You actually capture the state. Okay, continuous stream, you are discretizing it. Okay, and you are discretizing to the extent that your system can. Uh, actually react, right. So, new state, fine. This new state, now we actually see like map to your existing one, where that state actually belongs to, take that optimal action, action, okay. And since you perform this action, say you are on highway and you performed action of like say accelerating little more, maybe you are actually reaching the end of the curve, end of the curve in the road, right. Now, your state is changing. So, after that you are getting again new state. Now, since like say in few meters, uh, few hundred meters uh, ahead there is a curve the optimal action whenever you have this scenario is slowing down, 
right so look at again this one okay take the action and the faster you make the system the better it is and that's why when you look at self driving cars they say if you go beyond 60 kilometers my car will not be able to function properly changing in different states right so one action i mean the result the res i should reward it or not depends on the future state because that is our neutral state we don't know that, that is training part of it that's what q, q learning for instance suppose i'm going this way i'm starting from there this every time i have to take so yes. there will be no reward for this yes. right but left or right where i should go if i take right then that is like i should lose if i take left i should win <coughs> should I mean this is a neutral uh, thing right where you are not rewarding anything i completely agree and this scenario you always have in chess say for example any game game winning is the reward okay to win the game you may set a trap the trapping temporarily it looks like negative one right so yes long term win is the target and then short term loss is negative reward okay how to keep this memory that's where we have like say q learning advanced and sarsa okay and this is actually part of the training of the reinforcement learning system okay when you use it you already trained and you actually thought that okay at 9:30 when you come out of the house okay irrespective of what reward you will get you actually start as would go straight though your vegetable market is in your behind because your office is 10 kilometers away from you initially you may actually say like hey, oh they are taking some long routes and now you start actually suggesting them okay no take this uh, shortcut routes after two three uh, trials when you take the next cab automatically it gets suggested you don't need to tell the driver after that right the reward the reward here is less fuel expense less, less fuel consumption on shorter time to reach the destination that is the reward for them right system is getting trained in the back right so long term target should be always kept as like say or uh, in the view and the long term like say when i say reward it's not actually one reward see correctly pointed out the rewards will be accumulated in the following way it's when when i actually look at reward only in the next moment that's referred as greedy algorithm right when i actually look at long term reward that's referred as keeping in the memory right setting the trap and winning the game so the present reward present reward actually will be reward starting uh, like say let me say uh, i i equals to t to or uh, maybe i am actually going to have like say some 100 time steps from now onwards into the future okay and then it is not exactly with the equal proportion my present reward i need to give little more higher weight than future reward right so i actually put some uh, uh, like say learning parameter and when i go to the two time steps from now this learning parameter should get depreciated so learning parameter less than 1 and then i'll actually try to put something like say power i so since learning parameter is less than 1 and when you actually get into too deep into the future that may not have much importance but you are trying to give some importance okay now you can play with these things and that's how you actually get the memory into the system training so your actions are not instantaneous your actions are looking like say future reward also into the uh, your actions are actually taking your future rewards also into the consideration make sense this is what you are asking right okay fine so how do we actually play with this one you actually have come across this one in ada boost as well as in gradient boosting learning parameter and in deep learning like say you have been living with it 
correct right yeah okay now so far are we fine we are able to get like say reinforcement learning is nothing but like say looking at the state and taking the action and you are getting reward for that one and over the period of time what are the optimal actions for the given state okay that's what we have to figure out and output of reinforcement learning is going to be this just this csv table okay on this missile it will be just the csv table implemented so for the uh, like say system to work there will be video streaming coming in new state identified optimal action taken it will be continuous how fast you can react that is nothing but your accuracy some people say like say i can react in uh, 1 microsecond 2 microseconds yeah then you can hit target uh, even even before others realize it right so, so the output of the uh, training is the csv exactly and then afterward you what is the csv on uh, like say i am looking at no self driving car in self driving car i have the following in self driving car you have a camera in front of the system, uh, cam, uh, like say car right your car camera it is taking the pictures how frequently you want to take pictures maybe every 100 milliseconds right or live streaming though we call it as live streaming for uh, marketing purposes it's actually frames right how many frames do you want to have in given uh, one second like let us say 100 uh, frames let me take frame 1 latest frame this frame is explaining me my state right this frame is nothing but state where i am in now right and this frame you have to associate with other quantities as well right the speed at which you are actually at present you are driving and other external factors probably uh, when i actually ride my scooty my son says daddy some cycle wala is going faster than you okay uh, i normally cannot ride faster okay but others like say they may go at uh, 120 or 150 on uh, their bike okay in each frame is possible to have multiple states right each frame can have only one state because this this frame using your clustering you are saying this frame is similar to so and so state agree with me yeah. can we have another car in front of us uh, and we can have uh, traffic signal also in the same of course point. and that's why self driving car you will have like say lot of data to crunch google spent several hundreds of man years to build this one self driving car google spent several hundreds of man years to actually simulate all these things and still we hear like say recently self driving car hitting a uh, uh, human on the road right because that particular scenario was not captured earlier right so you have the frame and also associated uh, uh, attributes okay all these things is new state this new state is one of the states in your csv file then take action okay once you take this action it is leading to the next frame right that's it it is an iterative process if there is a new state it does act in its training csv file training will never take place in a uh, uh, client place training will never take place in your uh, like say car okay the person who sold you that self driving instrument they have trained with enough uh, scenarios and they have given you and if they want to train with new scenarios that's what they say we are giving you updates we are giving you updates they are adding more scenarios it will be like say very limited data you need to know like say what is the scenario in front of you right are there any objects if at all there are any objects how far that object is from your present location you can detect that one right when flight is actually going in air it is able to tell like say how uh, like what is the altitude it is uh, flying at it is able to detect it actually tells you like say 
it is coordinates right you, you basically from your flight you send the signal and uh, like say that uh, sound signal okay how fast it actually goes and comes back that is the algorithm basically to detect the uh, distance and that's how flight uh, like say pilots are able to tell like say we are actually cruising now at uh, 11,000 uh, uh, kilometers because so your system actually should get all these things otherwise what happens is the data what you have is not fully uh, like say representing the state do you people agree with me or not? Like say, yes, without saying like say how far ahead of uh, some particular object is from me, if I am not able to detect that one, I actually end up with an accident at some time. This is a definitely, you know, like say in, uh, useful data to have as an attribute. And we have been seeing like say, this is what is available. You just have to capture and use it. Once you have the, all this one, you are doing action. That action is leading to you to the next state. That next state again includes frame and attributes. Yeah. Uh, uh, adding new scenarios is not automated learning. No. It's similar to other models where how we will collect new data and then retrain, build, exactly. test, deploy. Exactly. It is the same. But if you actually look at it, there is a significant difference between your supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. The target in your uh, su supervised learning target is fixed. Here, your target is actually evolving. I want to come from uh, what do you say, Hyderabad to Bangalore. My target is short term. Like say, every hundred meters, I will see like say whether there is any obstacle. Reach that hundred meters again, evaluate it. Right? So target is evolving. Am I correct? So there is a significant difference between your RL and your SL and your like say unsupervised learning clustering is actually coming as part of your state aggregation. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking from the NLP perspective. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have trained uh, a model with a list of words. Yeah. We are looking at something and predicting. The model has not seen any you know new scenario in this case, but still it is uh, affecting our uh, classification. But model has not seen that. Yeah. Then also we have to, you know, you know, even in our machine learning scenarios, we will have to collect how, how many such, uh, if it is significant in number, then we will go and retain the model. Definitely. Right? Same thing, you have to use <coughs> RL there also. Definitely, try and test and deployment has to be there. Okay, try and test. Here, like say, test I mean to say, you have a self-driving car, you put it in the ground and you actually try to create, create hurdles and see how it reacts. The test environment, that is how you create the data. Because a lot of times <coughs> business people think these things have been sold in very bad way. They all, many business people think that it is auto, auto learning, not only RL, even machine learning they think it is Definitely. auto learning. I completely agree. So here the thing is when you actually explain uh, to anyone this self-driving car, there is a strong uh, uh, sentence made, right? When Google actually announced these things, self-driving cars are not suitable to Indian roads. Right, self-driving cars, they are not suitable to Indian roads. Main reason is, like say for example, the lane discipline. These things are violated very frequently. Exactly. <laughs> so, they may be actually, uh, uh, what do you say, roaming around freely. Right. When that sort of scenarios are not part of your training data, then your system doesn't know what to do. You meet with an accident in that case. So, so automated learning is something is not really till now, right? It is a marketing term, we are evolving. The better you actually say like mine is a very good system with a lot of confidence if you are able to tell, you can sell it for a few million dollars. For instance, you talked about um, uh, like some scenario which is didn't, didn't exist, but shouldn't it return to some default state then? Th that's what exactly actually happens in your car also. Unexpected right? kind of scenario it came, then it should return to its default state. Exactly, it actually comes, say for example, yeah, you say like uh, uh, when you are driving your car, okay, without actually coming to the neutral or uh, pressing the clutch, okay, you put the brakes, slight brake, and you are on fourth gear. Automatically, it stops. Default state. That engine gets stopped. Yeah, but we need exactly. to define that for all of the course. scenarios for business. For instance, for your exactly. problem, stop pop problem, there will be a default state. We have to define all these corner cases should be defined. Okay, because that's why the building, of, like I said, building reinforcement learning system takes a lot of time. 
okay it looks very very easy to explain but development now you see the complexity okay we are actually talking about lot of uh, uh, like say new data points coming in all these things now coming up with a general framework to solve this problem is far from reality right okay now let me go to the next one this is like say i think almost all of us might have experienced how do we actually teach baby to walk this is exactly like previous one <laughs> yeah right you actually try to give some reward right that reward could be just clapping kids are attention seeking people right in general so when kid actually gets up he doesn't know whether that is good activity or bad activity we all start clapping and he says like say smiling faces all around so okay this action this action when i do i am able to see like say lot of attention towards me let me do it repeatedly right and then he actually puts one foot forward he falls we all will be sad so that action of falling is not actually liked by my people let me not do that activity i may do something slightly different because by then i don't know like say what is correct one i may do something slightly different and then people like people are liking so i try to repeat it again and again right whether the kid actually looks at our smiley faces or like say he actually looks at our chocolate or whatever it is from his point of view smiley faces or chocolate everything is reward right we actually saying oh you fell that's also reward negative right by then kid and you don't have communication mechanism developed right so for example my son actually started talking only at the end of third year and we were sending him school uh, to school at uh, starting of third year okay his teacher is used to tell like say he doesn't speak to anyone why are you bringing but i i could actually understand whatever he he was trying to tell that communication mechanism was established between me and my son but not between teacher and uh, student right so exactly those actions whatever he was actually making those actions my system was able to understand it you have to train the system for the new data points make sense right and now you see this is what the end story is you have your child and you have surface okay so couple of steps that child actually puts and then you are actually rewarding him with chocolate he falls you don't reward him with chocolate so whenever that kid wants chocolate now he puts those two, two steps well it is actually much more complex than this one <laughs> okay online learning is a marketing term again okay we actually try to say my car actually goes at 300 kilometers per hour speed ferrari climbs but in reality we actually buy maruti going at 120 or 130 speed online is exactly the similar one right so people claim online learning at to come it is something like say automated machine learning auto machine learning what some of these framework people are claiming microsoft of the world amazon of the world right they say like say you don't need to even program you can, you can just drag and drop uh, apis right yes you can do all those things but at what cost right so they are actually trying to simplify there is limit for simplification online also it is basically for marketing in real term in reality i may not believe online learning of course there are algorithms for online learning okay and reinforcement learning if you actually take it as like say uh, optimal actions and then states it's actually taking actions online maybe you can say my system is automated and taking actions online or in real time fine can we go ahead are we getting the sense of like say what kind of problems reinforcement learning can handle okay the data size can be ambig can be very big and the data can be pretty ambiguous at this stage okay 
now you have like say you have your agent the kid okay he did some action like say either standing up or walking forward okay and then the environment where you are in on surface you observed it and you gave him reward and before that you have to interpret it right yes this action is good you have interpreted you have given him reward and then he tries to again repeat the same thing okay when you interpreted and gave him reward your state has changed environment state has changed again it is continuous cycle okay right so now enough with uh, those uh, trivial examples by the way these examples when you actually start building to the next level any example or any case study you try to solve are very similar to these two examples you take any example okay whether you are talking about self driving car or whether you are talking about like say hitting some target all are like say again boiling down to this one your data changes okay what is my state that state definition will be different from for different problems but the process is same okay now she was actually saying like say can i keep that uh, uh, end target in view and then uh, have that uh, like say present rewards are, like adjusted that's a different algorithm okay. now to solve this one efficiently you actually come up with different algorithms whether you want to be greedy i mean trying to focus only on the next reward trying to focus only on uh, like say chocolate or you want your uh, father to lift you and uh, take you to the bazaar right if that is the target i walk as a kid and i don't take the chocolate i refuse the chocolate right that is a negative thing i don't take the reward and then my father thinks that okay he is not taking even this expensive reward probably he is expecting something more that's what all kids do right yeah. so rl is actually intersection of some of the known areas one is like say optimum control this is what like say communication engineers they are very fond of this particular word optimal control okay ece guys they actually focus on optimal control and rl from optimal control point of view or like say your uh, aerospace applications or communication network applications okay and then you have like say operations research right operation research it is pretty interesting problem say for example you have uh, this uh, uh, a big blood bank in the city and the, like say yes blood supply is there and there is requirement also from different hospitals right now some blood groups are universal donors some blood groups are universal acceptors some are only one to one right with given supply and given demand what is the optimal way so that everyone can actually get the everyone can be served that's again rl okay you can actually frame it as part of reinforcement learning problem okay but it is a supply chain solving a supply chain problem using artificial intelligence now i actually told only till this point now you have to actually get your intuition like say what could be my state and what could be my action for this right if universal donor is actually giving to universal acceptor probably that may not be a right correct a right thing universal donor giving it to a specific uh, blood group probably could be a right thing right so you actually iterate through all these actions and finally you come up with proper match okay this supply today whatever blood we have in the bank could be actually mapped to so and so makes sense right so and then you have like say this economics people utility theory game theory whatever it is right and then medical applications neuroscience or like uh, this one uh, uh, or near uh, like say artificial intelligence or deep learning okay and since you people were talking about like say state aggregation or okay sometime back me and my friend in uh, iit mumbai we were actually trying to solve some problem empirically 
okay we actually spent a few weeks and we actually came up with the state aggregation you have continuous data coming in how do you actually get the states prepared because you cannot take data in a continuous format maybe every 100 milliseconds or every one second you have to consolidate all that information and then go for the action making right so we actually empirically proved and then but we had some doubt about uh, its validity we talked to a professor called borker okay by the way borker is one of the leading research scientists in india for uh, like say reinforcement learning he is in iitb okay and his students are in iasc okay like say professor goes and other people and other like say his khandan professor borker's khandan is pretty big in bengaluru as well so we actually explained him the problem he told okay go and see my paper in 1995 i proved this one theoretically okay almost like say some 15 years before what we actually solved empirically he could theoretically prove it state aggregation how to do in a continuous manner how to actually aggregate this information and put it as a state right so that is nothing but like say some people call it as vectorization some people call it as clustering and in rl terminology we say state aggregation continuous data you have to put it into let's say all that information con consolidated like say every 100 milliseconds this is what my state is makes sense right and then so how this uh, particular uh, beautiful object reinforcement learning is seen from different people okay when you are like say coming from computer science and machine learning these are the intersections what you have okay so different people try to handle this problem differently but at the end automation is the target okay at the end automation is the target and the other thing is there is no target variable here it cannot be fit into unsupervised learning it cannot be fit into supervised learning straight away that those sort of problems automating those problems like solving those problems solution automating it is nothing but reinforcement learning it is core of decision making and if you want very very precision decision making that can be achieved to the greater extent with rl okay so you have like uh, now trying to see how the interaction between agent and the environment okay say for example you have your environment in that environment you have states rewards actions right you actually emit state and reward and this man agent he actually sends back action because of that something will change here again you actually start emitting okay this is what is exactly happening in your self driving car or any continuous systems right this is what i wrote here this is a continuous process okay every time this is like say this is actually emitted look at uh, that uh, look up table dot csv table action is actually sent and again your uh, state is coming up again you are sending back action looking at that table since you are just looking at look up table your action taking time is just a fraction of uh, second maybe couple of microseconds right can we go ahead so now in a way reinforcement learning is the science of making optimal decision right that's what the crux of the story it is the science of making optimal decision looking at the experience what you had so far experience is nothing but training the system right so breaking it down the process of uh, reinforcement learning observing the environment deciding how to act using some strategy observing the environment is nothing but state aggregation last 10 microseconds information let me put it as my state right in last 10 microseconds my vehicle traveled at uh, like say 120 km speed right and coordinates are from here to there 
the coordinate of present one, coordinate of previous one is so and so, right? And the fuel consumption is so and so, okay? That's what my observation of the environment, okay? Now acting accordingly, your optimal actions, looking at the table, right? And then receiving the reward, reaching the target, right? And then learning from the experiences. If it is good experience, you try to repeat it. If it is bad experience, you try to avoid doing that action, right? And then iterate until an optimal strategy is performed, an optimal strategy is uh, uh, like say figured out. And when you do all these things, your optimal strategy is there and then that's what your trend system is. In machine learning or data, we use hyperparameters to uh, give you a better accuracy or performance. Here, like you say, iterate until an optimal strategy is found. Actually, I wrote already a hyperparameter, learning parameter here. That is one of the hyperparameters. Yeah, we have to tune. Okay, I did not name it because I have not introduced that uh, term yet. Okay, but that is a hyperparameter. Makes sense, right? Can we go ahead? So, some of the components in reinforcement learning. One is uh, reward. Okay, this reward will be coming again and again. Reward is nothing but a scalar quantity. Okay, it could be like say dollar rupees, dollar or rupees, right? Or it could be something like say punishment, right? Yeah. So, and our target is maximizing reward. By the way, no one will tell you what is the reward. Here, when you are actually going ahead to build your system, no one will tell what is the reward for your system, completely unknown. Now you have to come up with your own reward definition, okay? Probably same problem whatever you are solving, okay? You may have reward defined in one way, I may have reward defined in another way. So though we solve the same problem in uh, like say uh, in our ways, your set of optimal actions and my set of optimal actions for given a set of states will be different. Okay, probably to win the chess game, I may put the trap and then win. Okay, you don't like to actually lose those uh, initial uh, pawns, that's why you don't put the trap, but you actually you may take lot more steps to win the game. That's it. Okay, so target is going for like say maximum reward. Okay, so some of the standard examples for the reward. Okay, so this is just a uh, uh, like say sample list when you are actually building any solution for a given uh, problem, you have to define your reward. Say for example, the dog receives a reward from a trainer for doing the activity what trainer expected. Okay, so probably that reward is something like say getting biscuit or not getting anything, second reward, third is getting beatings and then getting call from Menaka Gandhi, right? So any, any of those things. Now like say getting beatings, the environment also has its limitations, right? It is not that it can actually do any actions whatever it wants to, right? So and then say for example, you have like say this uh, uh, auto, auto driving uh, helicopter, okay? And this man uh, uh, like say Andrew Ng from uh, Stanford, his example is pretty famous, okay, for this one. I'll just play that, okay. You see now, first of all, taking of the helicopter and you see like say, how many states are possible in this one? And it has to balance. And this is like, see, he actually created this example on his own with his students. Self-flying. Okay, he set the target and now it will reach. So it will go and hit the land. That is actually like say serious punishment, right? So that action will not be performed again and again.
it is just flying in the air there only now you set the target instead of like say flying there only going forward has higher reward so it starts reaching the destination yeah it, it should not fly upside down those actions should be penalized uh, andre ng is actually standing next to it that video like say it is slightly bigger the program is running inside exactly that state action pair optimal state action pair is actually running inside that one oh you thought that it is remote uh, helicopter <laughs> This helicopter is actually flying with the reinforcement learning algorithm incorporated into it. Okay, and in fact, you can see, like, say, his photo uh, also next to it. Uh, you see, this is the man. You can actually see see him actually doing all these uh, experiments. This is the man we are talking about. Oh, okay, so that means we have to change our perception to some extent. Okay, our CEO uh, Mohan K. And Andre and Jit, they both were lab mates in their uh, PhD days. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this one, like say, flight uh, maneuvers. Okay. Now you see some particular uh, desired, uh, uh, like say, reward, positive reward for doing the expected activity, going forward, or flow, uh, like say, uh, being in the air, positive reward. Negative reward, sorry. Reward or penalty both will be written in the actions column, right? Exactly. So exactly. So reward, positive sign is positive reward, negative sign is penalty. But we normally don't call it as penalty per se, we say negative reward. Okay. And then you see, like say, default vote champion in uh, what do you say, backgammon or chess. Okay. Initially, you set a trap or like say, and then win or you have the following. Finally, whatever you have, like say, winning the game or losing the game is the reward. Okay, winning the game is positive reward. Losing the game is negative reward. Okay, now manage an investment portfolio. Making money. If you make one dollar money, positive reward. If you lose one dollar money, negative reward. Right, and then controlling a power station. Now you have like say, if you are able to manage power efficiently, positive reward, any security uh, like say incidents, negative reward. Just giving an idea like say, how do we define rewards? Each problem will have different rewards, a different kind of reward definition. Okay. And then how a humanoid robot can walk? How can you make a, robot, a humanoid robot walk? Okay. Exactly whatever we did with uh, dog and uh, baby. Exactly same, like say repeat uh, actions repetition. Okay, forward motion of humanoid is like say uh, positive reward, and falling over negative reward. Okay, and then playing different uh, games, different Atari games. Like say you have now systems playing games on their own, right? So that's what like say exactly. Right? When actually systems start playing among themselves, they actually become like say uh, pretty intelligent and after some time we may actually find it very difficult for us to control. That's what actually happened in AlphaGo. So how systems will understand if like it's a, a I mean mental reward or positive? We are defining it. We are defining that it is no it, okay. Very good. <laughs> okay, how do we define the rewards in that helicopter case? Any guess? Sensors. There should be sensors which actually measure the distance. Exactly. How close the distance is to the ground. Exactly. You actually took the action now. Okay. So, for example, tilting over. You actually took that action. And because of that action, what is the, like, say, the altitude now you are in? If altitude falls, it is a negative reward. But when we are going down, it needs to fall. The altitude needs to fall down, right? That is the expected action. You reached the target. You reached the expected the GPS. Okay. Now you reached the expected GPS, so your altitude should start falling. Exactly based on the environment or state. Based on the environment or state, your reward will differ. So, so mathematically, this reward is nothing but some factor that multiplies into the weightage from a machine learning perspective. Weightage, like say, uh, weightage are like uh, a function. It's a function which actually uh, accumulates all your uh, 
actions output the better you actually capture all the output of actions the better it becomes i mean your system will be far better makes sense right can we go ahead so now you see like goals and actions and this is another term what you actually come across you need to have like say goals and actions set of actions on the like a short term goal and long term goal okay short term goal is coming from here on long term goal is like say yes i want to win the game okay how do we actually incorporate those things and then state we actually discussed about state quite a bit what is a state state is nothing but your environment perception environment environment perception okay maybe the image what you have your vehicle Im image whatever you have taken along with all your vehicles attributes <coughs> make sense right and this is what state is and now <coughs> where is the juice i mean where is the main information in reinforcement learning the better you make the states and the better actions you make for those states i mean what are all possible actions what are all possible states if you can actually get all possible states for our uh, environment or for our problem now you can actually train your model very well and this is where we actually get little bit greedy okay how many states we can actually live with maybe 1000 if you actually say 10000 yes now training time takes lot of thing okay and like say 1 million states it's gone now we have to use uh, like say bigger systems to train right 1 million states probably like say now we are able to see like uh, all possible frames in the video right all possible frames in the video you are able to we are trying to see and now the policy this is what we discussed policy is nothing but for a given state action is associated optimal policy is for a given state optimal like say action is associated okay these are the terminologies what are the terminologies we have looked at reward goals and actions state policy these are the standard terminologies what we have right and now finally so far we did not talk about model how a model looks like okay a model is nothing but agent's perception of the mode uh, like say environment okay and then this model includes the csv file whatever we talked about okay and in that csv file or like say if you actually go little more uh, deeper if you are able to predict what would be the next state as well apart from action possible action you actually predict the next state as well if you are in this present state what is the probability that you will be in the next state okay now you see you are getting into probability right what is the possibility that you will be in the next state and that's what like say we end up into marco chains marco decision process today i don't introduce it tomorrow i'll introduce in fact reinforcement learning is introduced to uh, first mdp marco decision process are explained and then reinforcement learning comes but if i actually talk about marco decision process in the afternoon everybody will be sleeping okay and in fact for us to implement we don't need mdp we are practicing data scientists right and any of you want like say a theoretical understanding of this one i am like say willing to discuss and if at all like say offline you want to take it up there is this man uh, this is the man he actually leads alphago project in uh, deep mind and these lectures he actually taught it in university college london there are uh, 10 lectures each lecture uh, approximately 1 hour 40 minutes so around 14 hours well definitely the stress testing you are actually giving different state which was not experienced earlier and now you are trying to see how your system reacts yes you are able to do that one yes it's option but you have to incorporate into your system if you give any new state we need to define exactly that state need to be identified with something which is already there 
may be using clustering right so like say this man is one of the celebrities in rl okay so like uh, uh, you have enough uh, material in his website in his ucl website again i am going back to my ppt so his name is david silver okay and by the way in his class he actually very frequently advertises like say deep mind is advert uh, like say recruiting if you people are interested you can apply <laughs> <laughs> and he is down to earth person like say when you actually listen to him you feel like say oh i have to do this research that sort of uh, uh, influence he actually he has in his voice okay now the framework what uh, uh, you are mentioning okay yes we talked about like say theoretical stuff right what we want to basically uh, solve problems right and we want we basically wanted to have like say states defined actions defined and some way of like say training the system <coughs> correct right and the framework for all these things okay the basic framework it's not something like say scikit learn actually scikit learn spoils us we expect all the comfort in life because of scikit learn right so for this sort of rl algorithms there are hardly any frameworks available and this is one of the matured framework and it has like a few examples through which we can actually develop the intuition and if at all we want to deep dive we have to write our own frameworks okay so this is open ai gym you can actually get into pip install gym and you can start using it and like say document is not so great like in scikit learn scikit learn is pretty good documentation how do we solve the problem like say we talked about the problems but who worries about the problems unless we have uh, mechanism to solve it right so one of the algorithms people have proposed to solve these uh, reinforcement learning uh, problems or like say problems of this kind okay so people actually proposed retraining the system or relearning the systems reinforcement okay and one of the algorithms is q learning okay q learning is off policy it actually doesn't start with any policy we will see what is q learning okay it it doesn't start with any policy it doesn't have a model per se okay the model it has is only like say you have this uh, uh, k nearest neighbor uh, classification right in k nearest neighbor classification what is the model it's only k nearest classification what is the, your daddy's name daddy <laughs> right there is no model per se except k equals to 3 or k equals to 10 right very distance calculation exactly and in uh, q learning is model free you just have dot csv file as an output you just have dot csv file that's it okay so it is a model free our policy means it does not require to follow a specific policy while training okay it actually looks at all states repeated times and whenever you have like say For like say uh, good states, it actually starts accumulating positive reward, bad states negative reward. Okay, so that's what it does. And at the end, it actually has the following set of all states, set of all actions as a data frame. You can put it set of all states, set of all actions. You visit all the states for all the actions multiple times. If you are in state one. is say for example you visit action 1 state 1 you performed action 1 because of action 1 you may end up getting into state 4 so the cycle actually repeats right so you actually start repeating this as uh, you know, like say information again and again at some like say at some stage you actually converge that means your q table will not be this these results these values will not be getting updated much that's what we call it as convergence okay now how do i use it in the production or how do i actually say what is the best one for state one whatever in the actions whatever maximum value i have say for example for state one i want to say index 0 for state one the best value is 0 
So, when I am in state 1, perform action 4. When I am in state, let me use indices only. When I am in state 0, uh, like say index 0, perform action 4, index 1, perform action 5. And then when I am in uh, like say state index 4, perform action 5. Okay. Now I am getting states associated with op optimal actions. Right? This table is repeatedly updated and at the end I will get this table and then just like say when I actually say what is the org max for each row that will give me my action, optimal action. Org max is nothing but maximum happening at that particular place that index will be thrown out. Correct, right? So, Q learning basically prepares this table and from that we basically prepare for optimal actions, that is it. And this is one of the simplest algorithms. And I feel like say RL is more natural than any other supervised or unsupervised learning. So, you think that chatbot is simple, but for uh, some other guy who actually has lot of fancy thing with cars, he may think car is very good. Reason is like say, uh, like looking at the photo and identifying is much better than uh, understanding some multiple languages, right? Translating those languages will be difficult. And we have the habit of like say getting into multiple languages in the same sentence. So, um, how do you deal with, um, so the action might be different if the future state is going to be different? So, for example, if my, as of now, I am in uh, state index 0, okay. Now, I performed action, uh, like say the optimal action in this one is index uh, 4. Right. What, I'm, what I'm saying is, let's say you are in state 0. <coughs> the state can change because of my action, the state can also okay. change because of the environment. Exactly. Right. Yes. So, if there is uh, in the previous one of the previous slides, you said that there is also a possibility of predicting what the next state Pro probability. Is, right. Some probability. Yes. Now, knowing that my action might actually change, is there another dimension to this? Improvement of these algorithms. Got it. Okay. Okay. So, K, uh, like say, a Q learning is a starting algorithm. Okay. On top of this one, now we actually do like say all fancy stuff. Okay. So, with rice, now we are actually getting like say just uh, uh, steamed rice co cooking, okay. From here, you can actually make your biryani, <laughs> right. You can actually get lot of recipes prepared on top of this one, but this is the base, right. So, at the end, now when you actually look at it, this problem like say, I think defining reinforcement learning is much easier than compared to any other supervised or unsupervised learning. It is very easy to actually see what is the problem and it is very easy to actually define what is reward, what is state, what is action. You, whatever you are saying chatbot, maybe you are the right person to actually to define. You are putting the condition there, <laughs> right. So, any questions? Yeah. So far it is fine, right. Uh, I actually gave an example. In general, what happens is when we start training the system, when you start training any reinforcement learning algorithm, you actually start with zeros. Your Q table starting with all are zeros. Okay, and from there onwards, you actually start updating. And also, if you look at state three, multiple zeros are there. Which action will you take? Random action. Among all those zeros, among all those, so like say here you have like uh, one, two, three. Among these three actions, random action will be taken. In the starting uh, with the training, so this Q table, the size that you said S into A, do we already know how many states are there? Yes, of course, then only we can train the system. If we do not know how many states are there, if you do not know the state what is going to be there, okay, then what are the expected actions to train the system? Will be difficult, right? There are chances I may miss because there might be many scenarios. Right? You know, while the system is running, if it come across an unknown state, then it cannot you, 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 Basically, that's why that's where you have k-means clustering to help quantization. Right? This latest new state which was not experienced in the history is similar to so and so. For instance, here you are rewarding when it is higher. Let's take the example of helicopter. So when you are going up the altitude height, then your height should increase. My reward state will be something based on that action. 
now you reached a state after that it has to be reversed right so how do you identify that in q learning so q learning will not identify that okay you are let let me actually answer that one the state where you are in on the top say for example this is state 0 okay when i mean when you are in state 0 whether your target is going straight and then coming down if that is your target and this is what your state is now okay the possible actions it could be go forward increase your altitude decrease your altitude right this or like say turn left turn right or turn left any of these things right so say for example if you actually take if you actually say go forward in the same altitude this is one of your actions you are continuing and then here when you are here you know like say what is a, this gps location as soon as i reach that gps location my state is changing here it is not at zero it would be some uh, s100 in s100 when i reach like say some uh, 100 kilometers or like say 50 kilometers uh, from my destination now i start receding my altitude that means not only going forward altitude receding and then going forward is the action right otherwise like say you are actually going forward and this is the like say bad action you will not be able to take uh, you will not be able to land so if i have to make a matrix like that for this uh, how would i mean? so you don't make matrix of that kind okay what you actually say is say for example total you have 100 states right you have 100 states 1 to 100 one of the actions like say go straight okay back down up okay so these are my actions right i can actually say and when i am actually in the simulation every time i now i repeatedly run this one this simulation whenever i am in like say state 0 state 1 okay state 2 whenever i am here if i perform this action this is negative uh, some big number whenever i perform this action this is negative big number i am increasing the altitude whenever i perform this action i am actually appreciating it i do this activity again and again right when i am here and when i do this activity going forward i may end up with state 1 here also i have to come like say perform the same activity to get better reward as soon as i reach s100 i cannot do this uh, this one i'll get negative reward i have to actually perform this one one of those actions will be performing for a given uh, say a state but one of those actions will be the right one others will be like say deviating others will be wrong actions make sense right is it clear or not okay now how do we update that q table okay that q table if i actually write it slightly differently let me put it here the equation please don't worry it may be distracting uh, element okay i will actually write it easily this is your q table whatever we had earlier right that is nothing but q of st or let me put it as s a that is nothing but table with the states actions okay this is nothing but q of zero state zero action q of like say zero state and fifth action there are only five like say six actions for example like that if there are 100 states q of 100 state zero action p of 100 states and fifth action okay to start with we actually start with all zeros here okay initialization with all zeros and now how do we update when i am in a state zero and if i perform action zero what is the reward? I may get one rupee as a reward. Okay. 
so state zero okay and uh, like say i am performing action action zero and that resultant is actually pushing me to state three the updation is going to be in state three right so state three right the updation oh no no i have to actually repeat it the because i have taken action 0 i got 1 rupee the reward has to be updated in the my present state state 0 and action 0 okay so starting with it has it has already 0 0 okay say for example my learning rate hyperparameter let me take it as 1 for convenience okay and the reward is 1 rupee the, this is the reward I got. Okay, the uh, discount factor. Let me take it as one for time being. And this quantity, I am looking at like say, in the next state because of my action, I am leading it to state three. In state three, what is the best reward possible? Starting with all zeros. So all will be zero here, right? And old value of your uh, present state is zero. So, your latest value in cube 0, 0, state 0, action 0 will be 1, right? And when you go for the next next iteration, okay, again you are in now uh, queue of uh, like say state 0 and action 0, your equation will be different, actually you will be actually leading to 2, right? Are you following now? So, this will be repeated, positive actions like say actions leading to positive rewards are getting accumulated. Negative rewards are getting accumulated but negative side, yes. The whatever it might be, like it might be sensors which are detecting what is going on in the environment, right? So it understands the state. Yes. But how does it detect reward? Reward we have to define. Re reward, reward is defined by… Because as no, these no, things no. are happening, how does the reward get interjected? How does the okay. learning actually happen? So that is what again one of the IPs you can generate. What is the best way to define a reward for my problem? There is no defined, like I said, there is no designated way of saying, okay, this is how we have to define for this problem. How do people do it today? Like, do they do it as a post process? Like, they capture say for example, state and action randomly yeah. and then assign rewards? Yeah, say for example, let me see this so standard uh, problems where you can see quantitative reward. When I buy a stock, what is the reward, what is the return I'm getting by the end of the day? is my reward for that action. Sure, then it's formulaic. So I could yeah, write yeah. a formula for it. Exactly. My, exactly. Like for, a, for, a, for a drone getting to a destination, the reward might be? Moving in the positive direction. To, yeah, moving po in positive direction to the destination. Keeps you, exactly. you know, oriented in that direction. Okay. So you actually have to keep that momentum going. Okay, say for example, if you are taking deviation, the taking deviation may be a trap. If you observe, okay, again we are going to the first example only because that latest one is in our mind, whatever happened, right? Our guys actually put a trap. There were like a lot of flights, fighter jets, that was the news, right? There were a lot of, lot of fighter jets around Bhopal and other places. So enemy got trapped, right? So what is our uh, uh, like say loss? We actually spent good amount of resource and uh, fuel. The win is reaching the target. Long term target in the view, you actually lost a little bit in the starting. So now we have to actually define what is your reward. My reward is reaching the destination, hitting the enemy, and that may have like say $1 million as reward. So learning can happen at two stages here. One is online or when the thing is actually being trained actively versus offline when the data has been collected, you might. Oh, when, when, no, no, no. Actually, that doesn't happen. Okay. The online whatever you are saying actually is part of training. The online whatever you are referring is actually training. So, which means you have to repeat it a lot of time. Of course. That's where, like, say, it takes time to build the system. And the better actually you train, the more robust it is. Yeah, we can actually give whatever nomenclature is possible to this baby. <laughs> Because like say you have like say supervised learning as part of it, unsupervised learning as part of it, lot, lot of ambiguity, 
okay and there is lot in your plate to define right so now there is like a good amount of literature around this uh, this particular algorithm okay and now like say some of you were uh, you were asking like hyper parameters and these are hyper parameters here it it could be uh, any floating number okay and whatever she was asking about like say keeping track of that learning in the in this uh, like say computation actually this is getting accumulated keeping track of the learning exponential summing okay at the end if you actually look at the equation this actually comes out to be similar to this so does this also like in deep learning there is a problem of balancing gradient and all these things same concept here also all those like say um, uh, bad guys will be coming in <laughs> we have to live with it okay and we will be introducing some of them this is what the updation mechanism is q table okay now there are few parameters we have learning rate discount factor okay when you actually look at the equation the max maximum of next state okay for all the possible actions you are becoming greedy right for all the actions in the next state once you perform action on st on st you will land up in st plus 1 next state okay what is the like say best action in that one you are taking the maximum of that and then you are giving discount factor you don't want to be too greedy also but you want to follow that one like say long term target right and then old value versus new value how much you want to basically take it up right old value this is old value and this is like say learning rate you may take alpha equals to 1 when you take alpha equals to 1 this value and this value gets cancelled right and you are going out, going ahead with the latest uh, rt plus 1 that means your present yes st at values are replaced with rt plus 1 at plus 1 so you are becoming more and more what do you say short term sighted greedy you are not keeping track of history to the greater extent right so that we may not want that one so you want little bit of learning happening little bit of the what do you say history keeping with you so alpha equals to close to 1 you are actually saying history doesn't matter to me alpha close to 0 history matters to me a lot than present and then discount factor how much greedy you want to become like say looking at like say next moment i want to actually win i never want to lose even 1 rupee then your discount factor is 1 training uh, this model and getting the optimal numbers is going to be a nightmare when it comes to competition correct right is not so straight forward it takes good amount of computing power say for example one reinforcement learning convergence i mean one model convergence if it is taking let's like, say one week for 100 parameter combinations now we have to take cloud subscription and then like say uh, in uh, independent manner you actually try in all those uh, 100 uh, reinforcement learning models and see like how your system is performing and that's how you actually decide the learning parameter you have something called grid search right in machine learning okay so similar approach you have to follow here as well but of available libraries straight forward available libraries there is no one there is no library you have to write your own wrapper okay and then the main steps in this algorithm okay there are nine main steps okay it is something like uh, after uh, actually you come to second step perform third uh, uh, like say 3 to 9 that's what you say and once you come to 5 to well, like say fifth, fourth step perform 5 to 8 okay it's actually loop for loops right you start with uh, initialize all states and actions the q table to zero okay for all episodes in the sense i have like say episode 
I actually in that episode one, I tried to walk through set of all possible states and actions again and again. I have my Q table prepared. Now I take that prepared Q table as my starting state and again I start next episode. Okay. In the given episode, I say I set my time step as something like say thousand. I will be revisiting different states thousand times. Okay. And then next episode again thousand times. Like that, I will be actually repeating, and then finally my Q table will be getting updated. Fine. So this is what the learning process in uh, what do you say Q learning. And when you actually look at this Q learning, oh, it is so simple, right? Actually, hard work is hidden here. States and uh, actions preparation, state action, yeah, states preparation is hidden. That's where actually all our blood will be squeezed. Okay, the IP is state preparation. Q learning is uh, known to everyone. Now. Different variants of Q learning also people know now, now. Okay, why people actually don't venture into reinforcement learning straight away is there is no framework available to learn. Right? Something like say baby problems, like say tie problems, whatever we are working, they may not carry much value in the industry unless you solve a case, business case. Right? So that's why many people don't venture into this reinforcement learning, there are like say sparse groups in India, one is IAC computer science and uh, EC department, you have like say couple of guys working there, IITB, you have couple of guys working there, okay. TAFR, some theoretical people are there but not implementation level and that is it as far as academic institutes are concerned in India, okay, people focusing on these areas. And like say, there are a lot of people who actually associate themselves to RL and say we are RL data scientists, I doubt. Okay. Reason is like say, they are not practitioners, they are not theoretical people. They are neither on neither side. Without working with the data, implementation of RL does not make sense. Right? So, you are not on the other side, I mean not practicing. Without getting into like say that mark quotation process and deriving algorithms, theoretical side you do not have value. That is what I mean. Now, let us start with a simple example, smart taxi. This is well celebrated example like our iris data set. Iris data set uh, in reinforcement learning you can call it as like say smart taxi and the next one is like say walking in a frozen lake, saving yourself when you are walking in frozen lake. Frozen lake not everything is frozen, there will be some like say uh, semi solid, if you step onto that one, now how do you survive walking in that frozen lake? That is the second problem you will be solving. Okay. So, here smart taxi, so here uh, what the guy has to do is, the guy I mean to say your agent, agent has to pick up passenger from uh, look, uh, like say pick up location and here uh, uh, passenger should be dropped at designated location. Okay. For every pickup, now you have to define a reward, for every drop you have to define a reward, for every other action you have to define a reward. It is in our hand. You are fine, right? The task is we have to pick up a like say passenger, drop him. That is the task. And you want to basically teach the uh, like say taxi to do this one. The next one is take care of passenger safety. Do not hit any divider or do not hit any what do you say? Uh, yeah, obstacles. Okay. This is the problem, like say what uh, some of you are asking, like say if unknown situation is coming, how do I handle? As of now, you have to actually fall back to your old friend k-means, state aggregation that is it, right. So, the rewards for every drop, uh, for every 
pop proper pickup you have to appreciate with some big reward for every proper drop you have to appreciate with big reward for every here time is important okay you pick up and you drop next day for like say from here to like say core mangala like uh, uh, majestic okay it's also perfect drop but you are losing out time you should penalize right so for every other step if you are not reaching the target there should be some time uh, like say penalty right that's also reward that may be very marginal over the period of time if that is happening like say you are actually getting struck so your tax is getting penalized so he doesn't want to do that activity again and again i mean same repetition like say he may actually stop at one place and sleep and that is penalized right so since he is penalized he doesn't want to do that activity again but all those uh, like say penalties now we have to define seriousness of the penalty hitting the divider is serious penalty okay as of now in the simulation environment penalties are uh, equated to 1 every time whenever there is a penalty it is actually added the reward is negative 1 whenever proper passenger is picked up reward is 20 drop 20 okay and we can actually redefine those things when we are coding by default these values are there so now we are getting the reward the meaning right so for proper pickup big reward for proper drop up big reward roaming around freely penalty after picking up if you are not reaching the destination in shorter time for every move you are actually penalizing trying to visualize now how the solution looks like right now you have to see the environment and then discretize it right say for example you are in a parking lot you have to visualize your system okay this is what like say the rectangle i have in front of me let me discredit that rectangle into 5 by 5 square the taxi can be in any of these uh, 5 by 5 square okay the drop up drop and the pickup locations could be any anywhere in these things okay there are uh, four locations where it could be drop it could be pickup as well right right now basically if it is the pickup location this guy has to directly come here pick up and then drop here for any unnecessary roaming this guy will be penalized and the middle bars whatever you have these are obstacles you have separator and if a cab is in the present location where it is what it can actually do it can actually go north east south it cannot go west am i correct either you use like say north west south north uh, south west north uh, west east or you use like say up down left right right so if it actually takes this side it is serious negative the reward you can redefine right and when you are actually penalizing this sort of wrong activities these activities will not be repeated in future with high probability if you are not penalizing okay it is a sota mata you can actually repeat again same mistake right so this is what the environment environment is now i have taken the picture i have now got the like say 5 by 5 uh, grid on top of it now how many states are possible in this one Twenty five states, and there are four locations to be picked up R, B, Y, G. Oh, okay, R, G, Y, B. Twenty five, and these five, these four in different uh, 20, five into five, and there are four locations. You are getting into tensor now. If a person is in the cab, that cab location also can actually go to any any of these things, right? right so say for example i am greedy there are obstacles right so i mean obstacle now of course 
I can actually increase the complexity. I can increase the complexity. That obstacle is is not in the middle of the road. That's what I'm actually pursuing. It's actually these are roads. Obstacle is not in the middle of the road. Okay, but like say if there are multiple lanes. Okay, and there is like say divide uh, like say uh, uh, left right left turn uh, right turns are possible. Okay, or like say some animal is walking. That is obstacle, right? It can be in the, in the middle of the road. So five by five grid, fine. And you have four drop or pick up locations. That means totally you have like say twenty five into four, right? And then once your person is in the cab, the passenger is in the cab. Okay. he can be anywhere in this location right he is picked up here now cab location also is important right cab is in 00 01 02 03 03 cab location you need to keep track of it and it is actually moving in one dimension in one dimension you have like say five grids right you already have one uh, like say x axis your cab is y axis it can have five values let me say how it is say for example my what do you say i am in 00 location let me start the least one left hand side bottom is 00 fine and then the person who is uh, like say whether the passenger is there or not the, uh, not, not passenger pick up location is there or not 0 or 1 let me say why yes he is there right and then here it could be cab okay whether cab is there or not so this rg may be on locations locations passenger can get into the uh, get into cab at these locations get out of for cab in at these locations this is one this is one this is one and this is one these are not visible little bit gray the, the yeah light gray light gray in my next one it will be clear okay so now he actually try to say for example if it is here i am here the cab can be here or here right so when i'm here cab location i'm looking at when i'm here what is the cab location cab location cab location cab location okay for x value what is the y value y value is cab location 5, 5 5 into 25 c4 is what because uh, these four uh, oh, these are already fixed right r g y b r g y b locations are already fixed that's why four locations into four because uh, whether people will be there or not will, will be there or not the choice is either zero or one okay whether person like say your cab can go there or not whether person is there or not see i am here x axis okay now i am actually looking at the y axis where is the cab cab could be at zero zero cab could be at zero one no because the first one is fixed first one is fixed your x axis is fixed you are fixing x axis where your like say cab in the y axis okay that's why like say independent values are 5 i am saying like say when i am in this place where is the cab okay whether it is in 01 011 012 013 or not yes or no five values are possible next one okay so i am fixing the x axis actually for cab 25 values are possible in one of these 25 locations it can be there okay now say for example if i fix x axis at 0 0 whether uh, on x axis 0 whether it is there now i have only five y value sparing okay so that's why i'm taking let's like, say five right so in fact i can actually go little more complex i can actually define like say lot more things okay this is the simplest grid i can define simplest grid i can define from here onwards i can actually say like uh, uh, one dimension is this is like say x y this is like say 
passenger location okay and this could be taxi location right four dimensions agree with me and now i can actually get into like say this to make it more spicy i can actually say like say this cap can be in any of these things instead of five independent variables or five independent uh, degrees let me say 25 degrees okay i am actually increasing the complexity okay let me say now i have only this many states how many states that will come 500 500 simple problem 500 states and in fact here we actually reduced the uh, complexity if you actually go for the complexity like say yes i want to basically i don't want to fix this location also okay i want to basically get like say all the coordinates without uh, any aggregation i'll get not 500 2500 states or uh, that action is not defined actually you can actually define like because there is no lane discipline obstacle is actually in the middle uh, not in the middle of the road it is actually in the side yeah we can actually define lot of actions but we need to change the uh, like say ecosystem in that case okay say for example in the simulation mode this is how it will be the yellow one is cab okay the yellow one is the cab it is jumping all over the place right and you see for everything whenever it actually comes to uh, like say either pick up or drop location the reward is 10 you can redefine okay otherwise reward is like say minus 1 if you are not at one of these four locations reward is minus 1 if you are at one of these four locations let's say there is a 5 by 5 grade yes the passenger is at location 1 yes the cab is at another location yes so we are looking at the possible uh, 5 by 5 makes sense either the cab is at the place where the passenger is standing okay or it can be in any of the other 24 positions okay so the total thing is 5 by 5 I want to represent this particular scenario. So where the cab is there? Exactly. And where is the passenger? I'll come to that one. Okay, where the cab is? Let me say that is uh, on index one one. No, that is one three. X is one and uh, Y is three. come from zero to up. Any 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 convention, either coming from bottom to top or top to bottom. Okay, I have one one. And then how do I represent uh, cab? Cab, I am like say, this is the location, okay. Once I have this uh, location, okay, now cab location is there, okay. That is the cab location. I have to now represent the passenger location. If passenger is inside the cab, if passenger is inside the cab, okay. And then, how do I actually no, uh, uh, give the notation? Okay. Say either a zero or one. Zero or one. Okay. Whether he is inside the cab or he is not inside the cab. Right. And uh, then the destination. Now the destination could be any of the twenty-four because uh, if that one comma one the cab is there. Let's take this case. One comma one the cab is there. The hmm. passenger is also there. Okay. So we say that one comma one comma one one indicates the passenger is in the cab. Okay. Now uh, and now the the cab can go to any of the places. Now instead of all the twenty four, you said there are only four uh, okay. drop locations. Yeah, we are actually giving uh, like say limited uh, limited uh, like say destinations or uh, starting positions. So uh, then we can indicate that you know the destination is in any of those four locations. Yes. Okay. Let me say you have like. Uh, 5 by 5, this is your grid. These are 4 locations. 4 locations. Okay. And now, once the, like say, passenger is inside the cab. No, this is actually just location. 4 locations. Okay. Once passenger is inside the cab. Okay. You are you have fixed one dimension. He is inside the cab. Okay, he either has to go from here to here or here to here. Right. 
So, your x axis one dimension you are fixing, it is something like when you say your x 1, x 2 you have and you are writing now hyperplane say x 1 plus uh, or let me say x 1 equals to x 2 plus c. You have fixed x 1, what is x 1 for given x 2? It is hyperplane. Once you pick up the passenger, we are either going from this side to this side, this side to this side. Only five, five positions are possible. You are fixing one. Say for example, if I pick up that passenger here, it can go this side, five locations or this side, five locations. Only five positions are possible. You see, that is what hyperplane I am giving. No. Okay, 24 positions are possible. He can go left, right, uh, up, down. Those left down, up down, like say left, left, right, up down, okay. Those things are actually we are getting from here, okay. The thing what we actually have to see is maximum number of states versus what are the minimum number of states possible. What are the minimum number of states possible? If you actually look at this hyperplane, x1 plus x2, two dimensional, 5 by 5, okay. Now, we are saying like say x1 equals to x2 plus c, that is the hyperplane, okay. What is that hyperplane dimension? It is 1. You started with two dimension, x1 comma x2. Hyperplane in any dimension is uh, n minus 1. If dimension of your space is n, hyperplane will be in n, n minus 1, okay. Now, why it is actually coming out to be 5 is, if you picked up here, the maximum number of possibilities, it can actually move this side or this side. Picked up location is 1 and rest of the 4 possibilities are 4, like say 1, 2, 3, 4. Of course, it actually hits obstacle, so it has to come this way and come this side. The maximum y value is possible for this one are 0 to 4. Once I fix x, that is exactly what happens in hyperplane, okay. Yes, I can actually worry about all 25, that extra like I said duplicate feature I can add and in that case, I can actually end up with 2500 states, 2500 states I will end up with. Okay, I do not need to have those 2500 states with just 500 states I can actually replicate that is what I mean by. Okay, if I have this 500 states what will happen? Okay, now this is what like say simulation. It is actually cab is actually moving in all directions, all possible directions. Okay, and respectively like say you are actually getting either reward or penalty, I mean negative reward is penalty, make sense? So, yes, so whenever you are actually moving from one location to another one, you see your reward, this is what your Q table is getting updated with, okay right? And now you start your Q table as like say zero zeros, <coughs> right? And then for every like say episode and for designated time and number of time steps, you actually start updating your Q table with the formula whatever we actually started with Q of STAT equals to Q of STAT plus your learning rate with all that masala, right? And that is what the, uh, like say this particular uh, use case is, okay. Now, let us go to the what do you say the simulation and see how it exactly works. Can we please open this uh, Jupyter notebook and by the way, if you want to implement this one on your own without any framework, it will consume time, but it is not too difficult. Teach a cab to pick up and drop passengers at uh, their right, right locations with RL. 
okay so we are not clearly saying like say this is pick up and this is uh, drop okay what we are actually trying to tell is whenever you touch base it with one of these uh, data points i mean one of these locations you are awarding in fact this is not a full fledged uh, implementation i should call right whenever you actually pick up only drop is possible right we have to actually get all those logics incorporated okay. now so you can uh, uh, like say install gym gim using uh, pip install pip install gym that's what i actually did right and it works with uh, python 3 it works very well python 3.5 and above and python 2 also it works but uh, i hardly used python 2 and uh, gym okay now i am loading this taxi environment okay when i load this taxi environment it is actually giving me the states and actions description okay what are all states what are all actions what are all rewards i mentioned okay that is the information i am actually getting okay so for some of the problems and uh, now actually it is uh, pretty active people started uh, loading even this uh, humanoid uh, robo walking that environment also people have actually uploaded now to gym okay and then so i am resetting it to a particular uh, like say random state because cap can be any of the 25 locations right so i am resetting it to a particular location okay by the way when you actually look at these uh, states these states they are not now represented with coordinates they are actually given numbers 0 1 to 499 okay so the state what we are actually getting is 201 oh that was earlier one okay then now cab is at the third location number of uh, elements in observation space number of states 500 okay and now if i actually see the state this three state is actually coming out here okay three state is represented like this i was actually one step ahead i was actually reading out previous one okay and now for this the state is 3 anyway we already rendered this I'll remove. The possible actions are <coughs> 0 down, 1 up, right 2, uh, left 3, pick up 4, drop 5, 0, 1 to 5, totally 6 actions possible, right. So now if you see number of actions possible 6 and number of states. Five hundred. Let me take like say. Uh, let me set state to uh, one hundred and fourteen. Okay, what the state would look like? The cab is at this location. Okay. And now, when I actually uh, do like say, what is the next state? When my present state is one, what is the next state? Okay. Uh, actually, it is not my uh, my present state is three. Okay, I started with present state equals to three, right? And I am performing action one, zero, one to five. I am performing action one. Then what is the resulting state? The reward, whether you reach, uh, reach it the destination? No, you have not reached. Okay, and then. The other things like say probability 1.0, those are like say values for the debugging. As of now, they don't carry much information. You can actually start adding your uh, debugging information there. Okay. 
say for example, if I say action equals to 5, okay, action equals to 4. minus 100, uh, sorry minus 10, right. So, you are seriously penalizing, probably you hit the wall with this action, right. So, action equals to 4 refers to pick up, okay, that was not possible. So, you are basically uh, missing something there. Now, how good does the behaving randomly uh, help, okay. Say for example, I do not get into that uh, queue learning per se, I have like say state and I am putting the counter and I have a reward, uh, I, am, I emptied it, okay. I start at one location, let me put some uh, what do you say, 1000 time steps, 1000 steps and see whether I will be able to reach the destination. And what would be the reward, uh, uh, like say reward to reach the destination, pick up and then drop, <coughs> okay. In how many time steps, I am setting like say maximum 1000, in how many time steps I will be actually able to pick up the uh, passenger and drop him and what is my reward. So, just going up right, mm -hmm. 0 to 5, 0 to 4, uh, are you, are you resetting those? Exactly. Okay. When we loaded the uh, taxi environment, all these things are preloaded. Okay, we have to write it on our own. So, what I am saying is unless reward equals to 20 or actually keep on going this one, okay, till I actually get the uh, final destination, okay. In how many steps I did uh, solve this one? In 562 steps, okay. I am using while loop, so there is no limit on the steps, but in general, For the next step, you see when I am doing, it took 2126 steps to pick up a passenger and drop him, okay. And now let us get into queue learning way of doing things. Uh, so I can actually, so whenever you are not actually dropping the passenger, reward is not 20. When you are picking up the passenger, it is taking reward as 10. When you are hitting the wall, your reward is minus 10. So, when you are hitting reward equals to 20, that means you are reaching the destination. Uh, okay, I actually clicked the, those three quickly. Th that is like say reward equals to 20, I am saying like say whether you have dropped it or not properly. Q, Q table I am setting it to 0, zeros, and then I am saying like say number of episodes, let me actually run only once. So, I am uh, keeping a like say reward accumulator G equals to 0 and then learning parameter alpha equals to 0.6, some number I am starting with, okay. And then you see here, my gamma, the discount parameter I am taking it as 1 in my equation, only alpha I am varying, otherwise this is the same equation what we are actually having, right. There is no deviation, okay. So, for episode, I am saying like say, while reward is not equals to 20, take the action, you are actually, this is the state, take the action, best action from the table and then you are saying like say environment dot step of action, best action and for that best action what was the reward, you are repeating it till your reward is 20, okay right. I can use while loop or I can actually put timestamp. 1000 time, uh, time steps or counter, right. So, my initial state is 187 and final state is, let me print that one, Four nine, 475, okay. What is the reward? total reward minus 518, it is very bad. That means I took lot of time, 
okay i took lot of time i actually tried this system only once episode equals to 1 i did not try multiple times right i tried only once episode equals to 1 once pa passenger was picked up and he was dropped that's it okay so what i'm actually now going to do is i'm going to set episodes 2000 okay now we started with minus 77 uh, reward and finally we are actually more or less stable with the uh, like say reward value okay now we got our q table prepared q table q table prepared we actually ran 2000 iterations okay now let us see whether we are able to pick up and drop okay so what we are doing is i am picking up a random state state equals to environment dot reset okay whether we are done no we are saying like say not done okay done not equals to true action equals to the best action for the given state okay and using this action now your environment is giving the next state okay next state the respective reward whether you have reached the destination or not done or not okay earlier we were actually comparing reward equals to 20 right reward equals to 20 or done equals to true you are done or not right so reset the system and then now you see cab is here okay it is asked to actually move north uh move north there is it can it could not move it could not go upward and the next one is move east it moved east picked up okay and then the action you are at uh, the place it picked up the passenger that is the action okay and after that it is asking like said to move south okay and then it is asking to move west west and no south south and then finally drop off okay you are actually defining the environment and see when you actually trained with one environment one episode you are not actually it did not actually perform so well of course we did not test it in this way but as soon as we actually did uh, that q table learning the cab is able to actually do its job and it looks very very simple but if you see the complexity the defining the number of states right for each state now we have to see like say what are the possible actions and based on that now we have to define the reward right whether we want to go ahead with 500 states or we want to go ahead with 2500 states right and then you basically define your rewards based on that one okay if so and so category of states reward is minus 1 so and so category of states reward equals to bigger okay now let me actually add little more uh, spice to this one so we have uh, this one here right done equals to done not equals to true what i try to do is if uh, done not equals to true and reward equals to 0 or uh, reward equals to minus 1 okay i want to basically penalize it to higher number okay <laughs> if reward equal to or uh, like say minus 1 or
reward equals to minus 100. I am penalizing a lot okay, for not doing the activity correctly. I am rewriting this one. Okay. So, let me get this Q table again. So, I am initializing Q table to 0. Episodes I am setting it to 2000. See, initially started doing uh, badly and over the period of time it actually started learning. Okay. Now, let me see what is the initial state. Now, also it is doing very well, right. It actually started with uh, this is the initial pickup, initial place, right picked up and then immediately moved upside because my penalties I am actually seriously penalizing the guy for doing the for not doing the activity. Now say for example instead of 200, 2000 episodes let me set episodes equals to 100 because number of episodes when you are increasing it is expensive computationally. Let me set episodes equals to 100. Let us see how good it will be. You see now since it worked straight away we were actually very happy. Now you see you are here and it is asking to go uh, west. Uh, but it cannot go west because there is wall there. When you are here you cannot actually suggest west. There is a wall. So it is standing there only and you see and those actions are repeated, repeated. Infinite loop. No, it could not solve the problem. Even after like say 100 episodes, it actually got into a loop. It could not solve, right. Let me actually penalize less, see what happens. Or in fact, the state may be, I can change the state. No, with 100 episodes, we are not able to get the, solve the problem. It is still there only. Let me say like, we are not able to actually converge when you have number of episodes equals to small. No, it is not able to actually solve the problem. It is getting stuck at some place. Now, let me instead of 100, let me say 1000 whether we, are, we will be able to do. any like say any of these four locations starting one if you if you visit one as a pickup it can visit any of these four locations that will be pickup any of these uh, four locations after that okay once once you pick up it has to go to other location for the drop and then uh, there are those obstacles put in here sorry i missed that part probably you, you see here no 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 in the code uh, where did we mention those okay so, the rewards say for example, let me actually uh, I understand your question ok. I actually got uh, slightly deviated. The obstacles when we actually mentioned we are talking about states right. When I am in a particular state here uh, like say west is not possible. Yeah, where did we mention those? The environment we loaded. 
the environment we loaded okay that is where we mentioned and we don't we don't mention the environment already mentioned and gave us so this is like a pre environment pre environment loaded environment <laughs> exactly and when you actually here when you take east action state will be there only but you are getting penalized okay that's why like say you are actually hitting west and west there only you are standing so when we say taxi hyphen v2 that's the environment with those uh, <coughs> already loaded in the exactly and now as a data scientist what is our value add our value add is creating this environment solving once we have environment i mean to say once we have states properly defined rewards defined actions defined solving is pre learning that's it very simple right but preparing this one preparing that environment is like a problem dependent whatever environment i prepare for my problem you may not be able to use it okay that is the challenge we have to live with it can you see how the data in the environment looks like here in this problem yeah we can actually go to that uh, like say open uh, uh, open ai gym complete source code is available yeah it we actually loaded from uh, open gi uh, open ai gym so for example open ai gym github all the source code everything is available okay complete thing is open source and now people actually what if you want to redefine like say if you want to define your own environment in labs what people are doing is the existing environment is uh, adopted like say taxi environment i take and then do modifications for my my own data okay because already like say how states and action states actions and rewards to be combined it's already defined in this one so let me take that as a template and then do it for my problem okay so if at all you want to use framework this framework you have to define you have to modify it that way but the best way is write your own uh, uh, what do you say states and actions outside that will have far better control we hope you like this complete tutorial on machine learning and python great learning offers high quality impactful and industry relevant programs to working professionals like you our faculty pool comprises of leading academicians and industry practitioners in the field of data analytics for more information check the links in the description down below don't forget to like share and subscribe remember the only learning that matters is great learning see you in our next video